Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Senator Nettle, uh, by letter dated the 13th of September 2007, has raised a matter of privilege understanding Order 81. The matter of privilege relates to seemingly inconsistent answers given by officers at estimates hearings about the government's knowledge that Mr Mamdou Habib had been taken to Egypt. Some officers suggested a lack of knowledge or certainty on the part of government that Mr Habib was ever in Egypt, while, others ans while other answers appeared to indicate a definite knowledge that he had been taken to Egypt. These apparent inconsistencies were the subject of inquiry by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee and on the 11th of September 2007, the committee tabled in the Senate its correspondence with relevant officers. Understanding Order 81, I am required to determine whether the motion to refer the matter to the Privileges Committee should have precedence, having regard to criteria which basically go to the seriousness of the matter. I am not required to give consideration to the strength of evidence on the basis of which the matter is raised. The matter clearly meets the criteria uh, I am required to consider. The Senate and Privileges Committee have always taken very seriously any suggestion that misleading evidence has been given to a Senate committee. I therefore determine that a motion to refer the matter to the Privileges Committee may have precedence. I table the letter from Senator Nettle and another copy of the material presented by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. These documents sufficiently explain the background to the case. Senator Nettle may now give notice of a motion to refer the matter to the Privileges Committee. It will then be for the Senate, having considered the material which has been laid before it, to determine whether the apparent inconsistencies in the answers by the officers have been sufficiently explained or whether further inquiry by the Privileges Committee is warranted. Senator Nettle. Thank you. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the following matter be referred to the Committee of Privileges. Whether false or misleading evidence was given to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee or any other Senate committee concerning the government's knowledge of the rendition of Mr Mamdou Habib to Egypt and whether any contempt was committed in that regard. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill number 1, 2007, adjourned debate on the motion for the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Stevens. Senator Boswell. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, I'm in continuation at present and I was explaining to the Senate that uh, under Section 46, as it presently stands before this legislation goes through the House, uh, to secure a Section 46 conviction, uh, it almost had to be a monopoly taking on a smaller business, uh, and it had to have a substantial degree of market power uh, that was considered a monopoly. And just to explain that, uh, I would like to read the judgment of the uh, the, uh, a member of the majority in the full bench of the High Court, and this was his finding. Uh, he supported the Bor Borrell's appeal, and Justice McHugh concluded, even though Borrell drove down its prices in order to remove competition, this does not mean that it had a substantial degree of market power. That must be proved before there is a breach of Section 46. Predatory pricing without a substantial degree of market power cannot result in a breach of section 46. And th that, I suppose, in a nutshell, is uh, why 
we have to amend section 46 today because there was clear cases he even the justice McHugh uh, recognized that uh, that uh, Boral drove down its prices in order to remove competition and there, and even after it proved that or knew that it couldn't bring in a breach of section 46 the high court couldn't bring in the breach of section 46 so uh, that is, and, and since that finding, uh, there has no been, there has been no more breaches or no more court actions in Section 46. The ACCC have just not bothered to take any uh, Section 46 cases to the court because they know that they could, they would be unsuccessful, and uh, uh, and would have been wasting their hard uh, to come by money. So there was an acknowledgement that Boral may have predatory priced, but no way to prosecute because they were deemed not to have a substantial degree of power in the market. So that's one of the reasons we are bringing this legislation in today, but to make sure that we do have an effective safeguard for uh, uh, unfair practices of predatory pricing. And the Treasurer and the government have now produced this bill and uh, should be congratulated on it. The major small business groups, NAGA, the NFF, COSBRA and the Fair Trading Coalition, all agree that changes will have significant effect in again making Section 46 operational and functional in discouraging and protecting them from misuse of market power by the uh, large comp uh, competitors. And uh, the reforms that we are making to the Section 46 uh, reflects the wishes of small business. And uh, it really addresses four major issues. Uh, one is threshold, the other one is predatory pricing, and the other one is, uh, well, the other two are cooperative action to misuse market power, and the other one is recoupment. So those, th this legislation addresses those four issues. So uh, if I can just take a, a minute to uh, thank Hank Spears, and uh, because he uh, did a lot of work with the small business organisations and got this legislation to the point where it became part of a, a, government's, uh, a government's program. Uh, Senator Joyce then uh, has got amendments that are certainly support small business. But can I address the, uh, substantially address the, uh, the uh, four issues? The threshold. One, a successful Section 46 prosecution relies on a business being deemed by the court to hold a substantial degree of market power and to have taken advantage of that power in the market by acting in some way to disadvantage a competitor. Legally, this has become a problem since Borrell raised the threshold and made it almost impossible for non-monopoly business to reach the required level of market power to proceed on a case uh, alleging breach of Section 46. Uh, Predatory pricing, which is uh, to address this issue we have already discussed in some detail. The bill enables the court to consider the operation of business in supplying goods or services below cost. And the reasons for this behaviour when deciding that business holds a substantial degree of market power in the market. The government will also move an amendment to the bill today that will leave no doubt that predatory pricing is a practice that will not be tolerated. It introduces a new prohibition specifically for the practice of predatory pricing within the misuse of market power framework, and that will be welcomed by small business. Cooperative action to misuse market power. Through this bill, we'll also address the issue by making it clear in the Trade Practices Act that misuse of market power can take place when two or more businesses cooperate or are coordinated in misusing market power. Also, the bill makes it clear that misuse of market power can occur across markets. So that, for example, if a business holds a substantial degree of market power in a grocery market, it is being made clear that the business cannot leverage and misuse that market power, say, in a fuel market. And one of the problems that were, was uh, worrying small business was the problem of recoupment. And uh, we have made today, uh, we have included recoupment in the explanatory notes. Uh, and that's what small business were concerned, and we've addressed that 
by uh, uh, because recoupment was being given too much consideration in the courts when considering predatory pricing cases. The government maintains that this is covered in a legislation, but we've included clarification in the explanatory memorandum that makes it clear that recruitment or loss is not a legal requirement to prove that predatory pricing has taken place. It's not a requirement to prove a breach of section 46. There's also an addition of a new small business commissioner uh, on the ACC and improvements to section 51 AC to raise the transaction threshold from 3 million to 10 million. Something that small business continually asked us Order. to address. The Honourable Senator's time has expired. Thank you, Senator Boswell. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007, has come about because of a review initiated by the Howard government back in May 2002. At that time, Mr Justice Darrell Dawson, a former High Court judge, was asked to conduct a review investigating the misuse of market power as defined in the provisions of Section 46 of the Trade Practices Act. The Trade Practices Act has been dealt with by this parliament on many occasions and has been examined by committees and specialised groups over a long period of time. There have been a number of cases in which uh, the section that deals with competition has been brought before the courts. A consistent concern raised by small business is that they're not playing on a level playing field. Many small businesses, which, when they compare the prices at which they're able to sell at, see large corporations as having an unfair advantage. Often, small businesses claim that they can purchase products from large, large corporations for a lower retail price than they are required to pay if purchased wholesale in the operation of their own business. Following the report by what has become known as the Dawson Committee, which was released in April 2003, the relevant Senate committee had a look at the Trade Practices Act and Dawson recommendations. This was in 2004, when the then Senate Economics References Committee, now the Senate Economics Committee, of which I'm a member, examined the economic benefits of small businesses the effect of the Trade Practices Act 1974 on small business and the way in which the Act and small business promote competition together with the need for fair trading. That time, the committee also looked at the competition laws in Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act, which promote competition by prohibiting conduct that may lessen competition and further at the provisions of Part 4A of the Trade Practices Act, which promote fair trading by prohibiting unconscionable conduct. The Senate Committee specifically looked at the Dawson Review recommendations and subsequent case law which considered Section 46 of the Trade Practices Act, which covers the misuse of market power and unconscionable conduct, and brought down a report. It was uh, the joint recommendation uh, of the gen then Chair of the Committee, Senator George Brandis and I, that further action be taken to amend the Trade Practices Act 1974 to strengthen protections for small business against anti-competitive practices. We did so because of widespread dissatisfaction with the validity of the court's interpretation of the misuse of market power provisions. The bill today delivers for small business in a number of important ways in enhancing the effectiveness of section 46 of the Trade Practices Act. It addresses the issue of predatory pricing, allowing the court to consider sustained below cost pricing when looking at a breach of section 46. It clarifies the threshold for misuse of market power in a number of important ways. For example, it takes into account leveraging power from one market into another. It specifies that more than one corporation may have a substantial degree of power in a market and further provides that a corporation can have market power without substantially controlling that market. This limit assists in protecting small business from unconscionable conduct. On predatory pricing, the bill puts into law the Senate Economics Committee's recommendations to include reference to a company's capacity to sell below cost. On the issue of unconscionable conduct, the bill implements the Senate Economics Committee recommendation on the unilateral variation of contracts, and Senator Brandis and my recommendation to increase the monetary threshold to $10 million. Additionally, the bill makes amendments to the unconscionable conduct provisions by raising the transaction limit from $3 million to $10 million. The bill also provides that the court should look at whether a party can unilaterally, unilaterally vary a contract term or condition in considering whether there has been unconscionable conduct. In July and August of this year, the Senate Economics Committee examined the provisions of this bill. 
The committee's inquiry attracted a large range of submissions from groups interested in trade practices reform. Several submissions to the inquiry noted that the bill provides greater clarity for the courts in section 46 in relation to both the thres threshold test for the misuse of market power and predatory pricing. The bill's amendments on the threshold test were those recommended by Senator Brandis and I in the report and endorsed by the ACCC. The ACCC remains strongly supportive of these amendments. The current committee believes the bill's amendments are important to state expressly the legal principles that have been expressed by the courts. A majority of the committee also rejected Labor senators' claims that the bill's amendments do not strengthen 46, uh, section 46 and section 51 of the Act. In fact, sections 46 and 51 will draw courts' attention to potential areas of contravention. The bill extends courts' capacity under the terms of section 51 AC to protect a greater range of transactions entered into by small businesses while enabling courts to continue to rule according to the facts and circumstances of the individual case in question. There has been a great deal of community interest in this bill. In May of this year, I was interviewed on South Australian radio in relation to small business concern about predatory pricing. While the finer detail of the bill was not available at that time, there was a groundswell of interest from the small business sector in my home state of South Australia in the Howard government's stated intentions to strengthen the law and support small business. In direct contrast to this, the Australian Labor Party, the opposition have been caught short on policy with regard to small business. They state that this bill is inadequate and offers little protection for small business. Their concern for small business is utterly disingenuous, coming from a party which intends to reimpose draconian unfair dismissal legislation, which will bring about a repeat of the thousands and thousands of dollars in costs to the small business sector for go-away money and the loss of thousands of jobs, as it did when previously in operation. Where does Labor's concern for small business sit with their policies, which will overturn the rights of small business people currently, uh, the rights they currently have to run their businesses free of interference from the trade union movement? Under Labor, non-union collective agreements would be a thing of the past and will open up a million small businesses to potential union control. Labor's workplace relations policy is not a plan to keep the economy strong and instead will mean more power to the union bosses to push industry-wide wage claims, leading to higher inflation and upward pressure on interest rates. Small businesses have good reason to be very afraid. If Labor is really serious about doing something positive for small business and standing up for small business, it would not propose to reinstate unfair dismissals and it would not get rid of Australian workplace agreements. I said at the beginning of my remarks that the Trade Practices Act has been dealt with by this parliament on many occasions. It will be so in the future because the Howard government is committed to improving and clarifying the operation of the provisions of the Act related to the misuse of market power by corporations, including in relation to leveraging market power, coordinated market power and predatory pricing. The government shortly will be moving to introduce legislation imposing criminal penalties for serious cartel co conduct. The government is concerned about the ability of small businesses to be competitive in markets where there is cartel activity, where they are often the direct victims of cartel behaviour. I also welcome the government's proposed amendment to this legislation regarding predatory pricing, providing clarification regarding recoupment. The government's positive response to the work of the Senate Economics Committee, and I see my colleague Senator Brandis, who, who uh, did so much work on this, as I've mentioned earlier uh, in our earlier joint work on this committee, but the positive work of that Senate Economics Committee certainly highlights the uh, willingness of the Howard government to consult widely with interested parties on issues that come before the parliament. And also, I believe this legislation reinforces the value of the work of, of committees in the Senate. On that basis, I wholeheartedly commend this legislation to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Chapman. Senator Fielding. Thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, Family First is convinced the Trade Practice Act needs to be strengthened to restore fair trading and competition to Australian markets. The reason we are passionate about the issue is because fair competition delivers the lowest possible prices to families which are struggling to make ends meet. 
Sadly, the government's bill only does part of the job. Family First introduced its Trade Practices Amendment Predatory Pricing Bill 2007 because anti-competitive conduct like predatory pricing can drive small businesses out of the market. Small businesses are particularly vulnerable because of their limited resources. Predatory pricing is where powerful businesses use their substantial market or financial power to drop their prices in one area only to drive out competitors. Not only are small businesses affected, with some forced to sh uh, shut up shop because they can no longer compete, but Australian families suffer as well from higher prices in the long term. Small business has been waiting for the government's Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007, for more than three years since the <coughs> Senate Economics References Committee recommended action. The Trade Practices Act states, the objective of the Act is to enhance the welfare of Australians through the promotion of competition and fair trading and provision for consumer protection. The welfare of Australians is central. But to achieve that, we need a system to protect consumer welfare, and that system is fair trading and competition. There is a danger that without appropriate regulation, unfair trading and distorted competition can lead to higher prices and less choice for consumers. And there is a great social and economic loss to local communities when small businesses are forced to close. Family First shares the Business Council of Australia's concern that heavy-handed responses were stifling competition, but believes we need to strike the right balance. A lack of effective regulation to stop anti-competitive behaviour can also stifle competition. The government's bill has support from most, but not all, small businesses. There is also concern and reluctant support from many groups representing big business and those involved in trade practices law. The Fair Trading Coalition, which represents 30 small business member groups, states that while some of its members want Section 46 strengthened further, it supports the bill, but also supports Family First moves to address predatory pricing. The Fair Trading Coalition also wants the government to stop creeping acquisitions, which markets become highly concentrated not by one-off large purchases, but by small purchases, shop by shop, that do not attract the attention of government regulators. The Council of Small Businesses of Australia and the National Association of Retail Grocers of Australia have also indicated they want the government to go further with reforms. It is worth pointing out that not all groups or individuals representing small businesses support the government's bill, although their 11th hour amendment does have their support. This, the Sit and Suddenly Retailers Association declared the amendments uh, meaningless, that's the bill itself. Uh, while the University of New South Wales Associate Professor Frank Zumbo stated that he did not see any merit in the legislation. That's the existing bill, not the 11th hour amendment. Family First acknowledges that there are significant issues yet to be addressed by the government to ensure fair competition, including creeping acquisitions, defining substantial market power, defining take advantage, unilateral variation of contracts and take it or leave it contracts. The, super, the supermarket industry is frequently mentioned as an area of concern. A PricewaterhouseCoopers report commissioned by the National Association of Retail Grocers Australia, NAGA, found that the two major grocery retailers, Coles and Woolworths, increased their market share from around 35 per cent in the early 1990s to around 80 per cent today. Australia has one of the world's most concentrated grocery markets. Family First shares Naga's concerns that this enormous market concentration means less choice for families, less competition and higher food prices. It also means uh, small primary producers have less bargaining power with the supermarket giants. The Naga report found that food prices have consistently grown at a faster rate than inflation for more than 20 years. Last year, food inflation in Australia was almost 10 per cent, 10 per cent. Continuing rising food prices proves that competition is not working well in the supermarket industry. Families and small businesses are the victims of market power being wielded by some of Australia's retail giants who dominate key sectors. Family First is certainly not against discount pricing, but when you undercut for extended periods of time with the purpose or effect of squeezing out a competitor, 
That is not on. Family First rejects the argument that it wants to protect small business by another method other than by ensuring fair competition. The government's bill does not explicitly ban predatory pricing. In fact, it does not even mention predatory pricing. That is why Family First will still move to move an amendment to outlaw predatory pricing. Family First amendment applies to all markets and addresses the concerns of all small businesses, of, sorry, of small businesses who ask for the industries to be included in Family First's earlier predatory pricing bill. The amendment adds an effects test, which means those corporations that do have financial or market power need to be careful on how they use that power so they do not substantially lessen competition in a market. Some big businesses have claimed our action will reduce competition and, res and restrict discounting, but the same criticism could be made at the current Section 46 of the Trade Practices Act or with the 11th hour amendment from the government um, in the same regards. Family First Amendment also makes it clear that it is not necessary to prove actual or potential recoupment in an order to prove predatory pricing. Uh, whereas the government's uh, latest uh, or the government's bill still does not make it clear, or the latest amendment still does not make it clear in regards to recruitment, though it is claimed with their explanatory memorandum it does. And Family First therefore will still move its amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fielding. The question is that uh, the, the Minister. The Minister, Senator the Honourable George Brandis. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to take this opportunity to thank honourable senators for their contribution to the debate on the Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007. This has had, as um, honourable senators have pointed out, a long history. and uh, uh, It gives me much satisfaction that in this, uh, perhaps the final week of this parliament, uh, the um, uh, these uh, reforms, which had their provenance in the report of the Senate Economics Legislation Committee of March 2004, will come into effect. The bill delivers for small business in a number of important ways by enhancing, in accordance with the recommendations of the Senate Committee, the effectiveness of Section 46. The bill addresses the issue of predatory pricing. As a result of the bill, sustained below-cost pricing can be considered when looking to determine whether there has been a breach of Section 46 without going too far by attacking legitimate discounting. It clarifies, in accordance with the Senate Committee's recommendations, the threshold for misuse of market power in a number of important ways, for example, in relation to the leveraging of power from one market into another that more than one corporation may have a substantial degree of, mark of power in a single market, and that a corporation may have market power for the purposes of the Act without substantially controlling that market. Further, Mr Acting Deputy President, the bill makes amendments to the unconscionable conduct provisions of the Act by raising the transaction limit from $3 million to $10 million. It provides that a court should consider whether a party can unilaterally vary a contract term or condition when determining whether there has been unconscionable conduct. The bill also creates a new position, second deputy chairperson of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, which it is the government's intention will be held by a person experienced in small business matters. The government amendments moved, which I will move shortly, include a new pro provision in Part 4 specifically targeting anti-competitive below-cost pricing by corporations with substantial market share. Consequential changes were also made to the bill. Mr Acting Deputy President, it should be noted that the amendment is constrained by the conduct of the corporation that has a substantial share of the market. For example, the corporation must have the purpose of damaging a competitor or preventing the entry of a potential competitor in order to be in breach of this section. The conduct must, must also be carried out for a sustained period. We believe, the government believes, that we've got the balance right, the balance of promoting competition, consumers and small business. 
the government will continue to monitor the changes to the Act to ensure that there are no unintended consequences for genuine competition. As the supplementary explanatory memorandum to the government's amendments makes clear, the below-cost pricing amendments in the bill make no reference to the need for or desirability of finding recoupment of an in or an intention to recoup losses. Whilst a reasonable prospect or expectation of rec recoupment can provide evidence that below-cost pricing is being carried out in breach of the prohibition in section 46, recoupment alone is not legally required under the below-cost pricing amendments in the bill, nor is it alone a pre prerequisite for a breach of subsection 46.1. Mr Ranking Deputy President, the government has consulted extensively with small business groups in developing the bill. Following the passage of the government's Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Act No. 1 2006, that is, the legislation which gave effect to the recommendations of the Dawson Review, the government met with a number of groups to discuss Section 46 and, in particular, to address the concerns of small business. Those consultations have had the close involvement of the Minister for Small Business and Tourism, the Hon. Fran Bailey, as well as Senator Boswell and Senator Barnett, to whom um, I pay a tribute for their substantial contribution to getting the legislation into the shape it now takes. That consul consultative process has been long and involved, but one that the government has worked very hard to get right. The government would also ask, like me to record my thanks to the Senate Standing Committee on Economics for its report into the provisions of the bill. And I'd like to thank the committee under the very able chairmanship of Senator Michael Ronaldson for its timely consideration of the bill and for its report. The committee's inquiry attracted a broad range of submissions from groups interested in trade practices reform and recommended, as honourable senators will know, that the bill should be passed. Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill implements a number of important government announcements in relation to the Trade Practices Act and for the protection of competition. It comes about, as I've said, as a result of extensive discussions with key stakeholder groups. It has been um, a bill that has been developed over a period of years, and I am confident that the shape it now takes reflects, as I said before, the right balance and takes into account all of the appropriate and, um, uh, and, and needful uh, amendments which have been recommended to the government by, the group, by those groups without going so far as to constrain the operation of free enterprise and competition in Australian markets. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brandis. The Senate is considering Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill. The question is that the Australian Labor Party amendment moved by Senator Stevens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those again say no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? A division is required. Ring the bells. You're not sending any of our people over there, Ruth, are you? You're not sending our people over here.
Lock the doors. The question is that the second re reading movement am am amendment moved by Senator Stevens be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Weber teller for the ayes and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division, there being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be, bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Trade Practices Act 1974 and for related purposes. The committee. Committee of us. Order with the those senators who are going to stay and participate in the in the debate, please resume your seats. Will the others be kind enough to leave the uh, chamber? Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Call the minister. The minister. Uh, Mr Chairman, I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill, which was circulated in the chamber on 10 September 2007. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Yeah, the, uh, the Senate will now turn to amendments, uh, Democrat amendments, and I call Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I refer to Democrat Amendment 1 on Sheet 5324 revised, which has been circulated to the Chamber, uh, and I move that amendment. Uh, in motivating that amendment, I uh, will begin with a, a general remark. It is my view that this uh, election is uh, going to be contested on four broad fronts, and those broad fronts uh, cover the issues of the economy, society, the environment and integrity. And this particular measure is an integrity measure. Uh, it interested me that as soon as uh, Mr. Brown uh, took over from Mr. Blair as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, the first, very first thing he did almost was to move uh, a very substantial set of proposals for um, improving integrity in the United Kingdom uh, political system. And if there is one issue uh, on which uh, the Howard government uh, is roundly condemned and commonly condemned in, in my uh, experience throughout um, uh, the population, it is with respect uh, to a failure to advance uh, integrity systems in uh, our political uh, system. Uh, that applies whether you're talking about uh, a failure to 
uh, improve freedom of information legislation or whistleblower legislation, uh, a failure to uh, properly uh, control and manage government advertising programs, uh, and of course this issue which I raise here, which is the issue of appointments on merit. Appointments are on merit uh, are a fundamental integrity issue. And now uh, as we reach uh, the 11th and a half year of um, coalition uh, governmental uh, milestone, um, I remind the Senate that about three dozen times uh, the coalition has rejected appointment on merit um, uh, proposals uh, from the Australian Democrats. Uh, Labor too have rejected uh, quite a number of those, but they've also supported a number of those uh, because they and we recognise uh, that the issue of uh, avoiding patronage and ensuring independent appointments uh, is a vital and, and critical one even if it is just a perception of uh, patronage or a lack of independence. Uh, and that is not, of course, uh, to condemn or to imply that all appointments made by the Howard government uh, have been poor. They have not. There have been some excellent appointments of some very excellent people. But it is the principle that needs to be laid down. Essentially, the principles that we consistently put before this chamber uh, are built on Lord Nolan's uh, examination of the issue of appointments and patronage in the United Kingdom in 1995, agreed to then by the Conservative government uh, of John Major, and then carried through subsequently uh, as uh, and supported by the Blair government, and now to be further enhanced and improved by the Brown government. So uh, we are, if you like, trying to build on uh, best practice, uh, which is uh, emerging in uh, democratic uh, countries with which we have common traditions. And uh, it is simply uh, a safeguard that um, in future uh, governments, under future ministers, uh, that the procedures for merit selection of appointments uh, will always be conducted uh, to the highest level. And of course it's not just a, a federal issue, it's a state issue, but we're dealing here with federal uh, legislation. So uh, the basic uh, structure of this, of this uh, amendment uh, has been put before uh, some three dozen times. Uh, I'm certain uh, the Howard government will reject it. I think that just contributes to its generally low reputation uh, on integrity matters. Uh, but that's their lookout, not mine, uh, and uh, it is my job simply to try and keep putting forward uh, proposals such as these which are designed uh, to address an area of concern uh, amongst voters, and that is that appointments might not always be made on merit uh, and might be made um, with regard to, to other uh, circumstances uh, such as patronage or uh, political considerations. This amendment calls uh, for the general principles on which the selections are made to be established by a code of practice and the selection of the person shall be on merit uh, and shall cover independent scrutiny of appointments and probity and openness and transparency. So it's hardly uh, the sort of amendment uh, which uh, is unbearably restrictive or, um, uh, or impractical. Uh, I accordingly move the amendment. Thank you, uh, Senator. Murray. Senator Sherry. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Labor supports the sentiment of the Democrat amendment, or however we don't agree with the particular details as laid out. Uh, Labor believes in merit-based appointments and has announced selection processes for government bodies such as the ABC Board and our Fair Work Australia, which we believe delivers this. That echo from the former National Party member. I mean, he should be the last one to talk about selection processes given his behaviour and jumping parties. Um, back to the issue. The selection processes that Labor has announced demonstrate our commitment to the Nolan principles. The Nolan rules govern appointments to government bodies in the United Kingdom. Labor has consistently argued for this policy for the last few years. The Nolan rules require that appointment are merit, appointments are merit-based and the process of appointment is independent and transparent. Labor and all the other parties, including, of course, the Democrats, 
have advocated merit-based appointments. Whilst this government, um, long and tired and out of touch after almost 12 years in government, tricky, mean, stale, um, and we've seen the very worst of that on display last week, but it is important that political appointments for bodies such as the ACCC are based solely on merit. Um, the appointment model suggested by the Democrat amendment does not meet the detailed requirements set out by Labor. So although, although we support the sentiment behind the Democrat amendment, we uh, are in a position uh, where we believe it requires further development from government and we won't be supporting the detail of this particular amendment. Thank you, Senator Sherry. The Minister, Senator Brandis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the government does not support uh, Senator Murray's amendment on the simple reason that it is entirely unnecessary. Uh, Senator Murray has, uh, with due respect, and uh, in mentioning him for the first time in this debate, might I acknowledge his very significant contribution to this discussion over many years. But nevertheless, on this particular occasion, Senator Murray has, as I'm sorry to say he so often does, raises a straw man only to knock it down. The existing provisions of the Act, in particular Senator Murray, uh, section 7, subsection 3, provide in very clear terms uh, the qualifications uh, requ requisite to uh, membership of the Commission. Um, and I note with interest that neither Senator Murray nor indeed in the concurring remarks of Senator Sherry, was there any criticism offered of any appointment that this government has ever made um, to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. So although sentiments emanating from Senator Murray are, as they are characteristically are, very noble, um, they are also a, they do raise a straw man to an unnecessary amendment in view of Section 7. And also, I might say, the Intergovernmental Conduct Code Agreement, which requires that the Australian government consult with states and territories on proposed appointments to the ACCC. There's never been an issue about uh, the appointment of unsuitable people to the ACCC uh, during the lifetime of this government, nor will there be in the future uh, under the lifetime of this government, and therefore the government sees no merit in this particular amendment. Thank you, uh, Minister Brandis. The question is that a Democrat's amendment moved by Senator Murray be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think no. the noes have it. Uh, the Senate will now turn to opposition amendment uh, one on sheet 5344. I call Senator Sherry. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this amendment uh, deals with the deputy chairperson uh, having a small business background. The amendment requires at least one of the two ACCC deputy chairpersons to have a small business background. The Treasurer, in his second reading speech to this bill, said he envisaged the second deputy chairperson position created by this bill to be filled by someone with a small business background. So Labor's amendment will ensure this happens by inserting a requirement in law in the Act. The Act rec currently requires one of the commissioners to have a consumer background. Therefore, it is not without precedence to require commissioners to have a particular background to ensure they have the experience and expertise to add to the ACCC. Labor believes a very appropriate amendment. We're in uh, obvious agreement with uh, the Treasurer. If he's true to his word um, uh, when he stated that the second deputy chairperson uh, envisaged, I mean, is it tricky words or not? It's just another no, example of trickiness, words, trickiness by the government. Um, Trickiness in use of language, envisage, doesn't necessarily mean it will be delivered. Um, as Mr Costello may find out, um, if this government is re-elected, the tricky words of the Prime Minister of last week, uh, he, you know, I, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be relying on, if I were Mr Costello, I wouldn't be relying on those tricky words of last week as that um, a very begrudging, extracted uh, uh, comment from the Prime Minister that uh, he'd be standing down sometime well into the next term. More examples of trickiness. Um, anyway, if it's envisaged the second deputy chairperson is to be a small business background, let's make it a sure bet, Senator Boswell. That's the challenge for this weak and insipid National Party. Let's make it a, a uh, well, you can laugh. I mean, is, is it the Howard Vale government or the Howard Costello government? I mean, what is it? Of course. And Perhaps you should stick to the bulk of the bill. And I would appreciate the, uh, the interjections being ceased, and I'd appreciate your 
um, unbiased, uh, drawing attention to the standing my, orders to Senator my Boswell. Is unbiased, Chair. Senator Bashiri, and I let uh, you I, go on for quite a while. I know it's unbiased, and, and that's why I'm drawing to your attention Senator Boswell. Uh, Senator Boswell's rather insipid interjections from where he sits. You said that, um, right, Senator Sherry. It doesn't help the boat. I'm repeating that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we believe we should confirm in this uh, in this uh, legislation by an amendment that the deputy chair should be from a small business background. Full stop. Thank you, Senator Sherry. Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr. Uh, chairman. The uh, Australian Dem Democrats agree with the sentiment of this. Um, amendment, but, uh, but can see some weaknesses in it. Uh, for instance, if the chair of the commission were already from a small business background, why would you want uh, another person from a small business background? I think the use of the word must is a mistake, and my own belief is that the act should probably better ex express uh, in view of the fact there is this new person, which by the way we, we welcome. We think the nature of the work um, engagement by the Commission does warrant uh, an extra uh, chair person uh, in the deputy's role, but uh, I, I think it uh, probably would be one of those areas of business expertise uh, to which the government should have regard in appointing, uh, but uh, shouldn't necessarily be uh, an instruction because it might, of course, um, uh, be that the, uh, the the total constitution of the Commissioner's uh, is such that that area of expertise is already covered. So, good sentiment, uh, both from the Treasurer and the uh, Shadow, but I suspect the amendment could have been better worded. Thank you, Senator Murray. The Minister, Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The, the government does not support this amendment on the ground that it is odious for all the reasons which Senator Murray, who has brought his penetrating intellect to bear upon the issue, has just recited. And might I direct Senator Sherry's attention with respect uh, to the existing provisions of section 7 subsection 3b of the act which requires consideration of the small business knowledge or experience of any potential appointee to uh, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. But uh, as I've said, it's, it's odious. The government has already indicated that it will be amending the legislation to provide for a second deputy chairperson and I have indicated that uh, the government would have regard to the small business background and experience. Uh, of such a person in making that appointment in the words that I set out in the uh, speech summing up the second reading debate. Thank you, uh, Senator Brandis. The question is that opposition amendment moved by Senator Sherry be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. We will now consider government amendment one to three on sheet uh, PF441. Senator, I call the minister, Senator Brandis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, on behalf of the government, I move um, amendments numbers one to three. I seek leave to move amendments number to one, numbers one to three on sheet PF441. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator, Senator Brandis. Mr Chairman, the government is moving these amendments to include a new prohibition in part four of the Trade Practices Act that will specifically target anti-competitive below-cost pricing by corporations with a substantial market share. Now, um, Mr. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, the reason for this is that although there was a view held by many, including many with expertise in this field, that the existing provisions of section 46 were, um, in their current terms, sufficiently broad to deal with the problem. Nevertheless, in a sense out of abundant caution, the government has decided to uh, agree to the proposition that there ought to be more specific provision made uh, in relation to the issue of below-cost pricing. So amendment number one amends the trade practice this, this bill to introduce a new subsection 46.1 capital A capital A. That uh, provision will prohibit a corporation with a substantial share of a market from supplying or offering to supply goods or services for a sustained period at a price that is less than the relevant cost to the corporation of supplying such goods or services for the same purposes as currently set out in subsections 46.1a to c of the Act. So, in other words, the exi existing proscribed purposes 
uh, will apply, but they will be given, uh, or the courts will be given direction to uh, uh, apply them specifically rather than in the generic framework work of the existing section 46 to the particular case of a corporation with a substantial share of market power in the circumstances which I've just recited. Amendment 1 also in introduces section, subsection 46 1 capital A capital B. That subsection provides that the court in determining whether a corporation has a substantial share of a market for the purposes of the prohibition may have regard to the number and size of competitors of the corporation in the market. This provision is expressed so that it does not limit the matters to which the court may otherwise have regard in determining whether a corporation has a substantial share of a market. To assist with the interpretation of this new provision, consequential amendments are included to ensure that it is subject to the existing subsection 46.1 capital A. As a result, for the purposes of the new prohibition, a reference to a competitor will be deemed to include a reference to competitors generally or to a particular class or classes of competitors, and a reference to a person will include a reference to persons generally or to a, to a particular class or classes of person. These consequential amendments will assist in ensuring coherency between the existing prohibition contained in section 46.1, that is what I've described as the generic prohibition, and the more particular application um, uh, um, envisaged by the new prohibition. Now, the second um, uh, set of amendments, uh, Mr Chairman, deal with the application of the um, uh, section 46 to, uh, to, to the telecommunications industry. Uh, the consequential amendments to part 10, I'm sorry, part 11 capital B of the Act, subsection 151 capital A capital J 5 C of the Act presently provides for an amended application of section 46 for the purposes of section 151 AJ 3 in the case of a telecommunications carrier or carriage service provider that is not a corporation or a partnership. In particular, the Act currently provides that in determining whether such a carrier or service provider is in contravention of section 46, it is to be assumed that the expression, quote, or a body corporate that is related to the corporation, close quote, were omitted from subsection 46.1a. The second set of amendments ensures that the same assumption is made in relation to the prohibition which is contained in the first set of amendments, that is, uh, the amendments which will introduce um, subsection 46.1aa and 1ab to provide ongoing consistency between section 46 and part 11 capital B. Now, Mr Chairman, the third uh, set of amendments are amendments to the scheduled version of section 46. Um, these amendments, um, the purpose of these amendments is to make corresponding changes to the version of section 46 found in part one of the schedule to the Act. That is the version of the Act that applies in the states and territory by virtue of the application legislation. The changes in Amendment 3, that is the third set of amendments, I should say, are identical to those in the second set of amendments, and they ensure that the new prohibition in subsection 46.1 capital A capital A and the provisions of section 46.1 capital A capital B apply to all businesses in Australia regardless as to their structure. That is whether they are governed by Commonwealth or state or territory law. It should be noted that the amendment is constrained by the conduct of the corporation that has a substantial market share. For example, the corporation must have the purpose of damaging a competitor or preventing the entry of a competitor or potential competitor in order for it to be in breach of the new prohibition. And the conduct must also be con uh, carried out for a sustained period. In other words, the tests in subsection 46.1 uh, A to C of the existing section 46, the generic pro, um, provisions about motive uh, will apply in relation uh, to um, the amendments to the scheduled version of section 46 as they do to the specific below cost pricing provisions which I have outlined. Uh, Senator Sherry. Thank you. Um, Labor will be supporting the government's amendments. Uh, the amendments insert a specific section dealing with predatory pricing. 
Currently, predatory pricing is one type of conduct that can be captured by Section 46 misuse of market power provision. The new specific predatory pricing section prohibits a corporation with substantial market share from supplying goods at a price below relevant cost for a sustained period of time for an anti-competitive purpose. The new concept of substantial market share is different to substantial market power in Section 46. A further difference is that there is no requirement to prove that a corporation took advantage of its substantial market share for an anti-competitive purpose. This removes the second hurdle of, pr pr <coughs> excuse me, of proving uh, taking advantage, which currently exists in Section 46. Now, Labor will support the amendments, but is concerned this amendment was hastily cobbled together at the last minute. Uh, it was a very last minute backflip by the government, and that was due to the pressure from small business, from Labor, the Democrats, uh, Family First, and others that uh, brought to bear on the government. Now, the government's changes are welcomed, but only go uh, a small step of a way. There is a lot more the government needs to do to deal with, uh, to strengthen the Act, such as creeping acquisitions, criminal penalties for cartel conduct and access to justice for small business through the Federal Magistrates Court. Uh, supporting Labor's sensible and balanced amendments, which we will deal with, uh, would have dealt with these issues. The key is to strengthen Section 46, not introduce new sections. This change does nothing to crack down on anti-competitive conduct other than predatory pricing. So, uh, it goes some way, a small way, and to that extent Labor will be supporting the government's amendments. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, the, uh, uh, this particular debate is, is not on, on broadcast, and so for those who are going to be uh, reading the debate, uh, I think it's useful uh, to remark that um, in the presence of the duty minister, Senator Brandis, uh, we are fortunate. Sometimes uh, duty ministers do not have particular expertise um, in the uh, bills they, they have to run. They have competence but not expertise. Um, and in this particular case, uh, Senator Brandis is, of course, uh, a person who enjoys uh, uh, and uh, deservedly enjoys a high reputation with respect uh, to trade practices matters, which uh, means that we're likely to get responses which don't just accord with the legislative line, but uh, are hopefully uh, are informed uh, by his background and understanding. I, I make those remarks deliberately because, of course, I want to put a question ar arising uh, from from these amendments. Uh, let me say at the outset, um, the Democrats support the amendments. Uh, let me also say at the outset. Um, and I understand uh, these amendments now go under the quaint name of the Birdsville Amendments, um, so uh, uh, as, as uh, proposed by, by Senator Joyce. And I, I want to compliment again Senator Joyce on uh, his persistence uh, with respect to, to getting these amendments uh, accepted and put forward, uh, because they do advance uh, the general cause. I have the view um, that in certain respects uh, there are people who cannot uh, be satisfied um, by trade practices law that in certain respects uh, of the law, perhaps particularly with re regard to Section 46 matters, uh, that which advantages small business uh, will disadvantage uh, big business because it restrains their ability to take advantage of their market power to to exercise the natural monopolistic instincts of of any business um, uh, uh, faced by the opportunities to increase their market share and increase their profitability um, I often refer to business behavior uh, even where it is uh, prohibited or or um, uh, or condemned as natural behaviour because it is the desire of businesses to acquire market share, uh, to increase their profitability and to increase their market standing. And that is my lead in, uh, Minister, through the Chair, to uh, a reaction I have noted uh, from uh, big business and big business organisations. Uh, firstly, it's with some pleasure I note uh, antagonism from big business because 
to me that means that it's actually reflecting um, uh, some benefit to small business. Uh, but I've also seen uh, a particular uh, argument put out in this case by the Australian National Retailers Association, which, uh, and you know, I'm restating their position, I don't want to verbal them, but is essentially saying this will severely limit the ability of, of uh, national retailers uh, to discount and to operate competitively as they have in the past. I, I personally think that's arrant nonsense. Uh, uh, as soon as this uh, bill is passed, uh, big retailers will continue to compete and discount as they have, have in the past. Uh, they'll just be restrained um, if, if they uh, go too far and, and uh, breach uh, this particular new provision. So uh, my question to you, Minister, is are you aware of uh, criticisms of big business surrounding uh, this amendment? Are you in particular aware of the Australian National Retailers Association's attitudes? And are you able to uh, rebut um, concerns which I think uh, somewhat exaggerate the effect of the amendment? I'll put the government amendment. Oh, Minister. Oh, thank you, um, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you, Senator Murray, for that question. Um, and um, thank you for your acknowledgement. Um, I actually have run predatory pricing cases under the old Section 46 in the federal court, in fact, on several occasions. And I was of the view, which I think we share, Senator Murray, though it wasn't shared by everyone, it's not shared by everyone, that the decision of the High Court in Borrell did change the ground somewhat by reading section 46 too narrowly and, in fact, more narrowly than it had hitherto been read. And it was really, as I think you know, Senator Murray, um, the High Court's um, reasoning in the Borrell case, which uh, the judgments in which were handed down on the 7th of February 2003, which did uh, provoke me and others, including your good self, uh, to agitate for reform of section 46 and uh, the establishment of the, or the reference to the Senate Economics References Committee, which has been uh, referred to earlier in the debate. Um, on the other hand, one must, in seeking to deal with and amend a provision as delicate as section 46, be particularly conscious that we don't, as it were, kill the goose that laid the golden egg, that by protecting, uh, and it's, a, it's, one of the, it's the basic proposition that can't be recited often enough about section 46, Senator Murray, and I think it's shared by both sides of politics that the purpose of section 46 is to protect competition, not to protect competitors. It is about process, not individual companies. And as the courts, both before and after the Borrell case, have said, time beyond number. The fact that an individual firm may, as a result of competition, go out of business is not of itself a bad thing. Often that is the clearest proof that the competitive process is working, that resources are being allocated efficiently. The necessary condition, as you, Senator Murray, better than most people know, is necessary for the consumer getting the best possible deal. The vice is where the conduct which drives a, a corporation out of a market <coughs> is, um, is uh, features uh, some of the malign purposes which the existing section 46 um, uh, 3 A to C uh, uh, proscribe and which it is the purpose of this provision uh, to apply more particularly to the issue of predatory pricing. Now, as I said uh, earlier on, uh, there, are people, there are different minds as to whether the existing section 46 deals with predatory pricing sufficiently. And it's one of the problems in this area of, of, of discussion that predatory pricing is not a defined term. Different people throw this term around and it means different things to different people. 
but it has never been um, the understanding of either the economists who write about this area or the lawyers who practice in the area that predatory pricing means discounting per se. And it is plainly the intention of the government in drawing this amendment to ensure that it is not so widely drawn that it, it, that it constitutes um, a, it, it would have a chilling effect on discounting per se. And that is why the um, language of the amendment is hedged in the various ways in which, uh, as you can read from, from the terms of it. So, Senator Murray, I, I hope that uh, addresses your question in a, in a, in a, in a somewhat long-winded way, uh, for, for which I apologise. But um, let me make it as clear as can be that it is not the government's intention, nor would it be good policy nor, in my view, would it be the effect of these words properly construed by a court to read them as constraining the practice of discounting per se. Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I uh, thank the minister for his answer and, uh, may I say, I agree with uh, all, all that he has said. Um, the uh, media release I saw on the 11th of September 2007, and there was another one today, uh, said that ANRA, that stands for the Australian National Retailers Association, CEO Margie Osmond, uh, said amendments to the Trade Practice Act put forward by the National Senator Bar Barnaby Joyce, of course, it's, may I say, uh, it's put forward by the government as a result of the advocacy of, uh, the advocacy of Senator Joyce, um, uh, and I go on to quote, and being considered by the government would deter retailers from offering customer discounts for fear of being prosecuted. Uh, and on the record, I say I disagree with that. That is not the effect of the law, uh, and the minister has confirmed that is not the effect of the law. Thank you, Correct. Chair. I'll put that uh, amendment, uh, government amendments. All those in favour of that, please say aye. Aye. Against the clear carried. Now we'll go on to Democrat amendments. Senator Murray, do you want to speak to them or? Uh, <laughs> I hope, Chair, you're not implying you wish I wouldn't. <laughs> uh, Chair, uh, by leave of the uh, Chamber, I, I want to ask that items two and three uh, be put together and then four and five be put together. Uh, and I will speak to all four, but if they can be put on that basis. Is leave granted? Yep. No, no objection, leave is granted. Uh, in that case, uh, I, I shall uh, sp speak to them all uh, briefly. Uh, the amendments uh, I have uh, put um, have been circulated on sheet 5324 revised, uh, and item two uh, that, I, that I have raised uh, refers to the misuse of market power. Um, in some respects, uh, I can argue, and of course those responding to my amendments could argue, uh, that this amendment does not change the law significantly. In my view, that's its virtue, uh, but others may, may argue that it's, it's not necessary. What I'm attempting to do here is to provide uh, more guidance uh, to the courts in relation uh, to a substantial uh, degree uh, of m power in, in a market. Uh, and there are some key words included in my amendment uh, which, in, in my view, make it uh, slightly more effective than the government's uh, amendments which have already been put uh, through the bill. Um, although this amendment uh, does look similar to the government's, it includes additional key words and concepts which are lacking from the government's amendments, in particular the wording at least as a, a clause. Uh, which leaves open to the court to find that there may be other factors which may determine a substantial degree of power in the market. In other words, I seek to give the courts um, more, more legroom. Uh, and that refers to uh, three, three F, uh, is, is my remarks with that regard. With respect to 3G, um, this amendment does not elevate the ability to raise prices to being the sole test of substantial market power because that is already the test used by the courts through the Borrell case. The amendment states the company can have substantial market power even though it cannot raise prices without losing business. 
My amendment attempts to oblige the court to look beyond an ability to raise prices to other determinants of market power. Currently, the High Court has become too focused on an ability to raise prices without losing business, and this amendment operates to move them away from that focus in accordance with the parliamentary intention behind the concept of substantial market power. Turning to item three, uh, that amendment covers predatory pricing. I've included this amendment as I was unsure uh, whether Labor would be putting forward um, the amendments they originally proposed in the House of Representatives. Uh, I believe this is an important point to be made and should be made again. The court does not need to have regard to the ability of the corporation to recoup their lo losses when determining whether or not there has been predatory pricing. Now, the issue of recoupment is a huge issue in, in trade practices. Uh, cases and in trade practices uh, theory and, and commentary. Um, my own belief, and in part that comes uh, from an extensive business experience, uh, is uh, that the ability of the corporation to recoup their losses is, is not uh, a necessary condition when you are referring to the issue of predatory pricing. So those are items two and three which I will put, uh, and I'll now discuss items four and five which we'll put separately. Uh, item 4 for C, uh, the introduction of that uh, suggestion. Uh, some people uh, may again see this amendment as rather nuanced. Uh, currently, the, ta taking, the test for taking advantage is whether the company could have engaged in the same conduct without substantial market power. That is, if a company with substantial market power could have engaged in the same conduct without market power, then the firm is currently not considered to have taken advantage of its substantial market power. Up until now, the courts have treated take advantage as another onerous hurdle to render section 46 relatively weak. This amendment attempts to stop the courts from using the current onerous test for take advantage. If this amendment were in place, the test would revert to using market power. Item 546AB uh, is the uh, attempted amendment. Although there has been a move away from using the words anti-competitive in the Trade Practices Act, who I might say through the chair I've always rather liked the word anti-competitive, um, I think it is essential that it is made clear that it is only anti-competitive price discrimination which is prohibited. As we all know, not all price discrimination is anti-competitive. In fact, as the minister recently outlined, uh, price uh, discrimination and price competition is to be desired and to be encouraged, not to be discouraged. So being able to buy something on special at one store instead of another at, is what a competitive marketplace is about. That is why the amendment is framed as it is. Uh, there may be different costs in supplying, and there is a defence built into the amendment. The amendment also seeks to stop a firm from engaging in price discrimination, and if a person or company were seeking to induce a person to do so, then that person or company would be involved in a breach of this amendment through the operation of Section 75B1B. Item 5 uh, is uh, an attempt to introduce uh, 46AC, anti-competitive geographic price discrimination. There may be uh, people who wonder why uh, you should have anti-competitive ge geographic price discrimination. The reality is that there can be locations where price discrimination happens to attempt to eliminate the competition in a particular locale, where, whereas in a different suburb, suburb or city there is no price discrimination. In other words, it's particular to a branch or store, not to the chain or, or organisation. I would point out the location here is given its ordinary meaning, that is Canberra, is different from Sydney or different from Perth, or it could even be Deakin, different to Belconnen. I think this amendment is potent in, in uh, looking at situations uh, in suburbs where the large supermarket chains charge different prices to try and drive out competitors in the particular suburbs where those competitors still exist. If prices are different in any location for an anti-competitive process, not purpose, not for a competitive purpose, for an anti-competitive purpose, then they will come under scrutiny under this amendment, and unless justified by a pro-competitive reason, such as clearing perishable or obsolete stock, or by higher costs of supplying in different locations, different prices can therefore fall under this uh, provision. I'd point out that this type of behaviour is recognised in Canada, and this amendment is modelled on a provision of Canadian law, so that uh, that is why we 
we have uh, put it up as an idea. I uh, have no doubt, of course, that uh, in my long experience in these matters, uh, the government will reject uh, the idea, but I would like to hear on the record, of course, why they were rejected. Thank you. Senator Sherry. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, could I thank Senator Murray. Um, Labor is supporting amendments two and three, um, but not supporting four and five for the reasons I'll outline. Um, and Senator Murray has, um, and I thank him, taken up a suggestion to move two and three together, uh, and four and five together, but uh, separately. Uh, in respect to amendments two and three, moved by Senator Murray on behalf of the Australian Democrats, uh, Labor agrees to these amendments. The amendments lower the barrier to prove substantial market power in a sensible way and also partly overcome the government's amendments which provide little guidance on what substantial market power really is. The amendments make it easier to prove that a corporation has a substantial degree of market power due to informal contracts, arrangements or understandings. The amendments provide more clarity to what constitutes substantial market power by stating that it is sufficient that a corporation is not constrained to a significant extent by competitors or suppliers. The amendments clearly state a corporation will still have substantial market power if it does not have the ability to raise prices without losing business to rivals. This is aimed at direct directly overcoming the problems of the Borrell case. The amendments also look at a corporation's pattern of behaviour to determine whether a corporation has a substantial degree of market power. And the Amendment 3, um, Labor supports this amendment. Labor's amendment to explicitly state that recoupment is not required to prove predatory pricing also convey, covers this issue. This amendment is therefore similar to Labor's and so uh, Labor uh, is pleased to support it. Uh, turning to Amendments 4 and 5 that Senator uh, Murray has moved. Um, uh, similar to, firstly on Amendment 4, similar to Amendment 3, Labor believes that uh, our amendment, um, which we will reach uh, sh soon, uh, our amendment to clarify what take advantage means will be more effective and adequately cover the issues um, of connection between substantial market power and the use of that power for an anti-competitive purpose. Uh, again, if Labor's amendments were found to be ineffective, Labor would consider this change to the take advantage concept in section 46. And on amendment 5, um, again, Labor doesn't agree with this amendment, the amendment has the potential to increase prices for consumers because suppliers would not be able to offer discounts to some retailers who in turn pass on savings to consumers. Uh, Labor wants lower and cheaper prices for consumers and believes that these price discrimination amendments are counter to that aim. So in summary and conclusion, uh, we will be supporting Democrats' Amendment 2 and 3, uh, but Labor will not be supporting um, uh, Democrats' Amendments 4 and 5. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. The government does not support um, these amendments, um, not because uh, we disagree with the sentiment, but because either they um, they are odious, either because they uh, merely restate um, in, if I may say so, uh, less um, appropriate uh, statutory language the effect of the government's amendments in any event, or they merely uh, state unnecessarily what is uncontroversially the existing law. Um, in amendment number two, the proposed um, subsection 46.3 capital E um, seems to be based upon uh, recommendation six of the 2004 Senate Committee report uh, and is comprehended by the government's uh, amendments to, sub uh, to the bill in the government's in the existing legislation, subsection 46.3, capital A. This is a point, Senator Murray, if I may be permitted to say so, um, that Ms Kiefel QC, as Her Honour then was, and I argued in the federal court 16 years ago in Dalian and Dalgetty. And, it's, 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 and, and it was a proposition settled by Justice Lockhart in Dowling and Del, Dalgetty in 1992. So um, this, is, this is not a 
this is nothing new and dramatic. Um, the government senators supported recommendation six of the Senate committee because we thought it was just as well to import that proposition into the legislation, but it was already settled law at the time. And the government um, has adopted our, recommend, our support for recommendation six in, as I say, section 46.3, capital A. The second of your proposed amendments, section 46.3, uh, capital F, is again, um, with respect, not required because the freedom from constraint by the conduct of competitors and suppliers, which the amendment, the amendment contemplates, is already covered by subsection, the proposed subsection 46.3 capital C B in the government's bill. And in fact, the government's bill goes further than your, foreshadowed, than your amendment would, Senator Murray, by dealing with constraint by customers, that is, persons to whom the firm supplies goods and services. Uh, in relation to your um, proposed uh, amendment uh, by uh, section uh, 46.3 F capital B, um, the government's response to the, um, the 2004 Senate Economics Committee report rejected that amendment on the grounds that it's unnecessary because firm behaviour is already taken into account in assessing market power, and nothing in the Borrell case change that. I mean, the Borrell case, as you know, Senator Murray, I think did change um, the, the um, judicial interpretation of section 46 in a number of respects, but not in that respect. So what you seek to achieve through uh, that proposed amendment, uh, 46.3 FB, uh, it seems to me um, is entirely unnecessary given the uncontroversial, uh, uncontroversially understood, understood existing state of the law. Now, Senator Murray, turning to uh, Democrat Amendment uh, number three, um, regarding the capacity of a corporation to sell below cost, once again the, government, uh, the amendment is not required because the provisions in the government bill already explicitly provide that the court may have regard to that matter, to the supply of goods or services for a sustained period at a price that is less than the relevant cost of the corporation. That is, the provision of, uh, provision of one of the two amendments I moved as government amendments a few moments ago. And perhaps your amendment was drawn before you saw the government amendments, but uh, I think, Senator Murray, that um, the mischief which you seek to correct there, if it wasn't already dealt with under the existing 46, is, covered by, um, is certainly now covered by government amendments. Mr Chairman, um, I see the time I might um, uh, leave, uh, leave the matter there. And, uh, when I resume, return to your order, other amendments, order, Senator Murray. Order, Minister. Being 2 p.m., I report progress. <coughs> yep. so the committee reports progress. Questions without notice, Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, Community <coughs> Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the minister aware that recent interest rate hikes are one of the key reasons why young Australians can no longer afford to buy a home? Didn't the government promise in the 2004 election campaign that it would, quote, keep interest rates at record lows? Isn't this promise still on the Liberal Party <coughs> website, even today, as part of an election advertisement titled Economic Journey? Can the minister confirm that instead of being at record lows, Interest rates have gone up five times in a row since the election, adding $260 a month to repayments on a $300,000 mortgage. Can the minister explain how a government breaking its promise on interest rates five times over helps young families to buy a home? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, I thank the, 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 uh, uh, the Senator for his question. Uh, again, I'm always a, a little stunned when uh, Labor came, uh, come to this place uh, lecturing us on, on interest rates, uh, uh, Mr. President. Perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, ju just for the record, just, just, just for clarity, uh, Mr. President, um, in terms of a, uh, of, uh, I, I would have thought those asking the question would have been interested in the answer, Mr. President. Um, just in terms of a record, Mr. President, uh, currently uh, um, uh, we are the, the interest rates today are at the highest under, under the Howard has ever been, 
at 8.3. Can I just say that, listen, just for the record, Mr. President, the best they ever achieved, the lowest they ever achieved, was 8.75 per cent. So, so, so the highest they've ever been under us still hasn't been anywhere near as, as, as uh, low as they've been under those opposite, Mr. Mr. President. Well, well, they are record lows. Uh, they are rec oh, They are indeed record lows. They're far beneath what uh, what uh, they were Order. under Labor. They are indeed far below what they were under Labor. And of course, uh, the fundamentals about the, about interest rates, uh, Mr. President, is all about how we run the economy. And I know that most Australians won't need a reminder that when interest rates were running at 17.5 per cent under Labor. If you can only imagine that the tension one feels around 8 per cent now, how bad it would feel under Labor under 17 per cent, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. President, they talk about housing affordability and they talk about interest rates. It's very hard to buy a home, Mr. Mr. President, if you don't have a job. If you don't have a job, Mr. President. Again, <coughs> one of the single fundamentals today, um, unemployment is at 4.3 per cent. Uh, under the other side, of course, uh, it was well over 10 per cent. Now, Mr. President, uh, it's okay sort of to talk about, about uh, how people feel the pain, and no doubt people do. It is a very difficult uh, process in terms of buying, buying your home, particularly in your, 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 your home loan. And uh, of course, interest rates has a, has a part to play in that. But as you'd know, Mr. President, I've said many times in this process that there are many other aspects uh, that can be controlled, and they, of course, can be controlled by the states and territories. They are, of course, Mr. President. Uh, stamp duty, there are land tax, uh, there are a whole range of other taxes, Mr. President, that have been foisted on the Australian public and have been referred to in this place certainly as a housing affordability tax, Mr. President. And of course, of course Mr. President, when we're talking about, about the economy, Mr. President, when we're talking about the, the economy, there's a whole suite of other, other reasons why people should look to the choice of the coalition Labor in the next election. Not only do we provide people with a job, we are not only provided with the jobs, Mr. President. We provide them with the jobs under us that have had wage, wage increases, real increases of 22 per cent. 22 per cent, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, and, and there's some interjections from the other side about, uh, well, what did they do? Uh, Mr. President uh, went down by 1.7 per cent. 1.7 per cent drop in, in, in real wages, rather than the 22 per cent growth in real wages. And of course, uh, Mr. President. A lot of it's about confidence in the future, Mr. President. Confidence in the future, and I can tell you, someone who's buying a home today that has a job can be very confident about keeping that job. And under workplace choices, Mr. President, those on the other side continue to bring up, and I'm very pleased about that, 378,000 new jobs since uh, since work choices. 387,000 new families who can now afford to buy their own home. Order. Supplementary question, Senator Sherry. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I do thank the minister for admitting uh, that interest rates today are higher than they've ever been under his government. But that just goes back to the original question: What happened to the promise to keep interest rates at record lows that your government made uh, three years ago? What happened to that promise if interest rates are at record highs today? And after nine interest rate hikes in a row which have added $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage, how will our kids ever be able to afford to buy their own home after your broken promise? Senator Sherry, I'd remind you to address your question through the chair. Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, again I'll reiterate the, uh, the <coughs> circumstances that the government find themselves in. We find ourselves in a better position a better position than you would ever be under the Labor government, Mr. President. There is no doubt about that, and uh, we will continue to ensure that we run a fantastic economy so people have the best chance ever of having a job, the best chance ever of having an increase in, in, in wages, the best chance ever of having the lowest interest rates if you take the choice between the governments. And we will ensure that people who are buying the first home or need to buy another home are best looked after by, by running once again the greatest economy in the free world. Senator Nash, order, order, order. Senator Nash. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Erica Betts. Will the minister update the Senate on the current drought situation? 
How is the Howard government acting to alleviate the serious problems this drought is creating, and is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Nash, that uh, very effective advocate for the rural communities of this country, for her question. Mr. President, Australia is facing extremely difficult times with the continuing drought. The drought is taking a huge toll on rural and regional Australia. If we don't get good rain soon, the winter crops are expected to fail. This will have a devastating effect on our primary producers. This coalition government has and continues to work with the Australian farming sector to get through these tough times. Since 2001, this government has committed over $2.4 billion to drought assistance. And Mr President, today the Prime Minister announced an additional $430 million in new funding for drought-affected farmers. I'm sure an announcement that Senator Nash uh, is very pleased about. This includes extending exceptional circumstances funding until September next year for 38 drought-declared areas in South Australia and setting aside extra money for parts of Tasmania and Western Australia. Mr President, all this is only possible because of the strong economic management of this government. If we hadn't brought the budget into balance, if we hadn't paid off Labor's $96 billion in debt, freeing up billions of dollars which were previously being used just to cover the interest on Labor's debt, how could we afford to support our farmers through these tough times? And of course, the answer is very simple. We couldn't. This, Mr President, is the real human dividend for good economic management. And as Labor's record shows, and that of the state Labor governments confirms, you simply can't trust Labor with money. Mr President, on top of all that, Labor continues to play politics with our $10 billion plan to secure the future of the Murray-Darling River system and to secure the future the farmers who rely on this river for their livelihood. The Howard government's $10 billion national plan for water security would put more water back into the system by piping and lining leaky irrigation channels. However, the Victorian state Labor government continues to play politics with this plan. And while Premier Brumby and the Victorian state Labor government stand in the way of a workable solution for Australia's <laughs> water situation, Mr Rudd fully endorses this inaction. Mr Rudd pretends he's serious about addressing the looming crisis in the Murray. He pretends that he supports the National Plan for Water Security and he tells us that if only a Labor PM was elected, relationships with the states would be just dandy. But what has he done to get the Victorian Labor Premier to sign onto the plan? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> and indeed, the silence of those opposite confirms that. Mr Rudd is content to let Mr Brumby play politics with a plan rather than act in the national interest. When it comes to Mr Rudd, what this demonstrates is this. Look not at what Labor says, but look at what Labor does, whereas Senator Nash and her constituents and other Australians can actually say that the Howard Coalition government matches its words with actions in support of those that are doing it very tough in our rural communities because of the drought. Senator, Senator Hurley. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to, to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the minister aware that since the 2004 election, working families now spend 36 per cent more on childcare, 18 per cent more on bread, 29 per cent more on fresh fruit and vegetables, 15 per cent more on health care and 28 per cent more on petrol? On top of these cost of living increases, aren't homeowners with a $300,000 mortgage now $457 a month worse off? thanks to nine interest rate rises in a row. How can families plan their budgets when the cost of living just keeps going up? Given that the cost of living for families just keeps going up, 
Can the minister indicate if he supports the Prime Minister's view that working families have never been better off? Order. Order on my right. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it's amazing uh, that we've just heard uh, um, uh, through the question. The inference was, of course, that uh, uh, having un unemployment rates uh, instead of being 10.9 per cent as they peaked under Labor now 4.3 per cent is somehow bad. Right. Somehow bad. And in real terms, if real terms, I can say when we came to office, when we came to office to now, to June of 2007. There's 2,184,000 people today have a job that didn't have one then. That's 2,184,000 people who can now go out and buy, have a job, go and buy a house. They have a job today that they didn't have then. Order. They're going to Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you. And, and perhaps uh, I know you'll understand it in this place. We talk, we talk about 10% uh, 10 per cent unemployed, over 10 per cent unemployed. So when we came to government, there was 45 federal electorates with more than 10 per cent of the people didn't have a job, didn't have a job. And uh, of course now, now, Mr. President, there are no federal electorates under which we have 10 per cent of people unemployed. So we're very proud of that. We're very proud of that. Uh, and, I, and I have to say that uh, uh, that the capacity to give to give people jobs is not only it, looking at our past record, of course, in terms of housing affordability, we have a plan for the future. On the 26th of July in 2007, Mr. President, the Australian Order. government announced that we would be inviting expressions of interest from state and territory governments, from the non-government sector and the private sector for their proposals <coughs> and their ideas of new and innovative approaches to using the available houses, the available funding to house, uh, to fund increasing housing supply. Now, they've had several proposals have been put forward recently to seek to increase the supply of affordable residential land and housing stock, uh, Mr. President. So these are innovative processes that are actually engage by the organisations we know are going to deliver, Mr. President. We're very interested in examining the proposals as part of our increasing social housing supply request and information processes. Now, this government has consistently called on the state and territory governments to manage the provision of a range of housing options to Australians, specifically to increase the available and affording affordable land and housing, Mr. President. Now, despite almost a billion dollars a year, Mr. President, in investing in other places with other organisations, principally the uh, state and territory uh, uh, Labor parties, we have managed to go backwards in terms of, of, of housing. And it's all right in this place, Mr. President, to look at, at people who are buying houses and the interest rates, but the people uh, who surround me on this side the information I get to them that people are also concerned with issues of rental, and we need to have a comprehensive policy statement that deals, deals with these issues across the board. So instead of, instead of providing a billion dollars a year, Mr. President, for 10 years, so that's 9.6 billion over 10 years, Mr. President, we haven't got a single extra house. We haven't got a single extra house. And the only failure in that policy by this government, Mr. President, was to trust state and territory Labor government, Mr. President. That was our failure, and I can tell you this is not a government uh, that continues to do the same thing and expects a different outcome, Mr. Mr. President. Which is why we are looking at alternative policies and engaging in alternative partnerships arrangements to ensure that Australians buying their first home, or in fact are in the rental market, are getting the very best deal they can. Supplementary question, Senator Hurley. Thank you, Mr. President. How does the minister's vague, wandering answer help working families who are struggling with huge mortgages and rents and spiralling petrol, childcare, and grocery prices? Order. Order on my right. Is Order. the minister? Is the minister really so out of touch that he agrees with the prime minister, who says that working families have never been so well off? Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr. President, I, had I attempted to answer, I think that was the childcare, the vegetables, the affordability and interest rates all in the one question. I don't really think it would have been as useful as, as sticking to the central point of, of, of the question. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr., Mr., Mr. President, Mr. President the, the fundamental point was, was, was uh, the capacity for individuals to continue to pay off the mortgages. 
That was the fundamental point of the question. And perhaps what we can look to is the Reserve Bank uh, that, are, that have stated that around a quarter of owner occupiers are more than a year ahead in their scheduled payments. A year ahead in their schedule. It's just fact. I'm not making any subjective point about that or how Australians are doing. We, I acknowledge that it is difficult from time to time uh, uh, for many, for many demographics, as it has been historically when you're buying your first home. That's the whole thing about your first home. Yes, it can be difficult, uh, but it's tremendous to see that the uh, Reserve Bank actually estimates, factually estimates, less than one per cent of all home borrower households are more than 90 per cent, 90 days behind in their repayments. And I think that's a record. Order, Minister, be your time has expired. Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ellison. Will the Minister advise the Senate of new initiatives to deliver hospital based training for enrolled Australian nurses? S Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Adams for what is a very important question. Uh, to the public of Australia and uh, acknowledge Senator Adams' uh, great interest in this area, particularly in the home state of Western Australia. Mr President, uh, the Prime Minister has announced that uh, we will provide funding of $170 million uh, to create 25 Australian hospital nursing schools to deliver hospital-based training for enrolled nurses in both public and private hospitals. And it's important to remember that we are covering both public and private hospitals with this announcement. Uh, we see this as a partnership between both those sectors and a step forward in providing uh, additional nurses and providing the incentives for people to take up a nursing career. Can I say that uh, in, in relation to this initiative, students will receive practical on-site training at our hospitals uh, and will achieve nationally uh, accredited uh, qualifications in the diploma or advanced diploma level. Mr President, uh, selected hospitals will receive infrastructure funding from the Australian Government uh, for educational facilities to be developed, and we will provide four training staff for those participating hospitals. The first intake is expected to be in 2008, and uh, we envisage around about 500 additional enrolled nurses taking this up. Uh, they, there are a number of incentives that I mentioned. Uh, firstly, participating hospitals will pay trainee salaries until they attain their qualifications. The Australian Government will provide wage subsidies to hospital nursing schools for each student for the first three months of $500 a week to assist the schools to provide their students with a wage. As well as that, the Australian Government will pay the hospital nursing schools a $1,500 commencement fee or bonus. And, uh, an additional $2,500 on the completion uh, for each student. In addition to these payments uh, to the hospital nursing schools, the Australian Government will directly pay each student a tax-free bonus of $2,000 once they have successfully uh, completed their first six months of the course and a further tax-free bonus of $3,000 when they have successfully completed the whole of the course. Mr. President, these are tangible incentives to get more people into nursing. And I might add, this is uh, in addition to the university-based system that we have. In fact, since 2005, under the Howard government, we have seen a further 3,700 additional nursing training places at universities, and that's, that, and that's going to grow to 10,000 by the year 2012. So what we have here is an initiative which builds on the existing uh, university-based training that we have and will provide practical hospital-based training. We are desperately short of nurses in this country, Mr President, and this will act to remedy that. And it's been recognised widely. In fact, uh, a statement I see put out uh, on September the 15th by the Australian Nursing Federation in Western Australia welcomes this plan. It welcomes this plan, as do other people involved in the nursing profession in this country. This is a very good initiative which spells good news for the administration of health care in this country. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Abetz, the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. And I refer the minister to the letter to Australian nurses from Mr Hockey, published in newspapers across the nation at the weekend. Can the minister confirm that this full-page advertisement was paid for 
by Australian taxpayers, not by the Liberal Party. And will the minister now come clean on the full cost of this latest advertising campaign? Can the minister tell Australian taxpayers, who have already footed the bill for $93 million worth of Howard government work choices advertising, just how many more advertisements from Mr Hockey the Howard, government's, Howard government expects taxpayers to pay for? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I think more and more Australians are coming to realise, the misinformation campaigns run by the ACTU and aided and abetted by the Australian Labor Party has caused a great degree of confusion within the minds of the Australian public. And therefore, Mr. President, it is appropriate, it is appropriate for us as a government to put the facts on the record. And the facts are these, Mr. President. The Australian public has been provided with misinformation and misleading uh, commentary about, the, about how the pain conditions of Australia's nurses are set. Advertising was placed in the national newspapers on the weekend to clarify the situation with Australia's nurses so that they know where they stand. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare publication titled Nursing and Midwifery Labor Force 2004 shows that around two-thirds of nurses are employed in the public sector. Two-thirds of nurses employed in the public sector. These nurses have their pay and conditions set by state Labor governments. Two-thirds by state Labor governments. And yet the ACTU and the Nurses' Union and other organisations deliberately mislead the Australian people in relation to that. The publication also shows that around 14 per cent of all nurses are residential aged care nurses. The majority of residential aged care nurses, around three quarters, are employed in the private sector. Nurses working under the Federal Workplace Relations System have the protection of the fairness test when negotiating AWAs so that penalty rates and overtime cannot be exchanged without fair compensation. All employees in the federal system have a set of protections which all employers must abide by. Now, Mr President, in relation to government advertising generally, can I make this point? State Labor governments around Australia have in fact outspent that which we, as an Australian government, spend in communications campaigns. Do you ever hear one word of criticism from Mr Rudd about state Labor advertising? Never once. Never once. When Mr Beattie's watermelon smiling face appeared in all the national newspapers promoting how well he was running Queensland despite of Dr Death and other issues, the Queensland taxpayer funded those advertisements and guess what? Not a squeak, not a squeak from the former Mandarin of the Queensland Government, one Mr Rudd. Now what that's showing is, Mr President, is that this Mandarin is fast turning into a lemon. Because what Order. he's not able to do Order is to on deliver left. on his policy with his state Labor colleagues. And so he says he's going to cooperate with his state Labor colleagues. You know what that means, don't you? Huge advertising expenditure, way and beyond that which has ever been seen. In relation to nurses, Mr President, the feedback we have got is that a lot of nurses now feel very satisfied that the misinformation being put out by the Nurses Federation has simply been a political ploy to damage the government and not within the interest of nurses at heart. Supplementary questions? Senator Thank you, Wong. Mr. President. I note the minister asserts that it is appropriate for Mr. Hockey to use taxpayer fund to advertise his open letter. I note the minister again refused to come clean with Australian taxpayers and tell them how much they are spending on this latest round of advertising. Why don't you answer the question, Minister? Can, can uh, the minister Senator also Wong, confirm? Order, through Wong. you, Mr. No, President. Not through me, to me. 
Through you, Mr. President, the minister could come clean with Australian taxpayers and tell them just how much they are spending on Mr. Hockey's latest round of industrial relations advertising. Minister, can the minister also confirm that the Howard government is on track to spend nearly two billion dollars, two billion dollars of taxpayers' fund on advertising during its term in office? Minister, isn't it the case? that the Howard government will do anything, say anything and spend any amount of taxpayers' money in an attempt to get itself re-elected. Sen Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As the honourable senator well knows, 25 per cent of government communications is spent on what? Defence force recruitment. Defence force recruitment. Would the Labor Party abolish that? Absolutely not. Would they abolish the advertising that communicates with people about their rights and responsibilities in relation to, let's say, drugs? Would they do that? No, they wouldn't. So what they say, very dishonestly to the Australian people, we're against all the advertising, but when you start putting them down campaign by campaign, the only one they don't like is Order. work choices, and the reason they can afford to do that is Order. because the ACTU is outspending the taxpayers in relation to their misinformation campaign, and the Labor Party seeks to surf into government on the top of this wave of misinformation. And we have a duty to the Australian people to correct the record, and that is what we are doing. Order. Order. I remind senators that yelling across the chamber is disorderly. Senator Trude. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to my distinguished colleague from Queensland, Senator Brandis. And it is his capacity as the Minister for representing the Minister for Vocational and Further Education. Will the minister inform the Senate of the steps the Howard government is taking to address Australia's skill shortages? Is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Thank you. Senator Evans. Order. Order. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I'm delighted to be able to inform Senator Trude what the government is doing in relation to the skills shortage. But can I preface my remarks by saying, Mr. President, a skills shortage is a problem, but it is a problem that has a particular cause, and the particular cause of the, of the skills shortage is because unemployment in this country is so low at the moment, and therefore the labour market is so tight. Unemployment, might I remind you, Mr. President, in Australia at the moment is 4.3 per cent. When the government came into office in March of 1996, unemployment was 8.2 per cent, having peaked at 11 per cent under the Hawke and Keating Labor governments. But unemployment today is at a 33-year low. There are more people in work than there have ever been before in this country. And what's more, unemployment has, four, has been below 5 per cent ever since May of 2006 and trending downward. So, Senator Trude, that's why we have a skills shortage. And I want to tell you, Senator Trude, for you, Mr. President, what the government is doing about it. But might I perhaps reverse the order of your question and tell you, first of all, what I know about alternative policies? Because, Mr. President, the ALP does have an alternative policy to those of the government to deal with the skills shortage. It was announced by Mr. Kevin Rudd on the weekend. You know what it is? Mr. President, to set up a task force to look at it. To set up a task force to look at it. Now, Mr. President, this seems to be the Labor Party prescription. I've been going through the Labor Party's policy announcement as to across the whole gamut of public policy. And can I tell you, Mr. President, that so far the Australian Labor Party has committed to establishing 91 reviews. 41 new agencies, 17 new boards and panels, 18 new task forces, five parliamentary. It's a bit like that, that Christmas carol of, 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 the, of the partridge in the pear tree. Five parliamentary inquiries and two summits, and we are counting. So that's why what we know about the alternative policies of the Australian Labor Party. Government by conversation, government by talk fest, 
We know that Mr Rudd can speak fluently under wet cement in two languages, but he never gets anywhere. All he does is he refers matters to yet another policy review, task force, agency, summit or parliamentary inquiry. Now, Mr President, by contrast, the Howard government has undertaken specific real measures, real measures to address the problem of the skills shortage created by the tight labour market, the consequence of the high levels of full employment Order, Senator which we have Resume your seat, Senator Brown. Resume your seat. Order. There is far too much yelling across the chamber. I would ask the Senate to come to order. 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 Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. If I, there are so many of these measures, Mr. President. Perhaps the Senator Trude might need to ask me some yeah, yeah. question, yeah. so I can get through them. But the Howard government has established 28 Australian technical colleges in 24 regions across Australia, provided a wage top-up of $1,000 per annum for two years for apprentices in skills shortage trades provided $500 per annum for two years for training fees for apprentices in skilled shortage trades, extended fee help for people studying diplomas and advanced diplomas in the VET sector, provided up to $50,000 for trading organisations developing fast-track apprenticeships, established the Australian Institute for Trade Skills Excellence, offered a toolkit worth up to $800 to Australian apprentices in skills, needs and occupations. It's amazing to hear them milk the toolkit, Mr President. Almost every last one of them is a union hack who has who's never worked with their hands in their life. But they serve in here, they serve in here Order. on the basis of state and trade union Order. Numbers, like Senator Order. Your time over there from the Senator Brandis. Order Senator Brandis. Order. 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 Senator Evans. Order. Order. Senator, Senator Evans. Order. Order. We will not proceed until the Senate comes to order. Senator Campbell. Senator Trude. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I must say I am very deeply alarmed to learn that the, um, the that the only response that the Australian Labor Party seems to be able to offer to the matter of skills shortage in this country is to set up yet another committee. And I was wondering, Mr. President, whether the minister would be good enough to expand on the very substantive issues to which he was referring in relation to the Howard government's record. Senator Br Mr. Senator I'll Brandis. go on. I was interrupted by the vain contempt by the trade union officials there for people who actually use toolkits. As well, Senator Trude will provide employer incentives of $4,000 per apprentice, establish a $13,000 wage subsidy for mature age apprentices. We've created work skills vouchers up to $3,000 for individuals aged 25 years or over who don't have year 12 or equivalent qualifications created business skills training vouchers of up to $500 for apprentices, provided an additional 5,000 places in the access program which assist job seekers experiencing barriers to skilled employment to obtain and maintain an Australian apprenticeship, provide up to, provided up to 4,500 free vocational training places in the trades through group training arrangements, worked in partnership with group training organisations to provide an additional 7,000 Australian school-based apprenticeships and increased funding for the Australian apprenticeship centres Order. to allow them to intervene the time has during expired, apprenticeships. Senator, the time has expired. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, uh, President. My question goes to the minister representing the Prime Minister. I draw his attention to my statement to this House on 4 February 2003 regarding the Iraq war that this is not Australia's war, this is an oil war. This is the United States recognising that as an economic empire of the age it needs oil to maintain its preeminence. And the Prime Minister's statement uh, of the same day saying no criticism is more outrageous than the claim that the US behaviour is driven by a wish to take control of Iraq's oil reserves. I ask the Minister, in view of Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the US Federal Reserve's um, 
point of view revealed today that what everyone knows, the Iraq war is largely about oil. Why did Prime Minister Howard mislead this nation? How could he have gotten it so wrong? And will he now face up to the fact that he led, he came behind George Bush to invade Iraq for reasons of oil and not the other reasons spuriously put forward? Order. Senator Minchin. Uh, Mr President, um, I noticed uh, press reports of Mr Greenspan's alleged comments, and I'm not going to suggest that he didn't say that, but I've not read all those comments. Uh, I'd only say that uh, while he's regarded, I think, highly internationally uh, for his record as the US's central banker, uh, I don't know that he has such a reputation with respect to strategic issues confronting uh, the world and the war on terrorism. I don't think that is his expertise. I'm frankly rather surprised by the reports of him suggesting that the Iraq war was all about oil. Uh, from the Australian government's point of view, and I'm sure the US government's point of view, we totally and utterly reject the suggestion uh, that uh, the uh, effort to uh, liberate the Iraqi people uh, and to ensure that the UN position with respect to Iraq was indeed put into effect uh, had anything to do with oil. And indeed, one could go so far as to suggest if, that if what was worried about if what one was worried about was oil supplies from Iraq, the last thing you would do would be to invade that country. You'd have done some sort of deal uh, with um, the former dictator of that country. It would have been utterly uh, naive and idiotic to do what we'd done. Um, so, Mr uh, President, if I could go back to um, uh, the primary position that Senator Brown is putting to us, that uh, we should never have participated in the US um, action with respect to Iraq. I would remind um, Senator Brown of the circumstances of that action. For years we had had um, the dictator of Iraq thumbing his nose at the UN with respect to sanctions imposed on that country by the UN as a result of that country's invasion of Kuwait. Uh, the dictator of Iraq invaded its peaceful neighbour, Kuwait. Uh, and as a result of that invasion, there was a UN action to repel Iraq, to repel Saddam Hussein and restore peace and liberty to the people of Kuwait. As a result of that, sanctions were imposed by the UN uh, on Iraq and a regime imposed which required inspection of military facilities and weapons facilities in Iraq to ensure that Iraq was not in a position to develop weapons of mass destruction. The Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein expelled the UN, refused to comply with the UN, refused to allow inspection of those facilities um, and thumbed its nose at the UN, such that even the, leader of the, the now Leader of the Opposition, uh, Mr Kevin Rudd, accepted that in all likelihood there were weapons of mass destruction being developed by the Hussein government. It was reasonable for the world to assume that the behaviour of Saddam Hussein was consistent with him developing weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, tragically, the UN could not bring itself to enforce its own sanctions. The great tragedy in all of this is that the UN, regrettably, was incapable of enforcing the sanctions that it had imposed and enforcing its rule on the dictator of Iraq. And as a result, the US decided to lead a coalition to impose those sanctions and enforce the will of the UN upon Iraq. Now, it was one of the most difficult decisions this government has ever had to make. Uh, I was a member of the Cabinet which made that decision, and it's probably the most difficult decision that I've participated in. Uh, the Cabinet members <coughs> knew it would be controversial, and people like Senator Brown would oppose it. We continue to believe we did the right thing. We continue to believe that we acted properly and in good faith and in Australia's national interests, and, Mr President, it had nothing to do with oil. Supplementary question, Senator Brown. Good question. Well, Dr. Greenspan says it was largely about oil. How could the government have gotten it so wrong? And I ask, uh, flowing from that, with the Prime Minister making clear that 20 per cent of crude oil comes from the Middle East, what is the government's preparation for this nation as peak oil approaches? Senator, Senator Minchin. 
Uh, well, Mr. President, I'm not sure that a discussion about peak oil, which could take uh, at least um, several answers, has anything to do with the rest of that question. All I'd say is that, with great respect to Mr. Greenspan, a, a gentleman who I do respect for his record as the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve Governor, uh, he is completely wrong on the issue of the motivation uh, for the action that was taken in Iraq. We continue to believe that what we did with respect to Iraq was right, that our presence there is right, and that what we have done is to bring liberty to the people of Iraq and ensure that the dictator of Iraq could not develop weapons of mass destruction to imperil <coughs> the free world. Senator Ronaldson. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Communications, Information Technology and the Arts, Senator Coonan. As the Minister was aware, the continuation of reliable mobile phone coverage is an extremely important issue for regional and rural Australians. Will the Minister please advise the Senate of any government action to protect those living and working in regional and rural Australia from the potential for a premature closure of the CDMA network before the next G network provides at least as good coverage Conroy. and services? Senator Kernan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I do thank Senator Ronaldson for the question and uh, for his uh, for his interest in regional and rural telecommunication services, and in particular the important issue of the closure of the CDMA network. Uh, since announcing its intention to construct the next G network, Telstra, of course, uh, Mr. President, has given public assurances that the CDMA network will continue to operate until the next G network provides at least as good coverage and services. And, Mr. President, the government has heard loud and clear the concerns from regional and rural Australia about the problems currently Order. being experienced with the Senator next Conroy. G network. And after hearing those concerns, I issued Telstra with a draft licence condition that would, if made, require Telstra to keep the CDMA network in operation until the next G network provided at least as good coverage and services. In accordance with the legislative requirements, Telstra were given 30 days to consider the draft licence condition. Disappointingly, however, uh, before I had a chance to fully consider Telstra's submission on the draft, they commenced Senator legal action Conroy. in an attempt to prevent a final decision being made to protect rural and regional Australians from the network being shut down until there was equivalent or better coverage. Now, this is a very important matter for rural and regional consumers, and they deserve better than to be left hanging while Telstra subjects them to a time-consuming, costly and pointless legal dispute. Accordingly, I authorised last week the Attorney General, the Honourable Philip Ruddock, to consider the matter and, if warranted, to make the decision in relation to the draft licence condition. I was today advised, uh, Mr. President, that the Attorney has in fact made the decision to vary the conditions of Telstra's carrier licence to protect users in the transition from CDMA to Next G. Importantly, it means that regional and rural Australians can be assured that the CDMA network will not be switched off until Telstra makes good its promise that the Next G network provides at least as good coverage and services. However, uh, Mr. President, uh, regional and rural Australians will be aware of the deafening silence that came from Mr. Rudd and the Labor Party in this most important matter that affects those in rural and regional Australia. Not even a task force, Senator Brandes. Senator Conroy. Worry, nothing. Deafening silence. So afraid were the Labor Party to interrupt their cosy little relationship with Telstra. Senator Coonan. Labor Senator Coonan, resume your seat. Yes. Senator Conroy, I have consistently asked you to stop interjecting. The Senate will come to order. Senate, Senator Coonan. Thank you, Mr. President. I was in the course of saying that uh, so afraid by the Labor Party to interrupt their cosy little relationship with Telstra that they couldn't even raise a whimper of support for the protection of rural and regional Australians. Mr. Rudd and his union mates should stand condemned today for their abject failure to stand up for consumers around Australia when it comes to mobile phone coverage. In contrast, the government makes no apologies for putting consumers first when considering the regulation of Australia's telecommunications industry. 
the government understands that good mobile coverage is not an optional extra. It's vitally important, and people living in regional and rural Australia can be, can, can be absolutely assured that this government will continue to stand up for their interests and deliver them the services they need and want. Sup. Order. Order. Senator Stirl. Order. Senator, supplementary question. Thank Senator you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I refer the minister to her uh, discussions about premature closure of networks. I uh, just wonder whether the minister can tell us what the implications were of the, uh, of the closure of the analog uh, uh, network uh, uh, by this government uh, following the, uh, the inactivity of the, uh, of the Australian Labor Party when last in government. Senator, Senator Kernan. I thank. Um, I thank uh, Senator Ronaldson for the supplementary. Well, of course, uh, Mr. President, we all remember that uh, the Labor Party's seminal neglect of rural and regional Australia. Order. Oh, what, point of order, Senator Conroy. I ask you to roll this order, question out of order. order. Wait, wait till I call you. I can't hear what you're saying. I'm going to roll this question out of order. As this decision was actually made by Minister Ruddock because Senator Coonan had to embarrassingly pass it across for Minister Ruddock to make these decisions because of her own incompetence. Order. And the you question are now is out of order you and should be directed the to the minister in the other chamber. You are now debating the issue. Uh, there is no point of order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, Mr. Um, Mr President, as those listening to this broadcast will know, the Labor Party has a long record of seminal neglect. In looking after rural and regional Australia, they will not stand up for rural and regional Australians, whether it comes to delivering them broadband, delivering them mobile phones. We all know that the Labor Party is hand in glove with Telstra. They will ride roughshod over consumers in rural and regional Australia, and they will continue this neglect as long as it suits their interests, which is so long as the Labor Party is in cahoots with Telstra. Um, Order. Order. Your colleague wishes to ask a question. Senator Carr. Mr President, my question is to Senator Betts, Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources. And I refer the Minister to the government's $23 million taxpayer-funded climate change advertising campaign. I ask, can the Minister indicate whether the advertisements will tell Australians that under the Howard government, Australia is the second highest per capita greenhouse polluter in the world. Our emissions are projected to grow by a further 27 per cent by 2020, and Australia is one of the only two industrialised nations to have not ratified the Kyoto Protocol. If, if, if the government's climate change advertising campaign really about providing information, wouldn't it contain facts like these? Or is it instead just another propaganda campaign, more about cynical pre-election spin rather than providing factual information? Order on my right. Order. Order. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, what do the Australian people want to learn? through this information campaign, and that has come through very loud and clear to us as a government, because we actually consult with people when we go to our community uh, gatherings, when we talk with people. We get the understanding that all Australians are concerned about climate change and about the environment. And the question they want to know is not what all the Labor Party's rhetoric might be, but how can they personally make a difference, personally make a difference. And that is why, for example, in the information that has gone out to households, we don't tell them that forestry, for example, is the only greenhouse positive sector of the economy, which would be an important fact from my point of view. But the people uh, of Australia want to know how they can best make a difference. And so that is what we are seeking to do in our uh, interaction with the Australian people through this campaign. It's about giving uh, Australians the information they have been seeking so that they can take action in their own homes. Australian households are responsible for around 20 per cent of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. 
so action at this level, along with government and industry, can make a big impact. And of course, what this builds on, Mr. President, is the fact that Australia was the first government ever to establish a greenhouse office. It develops also on our mandatory renewable energy targets, the phase out of inefficient light bulbs, our $200 million global initiative on forests and climate, the recent uh, Sydney Declaration, which achieved a genuine commitment from leaders within our region to move forward on climate change. And so, Mr. President, we could have incorporated all that sort of information in the, uh, in the communications with our fellow Australians, but they weren't really interested in all that. What they were interested in was how they could personally make a difference, and we have fulfilled that need by this particular communication. Supplementary question, Senator Thank Carr. you, Mr. President. I'd ask. Hasn't the government had 11 and a half years to respond to climate change? Why is it that after all of this time, the best the government can come up with is a $23 million pre-election propaganda campaign? Doesn't this confirm once and for all that this is a government full of climate change sceptics, like the minister himself, who are not serious about tackling climate change? And are only interested in getting re-elected. Senator Betts. How do you get that? Mr. President, if uh, Senator Carr was not interested in getting elected, he wouldn't be making such deliberately misleading statements to the Australian public. Because what Senator Carr knows is that when we came into government, immediately on coming into government, a predecessor minister for the environment in fact pursued the issue of whether or not Australia should get an Australian greenhouse office. And we established that in 1998, some nine years ago. And yet Senator Carr deliberately seeks to mislead the Australian people by asserting that we had not engaged on the issue of greenhouse gases and climate change until right now before an election. Senator Carr better explain to the Australian people, Mr President, as to why, if, that, if his assertion is true, why we established the Australian Greenhouse Office nine years ago. The fact is, and I've pointed this out before, Mr President, of all the questions on climate change, the Coalition has Order. asked the most questions Order. since 1996 time, up until the last 12 months. Um, Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs. And I ask, has the Minister seen the report of the UK study this week that shows that the veterans forced to watch British nuclear tests here in Australia uh, will pass on scrambled DNA and crippling health problems to families for 20 generations? Doesn't this make the government's health cards uh, for nuclear veterans look hopelessly inadequate? And will it now stop fighting these sick veterans in, uh, for compensation in the courts? And will the government now do a proper study of the families of Australian veterans and show more compassion than has been apparent so far? Um, Senator Ellison. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I, I am aware of the issue that uh, Senator Ellison has mentioned. It is a serious issue. As to the report, uh, I haven't had a briefing on that. Uh, and I will advise the Senate accordingly. In relation to the uh, health cards afforded to veterans, can I say that uh, uh, we have a variety of uh, health programs available to veterans, um, both the gold card and the white card, and uh, my own feedback from the veterans community has been a positive one in relation to the uh, health services that we provide veterans uh, in, this, in this country, and just recently we made the announcement uh, in relation to the indexation of pensions yeah. or allowances, which went down very well. But as for the health aspect, can I say that uh, uh, we do have a good system in place, and one which I think stands up very well internationally. So I fail to see how St Allison can impute that in some way we are, we are uh, letting down the veterans uh, as a result of uh, in result, as a result of any of the ill effects they might have suffered as a result of the testing concern. 
Supplementary question, Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the minister for his answer. Um, but uh, uh, I ask him to confirm that even those white and gold cards offered to the veterans have been denied to numerous of them who've re who've uh, who've requested them. Uh, uh, and I go on to uh, ask if the minister is also aware about the UK study. Um, that the children and grandchildren of nuclear veterans uh, suffer limb deformities, tumours, heart, eye and hearing problems, epilepsy, autism, brain deformities, twisted spines, missing organs and extra fingers and toes, and a range of other rare conditions. Is he aware that the grandchildren are eight times more likely to inherit a defect and twice as likely to get childhood cancer? So why would the scrambled DNA found in British veterans not also be present in Australian veterans? Sen or order, Senator Ellison. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Ellison has any particular aspect of someone being refused a white card or a gold card uh, that she has some problem with, she should refer them to to the minister and myself, and I'll pass it on. But can I say that uh, in relation to the, the the medical requirements for that, they are they are laid out in the uh, uh, Veterans Entitlements Act 1996, and uh, uh, we apply that criteria to anyone who applies for a, a white card or a gold card. Uh, as to the uh, United, uh, United Kingdom experience, we'll have a look at that and see what we can learn from it. But I've said earlier that uh, I don't have a briefing in relation to that report that Senator Allison has mentioned, and uh, I'll get back to the Senate with further details on that. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Coonan, the Minister for Communications, Information, Technology and the Arts. And I refer to the letters the minister has sent to 500,000 Australians explaining that they have, and I quote, not received a commercial upgrade to enable access to ADSL or wireless broadband. Can the minister confirm that 3G is wireless broadband? Is the minister also aware of reports that Australians who have received her letter have been informed by her department's website that they already have access to ADSL broadband? And can the minister indicate whether she is continuing to mail her misleading letters to Australians? Will the minister now commit to reimburse taxpayers for the cost of the Liberal Party propaganda, which has misled the Australian public? Senator Kuna. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you uh, to Senator Conroy for the question. It actually comes as absolutely no surprise. In fact, it's rather predictable from uh, a Labor Party who is nothing but a puppet and uh, is doing the bidding of uh, Telstra. Uh, we know, of course, that uh, Telstra and the Labor Party are hand in glove, as we've uh, found out from uh, documents produced in the last couple of days. Nevertheless, I'm more than happy to continue to respond to the same questions that are asked of me of both Labor and then of Telstra. So here we go. Telstra is complaining about a letter sent by my department to households that, according to data held by my department, cannot currently receive a metro comparable terrestrial broadband service such as ADSL. And the letter advises these residents of the government's Australia Connected initiative and the new Opel WiMAX and ADSL 2 Plus high-speed broadband network that will cover those particular households in the near future. It's something for them to look forward to, uh, Mr President. And it's entirely appropriate, I would have thought, to inform the constituents of government initiatives especially for a program of this nature, which involves $958 million of government funding to extend high-speed broadband to 99 per cent of the population at prices they can afford. And, uh, the recipients of the letters were persons based on data held by the department uh, to be considered not well served with an affordable metro comparable broadband service. So once again, Telstra True to Form has threatened action against the government, and I don't propose to comment any further on that order. particular point. Senator Kernan, However, point of order, Senator. Point of order. Uh, could, uh, <laughs> it's relevance. Could you draw the minister's attention to the question, which was, can the minister confirm that 3G is wireless broadband? That was that was the question, and can the minister indicate whether she is continuing to mail her misleading letters to Australians? And will she reimburse Order. taxpayers? Order. Order. She's over halfway through her time to answer, and she hasn't addressed any of those questions. Order. 
The minister still has over two minutes of time remaining to answer the question. It was a question that was broader than you originally suggested. I call Senator Coonan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, well, Mr. President. So, um, as uh, uh, those matters go to uh, matters that are apparently going to be the subject of some uh, of some legal action, I'm not going to uh, join issue with uh, Senator Conroy because I prefer to actually answer it where there is uh, an appropriate uh, place to do so. Now, um, Mr uh, President, what is interesting about Senator Conroy's question and the whole line of questioning uh, of the Labor Party when it comes to telecommunications matters uh, is the closeness between the Labor Party and Telstra. And it's because Telstra has realised that only under a Labor government will it be possible to retain its monopoly, destroy competition, wind back safeguards for consumers, support a twofold increase in both telephone and broadband prices. And Mr President, the shame of the matter is, is that Telstra has got the Labor Party where it wants it a puppet on a string, prepared to do Telstra's bidding, regardless of how it will hurt consumers. Order. Supplementary question. Order. Order on my right. Order. 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 Senator Conroy, supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain why her media adviser, when asked about the mail out, claimed in the Australian newspaper on Friday, and I quote, there is now serious competition in the market providing choice for consumers? How can the minister write to Australians about their lack of access to broadband when her own office admits that the Opel product creates competition in the market? Senator Conroy. Well, Mr. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, order, order, Senator Conroy, you've asked the question. Now wait for the answer. Senator Con Senator Mr Coonan. President, um, I hope that those listening to this broadcast understand that the Labor Party have got some fundamental uh, objection to choice for consumers. Yeah, yeah. What an extraordinary admission, That's Mr right. President. That's right. And it's clear that uh, Telstra doesn't like choice and doesn't like competition, and that Senator Conroy and Mr Rudd haven't got the bottle to stand up to Telstra, just like they can't stand up to the trade unions, they can't stand up to state Labor governments, and they're obviously going to not be able to stand up to consumers being ride, ridden roughshod in the bush. Um, Mr um, President, we will resist Telstra's sideshows, we will resist Labor's sideshows, we will continue to stand up for rural and regional Australians. Uh, we will not be intimidated by this sideshow that is going on with court actions and questions in question time, and we will continue to roll Order. out the services that Order. consumers time need and want. Yeah. Your time has expired. Further questions be placed on the notice board. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Senator Ludwig asked me some questions on uh, the Systems for People program in the Department of Immigration last Thursday, the 13th of September 2007. I undertook to get back with uh, further information. I now table that information and seek leave to incorporate it. Ms. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator. Um, Senator Sherry, uh, sorry, Senator Carr, I think you want to. Yes, call. Um, uh, Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 74.5, I would ask uh, the Minister representing the Minister for Education for an explanation as to why answers have not been provided to 145 questions on notice uh, from, from the Employment, Workplace, Relation and Education Committee, which were asked at the May budget estimates. I, now understand, I understand they're now seven weeks overdue. Senator Brandis. Mr President, as I undertook to Senator Carr to do when he raised this matter for the first time on Thursday, I have received the matter with the Minister's office, and I have been provided by the Minister's office which, with the following explanation. As is usual practice in responding to questions on notice arising from, from the Senate estimates process, the Department is preparing responses for all Senators, not just Senator Carr. <laughs> Those responses vary in length and complexity. It is frequently the case that responses are submitted to the Senate across the full time period between the estimate sittings, including up to the day of the next sitting. The responses continue to be prepared and will be submitted to the Senate 
as soon as they are available. Se uh, Senator Carr. To move to take note of the Minister's answer. Uh, Mr Acting, yes, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, I have um, been seeking answers to questions, uh, 175 questions, uh, sorry, 145 questions, uh, of which I understand that 69, 69 were asked myself, but there were 145 questions outstanding from this estimates committee. Now that's some um, 84% of the total number of questions that have been asked by this committee. At the, uh, at the May budget estimates. It uh, defies all possible credibility that the government can say that the, the failure to answer questions is on the basis that there is uh, opportunity for the government to answer these questions up until the first day of the next round of estimates. The date for the answering of questions was the 27th of July. It was the date set by this parliament, by this chamber. It was a date uh, that some nearly eight weeks now have been uh, passed. It is not exactly a stringent uh, uh, timetable. You've been too uh, soft. Uh, not, it wasn't a particularly stringent soft. timetable. Uh, of the 172 questions which were asked on the day of the estimates, not one question was answered on time. Not one question. There was, uh, on, uh, as of uh, last Thursday, Three months after the hearings, 15 per cent had been answered. 145 or 84 per cent remain unanswered. And of course, to make matters worse, legitimate uh, inquiries uh, to the committee have been stonewalled, as, re as we saw here today, yet again. The minister's representative here was asked to read out a highly contemptuous response by the minister's office. Committee staff seeking information are simply told that no timetable for answers can be provided, that all answers are being considered. And we ask a simple question, considered by whom? By the Minister's office? We all understand that we are uh, facing the prospect of an election. It is quite clear that this is a minister that does not want to have this parliament uh, receive answers to legitimate questions taken by the department back in May. And of course this is not the first time that this has happened. There was one particular question, uh, E088, on the question of non-government school funding, which not only did I ask on the day and was uh, and, and it was advice given that the information be provided on the day, I asked again at the time of a consideration of a bill in this chamber uh, some or nearly three months ago. And I've been told, I was told at the time by this minister at the table that every effort would be made to follow up that answer. I don't dispute his bona fides in this question. I don't dis dispute Minister Brandis's bona fide in this question. He did give an undertaking in good faith, but it's quite clear that Minister Bishop has a contemptuous attitude towards the Senate, to the Senate estimates uh, processes. If we look through the issues, these are straightforward questions. There is no issue here about complexity. What is abundantly clear is that the government is seeking to hide information. There is a situation where we are seeing the government floundering around the question of the Australian technical colleges, questions relating to the CSIRO's operations, its commercialisations, its IP royalties, questions relating to the government's latest attempts to conclude uh, it's somewhat uh, tortured to history in regard to the radioactive waste dump and many others. And the issue is whether or not the department is stalling for time, which I don't believe. I happen to think that this department has understood the importance of these questions and over time and over a very lengthy period of time I'm able to uh, say we've engaged constructively with this department. I'm therefore obliged to conclude that the problem here is with the minister and the contemptuous attitude that the minister has uh, about uh, responding to legitimate questions from the Senate. Now, either way it goes, whether it's the department or the minister, the Senate's entitled to these answers. And I would seek from the minister, representing the Minister of Education and Research, uh, that further efforts be made to encourage his colleague to answer these questions uh, before other motions have to be considered by this chamber. Senator Brandis. 
Well, um, Mr Deputy President, um, Senator Carr should not infer from anything that I have said that anyone is stalling. Um, what um, I have said on behalf of uh, Ms Bishop, whom I represent in this chamber, uh, is that um, the um, preparation of the answers um, is proceeding um, and that uh, many of the questions taken on notice are very complex questions. Uh, there are two obligations, not one. Senator Carr would have you believe that there is merely an obligation to respond in a timely fashion. There is, but there is also an obligation to um, respond accurately and thoroughly. And sometimes uh, a thorough and accurate response to questions taken on notice uh, will take some little while. And Senator Carr, with respect, you shouldn't um, draw an adverse inference against the minister merely because. Um, the answers are still in preparation. Nor, should you, nor can you infer from anything I said on behalf of the minister that there is a reluctance to answer the questions. Um, I have told you that I have uh, pursued the matter with the minister. Um, I can't add to that. And I thank you for acknowledging my bona fides in the matter, but you shouldn't, Senator Carr, doubt the bona fides of Ms. Ms Bishop either. All of us as members of parliament, either of this chamber or of the other place, acknowledge our obligations to the parliament as paramount and those obligations will be fulfilled in due course. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Then say no. I think the, no the ayes have it. Um, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Sherry. Yes, thank you. Um, I move to take uh, note of the two answers by Senator or Minister Scullion uh, to the questions posed by the Labor opposition in question time today. Um, it is rare that I do uh, thank a minister because normally we get evasive answers, out of touch answers um, that indicate the government's uh, age, its contempt for the parliament. But I have to say on this occasion um, Senator Scullion uh, was remarkably frank in his acknowledgement when he said, quote, interest rates today are higher under this government, meaning his government, than they've ever been. And he went on and said it again. Interest rates today are higher under the Howard government than they've ever been. And it was a quite a remarkable admission from Minister Scullion in today's question time, because what we got at the 2004 election from the, uh, from the Howard Liberal government was a promise, quote, that they would keep interest rates at record lows. The Howard government would keep interest rates at record lows. And today we have a remarkably frank admission from Minister Scullion, uh, Senator Scullion, that quote, interest rates today are higher under this government, i.e. the Howard government, than they ever have been. And this just goes to make the point that Labor uh, has been referring to uh, on many occasions since the last election. Um, we've had five interest rate increases since the last election. We've had nine interest rate increases in a row, and to really rub salt into the wound uh, of uh, many Australian, struggling Australian um, uh, Australians who are paying not just higher home interest rates but also credit cards in particular, um, is that interest rates, uh, interest rate increases after the last increase by the Reserve Bank, um, by some providers have been above the, the quarter point increase that occurred. Have been above. Um, that last quarter per cent uh, increase. Now, there's a number of complex reasons for that, but, but it does highlight the ineffective and indeed false promise made by Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, at the last election that the Liberal government, a Howard government, would keep interest rates at record lows. And of course, this has had um, the, f the fact that Minister Senator Scullion today admitted that interest rates today are the highest under this government than they've ever been. Um, the, 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 today he could actually admit that um, is, is uh, not of great uh, consolation to Australian families who are battling under these higher interest rates, because the nine interest rate hikes in a row under this government have added some $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage. They've added $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage. And this is what uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, meant uh, apparently when he said he'd keep interest rates at record lows. 
you'd get an increase of $457 a month on your mortgage. That, that's the uh, outcome of the promise, the solemn promise made by Mr Howard at the last election that uh, he, leading this government, an out-of-touch government, a stale government, um, that uh, he would keep interest rates at, a record, at record lows. I mean, it was one of those tricky promises that we are so used to from Mr Howard. Another one of the tricky, disposable promises. You know, say anything, do anything to get you through an election campaign. Say anything and do anything. Well, I, I must say, I think there are some good signs that the Australian public are starting to see through some of the trickiness of the Prime Minister. I'll be interested to see whether the uh, current Treasurer, Mr Costello, can see through the trickiness of the promise, the cobbled together uh, promise that um, was given last week. L2. Yeah, L2. Um, We've now got a, a, a two-person leadership team. We can forget about the National Party, of course, the Howard Vale government, it's the Howard Costello government. Um, I notice uh, Senator McGowan, the former National Party senator, nodding furiously. We can forget about the, the National Party smirking about it too. It's even better. Um, but um, nine interest rate hikes in a row. That's hardly an example of keeping interest rates low. And of course, it's not just interest rates on, on a housing loan. Credit card interest rates. I mean, so many Australians today are dependent on uh, using their credit card because they're under significant economic pressure. They're paying more for childcare, more for fruit and vegetables, more for health care, more for petrol, more on interest rates, pouring greater and greater pressure on Australians um, through higher interest rates and their credit card use. And of course, we've had the industrial, the so-called work choices which has uh, cut the wages and conditions of workers, particularly in areas like the hospitality and retail Senator industry. Sherry, your time has expired. Senator Fear of Andy Wells. The Deputy President. Yes, thank you, Senator Sherry. But uh, if you want to look at why new home ownership is fast becoming the diminishing Australian dream for many people, perhaps you should go and ask your state well, Labor yeah, colleagues. Yeah, yeah. The stubborn refusal of state and territory governments to release enough land for new homes is forcing the price of house and land packages beyond the means of many hard-working Australians. It is a problem that can be tackled, and I think that um, uh, even uh, going back a bit in history, but of course, uh, you know, they might say it, but they don't actually act on it. And uh, even one of your former housing uh, spokesmen, uh, Mr Mellon, um, said we need to increase the availability of affordable land for the construction of new housing. Yes, of course, it's a no-brainer. Thank you, Senator Cormann. In, um, and, and I would take the Senate back to 19, in 2006, when the uh, Reserve Bank Governor Ian McFarlane told a parliamentary committee that the decline of new home affordability was all about house prices. And I'd like to quote what he said then, because it's very much still the situation. I think it is pretty apparent now that reluctance to release new land plus the new approach whereby the purchaser has to pay for all the services up front, the sewerage, the roads, the footpaths and all that sort of stuff, has enormously increased the price of new entry-level home, Mr McFarlane said. If you want any further evidence, consider this disturbing fact. The price of land in Sydney between 1973 and 2003 rose by 700 per cent while the cost of the housing component of house and land packages has increased by just 4 per cent over the same period. Now, that is absolutely shocking. Labor, it is shameless the way Labor continue to protect their mates in the states and territories by blaming interest rates. This could not be further from the truth. Interest rates have averaged 12. Uh, averaged 12.75 per cent during Labor's 13 years in government, compared to the low rates under the coalition. I mean, have we forgotten 17 per cent interest rates? How many people had to sell their homes when interest rates were at 17, 17 per cent? Yes, absolutely, Senator. Yes, interest rates are part of the equation, and the Howard government will always strive to maintain economic settings to keep interest rates low. The decline in affordability 
is further accelerated by the array of state taxes and charges. The act of paying for a new home is just the tip of iceberg when it comes to, to the costs that are faced by new home buyers. Families are hit by a raft of property taxes, stamp duties, infrastructure levies and other development costs levied by state and territory governments, all on top of the purchase price. I think it is time that Labor, state and territory governments abandon the ill-conceived notion of urban consolidation, a byword which has now become a um, fact for loading more people onto existing services, loading more people onto existing services and removing the financial shackles from new home buyers. Can I, and why would they? Of course, we don't, have, um, we don't have the powers to drop state taxes. The only people who can compel the state Labor governments to drop their state ta ta taxes are their own voters. We can't make the New South Wales government, we can't make the Western Australian government reduce stamp duties. Uh, they get an absolute bonanza out of state duty in New South Wales. So if those opposite really were concerned about housing affordability, perhaps they ought to uh, impose on their state counterparts to look at the price of land, uh, at, to look at the raft of taxes, the stamp duty and, more importantly, the supply of land. That's, in the end, what is causing it simple. If you restrict supply, the price goes up. So it's all very well for those opposite to bleat, but uh, why don't they take some time, why don't they take some effort and, impo and try and get their state counterparts to actually do something about this and not just talk about it? Senator Marshall. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, today, in, in uh, the answer to questions from the opposition about the cost of living and housing affordability, we saw again another demonstration about how out of touch this government is. Uh, Minister Scullion today, um, in answering the question, went straight to the point um, which we've been making for some time, that the government has failed to keep its promise of keeping interest ra rates at record lows. We've now had five interest rate increases since the last election, where they made that dishonest promise to the Australian people. And of course, it is a ninth interest rate rise in a row. Hardly a, a government that has a strong record in this area. And of course, they then go on and tell the other mistruth about interest rate rises. They say they'll always be lower under a coalition government than they will be under a Labor government. But oops, Mr Deputy President, they forgot when Mr Howard was indeed Treasurer in 1982 when interest rates were in fact 22 per cent. Oops, they always seem to forget that matter. The highest interest rates have ever been in this country. And who was Treasurer at that time? Mr Howard. So it puts a lie, an absolute lie to the claim that interest rates will always be higher um, under a Labor government than a coalition government, because it is simply not true. What this government went to the last election to was just simply a dishonest election ploy as part of a scare campaign. And in this election, we'll see another scare campaign. This is what this government does. They will try to confuse people Consumer with. with I beg your pardon. Well, now we're, here, um, and now we're hearing from uh, the ex-National Party Senator, Mr McGurran, or Senator McGurran, talking about uh, economic policy. Well, um, what, an extraordinary, what an extraordinary example that is. The psycho babble that we normally hear from the National Party, he's brought over the, to the Liberal Party and it just uh, keeps going. Now, it didn't take Senator Scullion or Minister Scullion very long, and we just heard uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells again uh, move straight to the position of blaming the states for problems about housing affordability and the, the growing and increasing pressure that all Australians are under. Uh, under this government's policies, uh, straight into blaming the states. No answers themselves, no policy position themselves. And of course, when interest rates were in fact lower, they wanted to take all the credit, all the credit for the way the economy was going, all the credit. But as they get to their fifth 
or their ninth interest rate increase in a row, the fifth increase under this government since they made that failed and dishonest promise in the last election campaign. It's everyone else's problem. Well, they want to take all the credit at one stage. Now it's everyone else's problem. And now, how often do we hear from this government that it's always the states? We've always got to blame the states. When things aren't going well, when the levers of the economy at the national level aren't working the way they set out, well, it must be the state's problem. It's got to be the state's problem. But we never hear them actually say when, when, the, when things go well, it's actually part of the state's problem. Like with, and I think it was Senator Brandis today actually acknowledged how um, the employment or the, the reduction in unemployment had in fact been happening since prior to the election, well prior to the election of this government. It has been trending downwards um, since 1993, clearly um, trending downwards since 1993. Are they going to blame the states for that? Blaming the states for that? No, this government, of course, will take all the credit for that, even though in many instances it is the states with their policies of manufacturing development, um, economic growth that contribute to that. And of course, the complete lie is put to this argument time and time again. Mr Deputy President, the Prime Minister John Howard must have been mocking Australians when he said and claimed in the other place that working families have never been better off. He must have been mocking those Australian workers and Australian families, saying they've never been better off when family budgets are under pressure from all sides—childcare costs, petrol costs, grocery costs, rising mortgages and the inability of many families to meet their mortgage repayments. Ten years ago, the average home cost about four times the average annual wage. Today, it costs about seven times the annual average wage. Prime Minister Howard mocks Australian workers. He's completely out of touch. He mocked Australian families when he claims that working families have never been better off. This Senator is just Marshall, simply another— Senator your time has expired. Senator Barnett. Mr uh, Deputy President, I stand to take note of answers uh, to those uh, questions that have been given by the government ministers on this side, uh, particularly with respect to interest rates, housing affordability and the future for small business in this country. Uh, the Labor senators have been waxing lyrical on the other side and uh, talking about the fact that, uh, that Mr Howard, as Prime Minister, is anti-families. Nothing could be further from the truth. The reason that uh, this government has been so successful over so many years, in fact 11 and a half years, is that this is a government for families. This government has showed passion, compassion, care and support for families throughout Australia, not only in the big cities but in the rural and regional parts of Australia, including in my home state of Tasmania. Now, it's very clear to me, it's in fact quite obvious to me, that the Labor senators have become very, very cocky. They have become very, very cocky on the back of some uh, recent polling, and they have acting as though they are already uh, government senators. They are very quietly and sneakily uh, acting um, and strategising to ensure that uh, some of their policies uh, come to fruition. And the only way I want to say, Mr Deputy President, the only way that the goods and services tax in this country can increase is as a result of wallpaper Labor governments in the states and territories and at a federal level. The only way the GST can go up in Australia, that 10 per cent GST, is as a result of a, a, a Rudd Labor government being elected. So I just throw out the warning to the Australian people and to those in this chamber that uh, I see the Labor senators are being very cocky. They are sneakily going around strategising on how they can uh, quietly and sneakily bring this uh, GST uh, into, uh, into fruition if they, if they do gain government. And that's, a, that's something that I'm very worried about. I'm very concerned about. And uh, Senator Campbell, I'm, I'm extremely concerned about it. You might deny it. But that's the only way that that can happen under a Rudd Labor government. Sen Senator George when you Campbell. have wallpaper Labor governments all Senator around Barnett, this government. Address, address all your around comments this country. to the chair. Senator George Campbell, you, Mr. you haven't got the call. Mr. Senator Deputy uh, President, I thank you uh, for that uh, and bringing uh, uh, the attention of the Senate to that very important matter. And that's a concern I have. And I'm going to continue to highlight those concerns in the lead up to the election this year, as, as I will. 
uh, with respect to interest rates. This is a very important matter. In fact, uh, 1989, 1989 was when we had 18% uh, interest rates under the Labor government. 18%. Now, for small business in this country of 1.2 million small businesses in my home state of Tasmania, over 34,000 small businesses, this could be crucial. This will be critical. I know what uh, the small businesses, the farmers and their overdrafts, the interest rates they were paying on their overdrafts in and around that time, um, because I was there at the time and I was aware of it and I was concerned for my colleague uh, small businesses. And this is a government that is for small business. That's the Howard Costello team and the, uh, the team that's leading Australia, and that is uh, we are very much pro-small business. Under Labor, they're going to get more red tape, and I can assure the, those in this chamber that the interest rates under our coalition government will always be lower than they are under, under a Labor government. Now, the, the record's there. The, the interest rates are higher under a Labor government. So you've seen the averages, and I refer to the mortgage interest rates are still more than two percentage points lower than their March 1996 levels of 10.5 per cent. And the average new mortgage of $245,000, this reduction in interest rates saves households $449 a month in interest uh, payments. And this is the figure that, uh, that uh, Senator Gavin Marshall was referring to in terms of the increase. Um, over the last 11 years, but he, he did not refer to the average uh, new mortgage and the reduction in interest uh, uh, rate saving households $450 a month in interest payments since March 1996. That's a great result for Australian families. And, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr Howden. In fact, uh, to the Treasurer, Peter Costello, who is the finest Treasurer Australia has ever had, ever had and in fact one of the finest treasurers in the world today. And I think that's recognised uh, very broadly um, in many quarters around the world, not only in the AEC, OECD countries. And uh, that should be acknowledged. In terms of, uh, and to, final, to finally say, I just wanted to say, in terms of the Rudd Labor government and the Rudd opposition at the moment, um, it's a policy black hole. There's a black hole on their website with respect to tax, with respect to transport. It's a policy black hole. It's a Me Tooism response. They're superficial in terms of uh, their policy development. There's no substance to it, and it's a complete contrast to the Howard Costello team. Se Senator, Senator Hurley. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I also wish to take note of the answers made by Minister Scullion um, during question time. Um, it's, uh, the Liberal Party are obviously running very scared at the moment. Uh, Senator Barnett refers to the GST and raises the, the scare tactic, which he assures us he will repeat, about um, Labor, state uh, and federal government raising the GST. I, I really don't think that the Liberal Party should talk too much about um, the GST, because it might remind people that on top of the cost of living pressures that they have, 10 per cent of every bill that they pay goes to GST. 10 per cent of every item apart from fresh food that they pay um, goes to GST. So the Labor Party has no intention of increasing the GST because we understand the kind of cost pressures that households are facing. With, um, uh, with the high prices today, with the increase in price today. And the Labor Party, understanding that, has no intention of adding to those uh, cost of living pressures. The, the pressures that in the past year alone have seen rents rise by 5.2 per cent, education costs up 4.3 per cent, health costs 4.1 per cent and housing costs 3.6 per cent. We know that they are the kind of pressures faced by working families today. This Liberal government is so out of touch with that reality that they go off into flights of fancy about, um, about, uh, all kind, uh, about how families have never been um, better off uh, than they are under this government. Well, we know that that is absolute nonsense, that families are really suffering with the cost of living pressures, cost, suffering with housing pressures, struggling to make ends meet. Now, 
the minister responds with uh, talk about um, uh, reduced um, unemployment levels under this government. And it is true that unemployment uh, levels have been reduced. What is also true is during the, this current term of government, the government introduced work choices, which makes um, those jobs far more precarious than they have ever been. Work choices has, um, has made overtime rates a much more precarious proposition, have made um, uh, casual work um, much more common, have, forced, have, have the prospect of forcing wages down um, for those workers so that they can't afford to, live, to, to meet those, um, those kind of increases in costs that we were talking about. And far from allowing a, a job allowing people these days to buy houses, what it means is that they are, they are unable to, to, uh, to be certain that their wage will meet um, those increased mortgage payments. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the government uh, challenges us to produce policies in response to that. Well, um, uh, Mr Kevin Rudd, uh, the leader of the Labor Party, has produced uh, policies in response to that. To that. He, has, um, he has said he would appoint a petrol commissioner to monitor and investigate petrol price gouging and collusion. Uh, he, has, uh, he, would, he has said he would direct the ACC to monitor grocery prices and publish a periodic survey of price movements. He has said he would instigate a public inquiry into grocery prices to get a better understanding of what is driving up prices. And he will expand Labor's price watch to survey supermarket prices and publish them on a website. So it, this is the Labor Party saying that they understand the pressures that, um, that uh, families are face, facing. They also understand housing pressures. And rather than whinge um, about the states not responding, they've done something about it. And um, Mr Rudd at the Housing um, Forum and later uh, in Adelaide um, at the press club lunch that I attended produced policies in response to that. He has talked about a national affordable housing agreement in conjunction with the state government. He has talked about Labor's affordable affordability fund for housing, which would look at infrastructure and reduce the amount uh, that it costs to buy land and to pr produce housing around Australia, a fund that will help up to 50,000 families buying their first home. So, uh, the Labor Party is looking at practical measures to help families. This government is so out of touch that it's lost, um, lost any contact with the kind of reality that uh, the Senator members Hurley, of the Labor Party understand has very expired. well. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Sherry be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. All right. Um, we move on to petitions. Or no, petitions. Clerk. Petitions have been lodged in accordance with the list circulated to the senators. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansa. Are there any notices of motion? Any no Senator Fielding. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to create a culture of responsible drinking and to facilitate a reduction in the alcohol toll resulting from excessive alcohol consumption and for related purposes, the short title known as Alcohol Toll Reduction Bill 2007. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. The Minister for Ageing, the Hon. Chris Pine MP, has amended the principles to meet the committee's concerns. So therefore, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Regulations and Ordinances, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall withdraw business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in my name for the next day of sitting, the disallowance of the Investigation Principles 2007 made under subsection 96.1.1 of the Aged Care Act 1997. Mr Deputy President, I seek leave to incorporate in Hansard the Committee's correspondence on this instrument. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Any further notices? Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that a the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Australian Crime Commission Act 2002 and for related purposes, Australian Crime Commission Amendment Bill 2007, and b 
the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the bill, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. I table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during this period of sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Further notices of motion? Any further notices of motion? If not, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator George Campbell. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the leave of absence for a senator. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator George Campbell. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Forshaw for the period of 17 September 2007 to 6 December 2007 inclusive on account of absence overseas on parliamentary business. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Parry. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Kemp from the 17th of September 2007 to the end of 2007 sittings on the account of government business overseas and Senator Troth from the 17th of September to the 21st of September 2007 for personal reasons. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ronaldson. Thank you, Mr. Senator Parry. Um, any further postponement or rearrangement of the business? If not, the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notice number one to the 20th of September, business of the Senate notice number two to the 19th of September, and general business notice number 897 to the 18th of September. No further postponement or rearrangement of the business. If not, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll deal with 903 first. Senator Faulkner. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President. Um, I uh, ask Mr Deputy President that General Business of Notice of Motion number 903, proposing an order of continuing effect relating to the unauthorised disclosure of committee uh, proceedings be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I move General Business uh, uh, notice of motion number 903. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the motion 902, standing in my name, um, calling for the guns proposed pulp mill to be subject to all environmental considerations being fully satisfied be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Bob Brown. I thank the Senate and move that motion. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Bob Brown be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. Point Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes. Senator Parry, teller for the noes. Senator Heffern, you can't move during a uh, division. We'll resume your seat, please. Order. There being seven ayes, 41 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Abetz. Mr Deputy President, I seek leave to make a brief statement in relation to the vote. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Abetz. I thank the Senate. The government opposes the motion put, opposed the motion put forward by Senator Brown. The Australian government's consideration and approval of the pulp mill at Bell Bay can only extend to the environmental issues under the Australian government's jurisdiction through the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1997. Senator Bob Brown. The Prime Minister last week. Uh, Senator Bob Brown, are you seeking leave? I'm seeking leave, yes. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Bob Brown. The Prime Minister, no less, last week made it clear that the government's policy was that the Guns Limited pulp mill should be subject to all environmental considerations being fully satisfied. We've just had the government vote against the Prime Minister's own reference uh, on the pulp mill. So the, qu the question is, who is in control here? Is it Prime Minister Howard or is it uh, the, the government vote we've just seen? Totally contradictory. Within a week, the, go the government senators have voted against the Prime Minister's own uh, reference on the, on the pulp mill. So, uh, we should get this sorted out. Has the Tasmanian Liberal Party got a different point of view to the Prime Minister? It would seem so. Order, order, Senator Bob Brown. Point of order, Senator Parry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, we gave leave for a short statement relating to the vote. Uh, this is going to other other areas. Thank you. No point of order, S S Senator Bob Brown. No, the point of, of, that uh, Senator Parry was trying to make is how embarrassing this is for the for the Liberal Party including, uh, in particular, the Tasmanian Liberal Party. Your Prime Minister says that there will be environmental uh, considerations being fully satisfied before this pulp mill will go ahead. The Greens endorse that, come in here and say, well, let's have that put to the test, and the government members vote it down. So it's time you got your homework done. It's time you, you rejoined solidarity with Prime Minister Howard on this. And, and, and 
fully satisfy the environmental considerations outlined by the Prime Minister. A split in the Liberal Party. It doesn't know what it's doing, uh, but uh, the uh, Senator Betts perhaps should go and see the Prime Minister and explain how he got it so wrong in the Senate chamber over the pulp mill today. Order. 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 The uh, President has received the following letter from Senator Seward. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need to act to close the gap to achieve health quality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within a generation. Yours sincerely, Senator Rachel Seward, Australian Green Senator for Western Australia. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator, Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Deputy President. I'm putting the urgency today to the Senate that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need to act to close the gap to achieve health equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within a generation. Tomorrow is, in fact, National Close the Gap Day, a day where Australians across the nation will come together at a range of events and forums to show their support for closing the 17-year life expectancy gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and other Australians. They are calling for all Australian governments to take action to achieve health equality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders within 25 years through increasing the annual Indigenous health funding by $450 million to enable equal access for Aboriginal people to health services, to increasing Indigenous control and participation in the delivery of health services, and to addressing critical social issues such as housing, education and self-determination, which contribute to the Indigenous health crisis. The gap in life expectancy and health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is an international embarrassment. We are the only first world country that has failed to make progress on the health and life expectancy of our first peoples. In fact, most developing or so-called third world nations have made better progress with population health despite the chronic hardships they face. On average, a person from Bangladesh, for example, can now expect to live for 10 years longer than an Indigenous Australian. As our Social Justice Commissioner Tom Carmer pointed out at the release of his 2006 Social Justice Report, the fact that a wealthy country like Australia cannot fix a health crisis that affects only 3 per cent of our citizens is simply not credible. The greatest threat to Indigenous Australians is disease, and many of these diseases they face are easily preventable and have long since been eradicated from our non-Indigenous population. Australia has the dubious distinction of being the only developed country that has not yet eradicated trachoma. Other First World nations have, within the last decade or two, managed to significantly reduce the gap for their First Peoples. Canada, New Zealand and the US have all reduced their life expectancy gaps down to between five to eight years, as opposed to our outrageous 17 years. And infant mortality rates for Indigenous Australians are now almost twice as high as those in New Zealand and the US. Indigenous babies in Australia are two and a half times, two and a half times more likely to die before the age of one than their non-Indigenous counterparts. And if they are in the NT or WA, then they are three times more likely. They are also twice as likely to have low birth weight, which places additional stress on their development and makes them more vulnerable to the poor health in later life. The WA Aboriginal Child Health Survey reported very high rates of reoccurring ear infections, reoccurring chest infections, reoccurring skin infections and reoccurring gastrointestinal infection in Aboriginal kids in the West a comprehensive study that is likely to reflect similarly high rates across um, a comprehensive study would we believe likely to reflect similar high rates across the country recent re research 
into the rates of ear infections in the NT carried out by the Menzies School of Health Research showed that 80 to 90 per cent of Aboriginal children have persistent ear infections within the first three years of their lives. Hearing, hearing problems as a result are of easily prevented and treated ear infections, especially Otis media, are a major factor in poor educational outcomes for Aboriginal kids who simply can't hear or understand what the teacher is saying. Now let me touch for a brief minute on the Northern Territory intervention, which the government, I have no doubt, will come in here and argue that it's their contribution to closing the gap. Well, let's have a look at some of the, some of the material that came out just today. Today we had a leaked briefing from the Aboriginal Medical Service Alliance of the NT on crikey that suggests that the medical checks are failing to reach more than 10 per cent of the at-risk population. They claim that the health check component of the intervention is largely incompetent, probably unethical, underfunded and absolutely ignores the long term. They claim that they are in breach of the National Health and Medical Research Guidelines, Medicare Guidelines and the Health Screening Guidelines issued by the, Australian, sorry, the Royal Australian College of General Practice. It is estimated that, as a consequence of the lack of experience and training of the medical task force in Aboriginal child health, they have a misdiagnosis rate of about 50 per cent below known disease and illness rates. And the rate of diagnosis of ear infections is a whopping 77 per cent below that would be expected on the basis of expert research. Diagnosis of otitis media, middle ear infections where kids have fluid behind their eardrums and hence experience significant hearing loss is particularly difficult, especially if you are not experienced with working with young children, let alone with Aboriginal children. However, if you are going into communities where there are known to be high rates of this disease, surely you would ensure that you knew what you were looking for and would be, and would be taking along the right equipment. However, this latest report from the NT found that only 10 per cent of children referred to the ENT surgeon um, that referred to the surgeon that it has in fact not been done. The level of hype around the NT intervention raises some serious ethical issues because of the manner in which it is raising false expectations within the community without having in place the resources to follow it up. This is hype, it is not actually dealing with the issue. So, can you please remember those facts when you hear the government come in here to argue that they are doing something about closing the gap because we've got this wonderful medical task force in the NT? Well, now we're starting to hear on the ground what's really happening. A recent report by the World Health Organisation found that the health of Aboriginal Australians is lagging a century behind the rest of the population. P sorry, per capita access to primary health care remains 40 per cent of that enjoyed by other Australians. Half of the Aboriginal population over the age of 15 already show signs of chronic disease, despite the fact that they are three times as sick as other Australians. Their access to primary health care, as measured by the Medical Benefits Scheme and the, and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, is only 40 per cent of the general population. That is, despite claims by the government that they are spending a large amount of money on Indigenous health, for every $1 spent through the PBS and, M and, and MBS on a non-Aboriginal Australian, only 40 per cent, only 40 cents is spent on an Aboriginal Australian. The work done by Access Economics for the AMA estimates that an additional $460 million per year is needed simply to bridge the existing gap between the health needs of Indigenous Australians and the current spending. I seek leave at this point to table a report by Nacho and Oxfam titled Close the Gap Solutions to Indigenous um, Health Crisis Facing Australia. I have, in fact, um, contacted all WHIPs about this and I understand that um, leave has been granted. The Australian Greens believe that this report is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator the Australian Gr Greens believe this report provides us with a strong basis on which to proceed. I commend this report to the Chamber and urge all parties to take on board its recommendations that relate to access to primary health care, the number of health practitioners working within the, within the Aboriginal Health Service, responsiveness of mainstream services, greater targeting of maternal and child health, increased funding and support, and setting, actually, actually setting national targets and benchmarks towards achieving healthy health equity for Aboriginal Australians. The AMA put out a very good report in May that provided a long list of successful Indigenous health programs. We recently helped co-host an exhibition of photos in Parliament House by Oxfam, which doc documented some of the successes in Aboriginal health. The big point, that the positive outcomes from all the, the big point is that the positive outcomes of these successful initiatives point to the fact that this is not an intractable problem. 
It is not a case, a case of not knowing what to do, but simply a matter of scale. The reach of these programs and the level of resources and infrastructure behind them is simply inadequate given the extent of the problem and the levels of chronic illness that need to be tackled. We, what we need is a commitment, pure and simple, to better primary health care on the basis of need. More resources that tackle the issues are essential. We need to put more effort into tackling the social determinants of poor health as well so that we can reduce the level of chronic disease and the massive demands that chronically ill people place on our medical health system. We need to tackle this through prevention, through healthier living, through better homes, through better environments in which people live in, and also ensure that people have a sense of control over their lives. We need to set ourselves clear targets, targets that we can measure and be accountable for our progress against. And that's why I also believe that the report and the recommendations put forward by Tom Karma, our Social Justice Commissioner, are essential in helping us meet the target of closing the 17-year age gap in life expectancy between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. Close the gap is absolutely essential within the next generation. People aren't saying this can be done overnight. What's being said is we need to do it within a generation and there's a clear plan for doing that. We urge, urge, beg, in fact, the government to target the resources that are needed to address these issues. As I said, we know we can do these successful programs. There are successful programs on the ground. What we need is a commitment to start addressing them properly and not taking the funding away from groups Order. when Senator work Seward, isn't done. Thank you for your contribution. Senator Conference. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, as uh, one of the uh, uh, co-sponsors of the uh, Close the Gap exhibition that was held recently, uh, showing uh, the positive outcomes that have been achieved uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years, I was um, I'm very pleased to take part in this debate and to um, indicate that although um, I appreciate and, and share with Senator Seward an understanding of the enormity of the task facing us as a community, uh, I don't for one instant um, want to downplay um, the extent of progress uh, in this area and the way in which, uh, as Australians, we have, I think, in a very real way in recent years come to grapple with this issue in a much more tangible and a much more effective way than has been the case in the past. And I will spend some time in my remarks today um, talking about um, the progress that has been made in dealing with the significant disadvantage of Aboriginal Australians with respect to health. The first thing to put on the record, of course, is that the challenge in closing the gap between uh, the standards of health uh, of Aboriginal Australians and other Australians is uh, a truly enormous one. Health outcomes for uh, Aboriginal Australians uh, are frankly unacceptable. They are far behind those of other Australians uh, and it remains a major national challenge to close uh, the difference between those two sets of statistics. For example, um, in 2003, babies born to Indigenous women on average uh, weighed 219 grams less than those born to non-Indigenous women. Babies born to Indigenous women were more than twice as likely to be of low birth weight, less than two and a half kilos, uh, than were those born to non-Indigenous women. Uh, indigenous uh, babies are more likely to die in their first year than non-Indigenous babies. For example, in 2002 to 2004, the infant mortality rate for Indigenous babies was highest in the Northern Territory. Uh, 15 babies died out of 1,000 births. And in Western Australia, 14 died out of 1,000 births. Uh, the rate for uh, the total Australian population is only five deaths per 1,000 births. And it's possible to quote a very large number of areas where those sorts of depressing statistics uh, are replicated uh, in areas like cardiovascular disease, um, in the incidence of cancer, um, in uh, the incidence of diabetes um, and chronic kidney disease and so forth. Um, and uh, it won't be difficult for anyone in this debate to quote a great, at great length such statistics which are being very carefully compiled by a variety of um, health bodies uh, in this country. Um, Australia needs to confront uh, those statistics with great uh, energy and commitment, uh, with the same kind of energy and commitment that would behove any major uh, national challenge with these dimensions. Uh, our response has to be well informed, of course, by the life experience uh, of Aboriginal people uh, and the cultural environment in which those uh, people live. Um, we must accept, of course, that the answers to these problems will be extremely expensive. 
Uh, we must also accept uh, that the solutions go beyond simply putting in place uh, a variety of services which are either not there at the moment or are there at grossly inadequate levels. Um, we must act uh, in knowledge of the background uh, of the failings uh, of um, existing services, a background which is very complex and needs to be well understood. Issues like uh, the remote locations where many Indigenous Australians live, the lack of suitable uh, infrastructure for other social services like housing and education, uh, which are very much part of the total picture uh, with respect to Indigenous Australians, the low literacy levels that Australians, Indigenous Australians experience, the lack of a pattern uh, over several generations of interaction with health services and lifestyle issues uh, such as high levels of alcohol and substance abuse. Most importantly, of course, uh, in examining uh, the solutions to these problems, we have to accept that there have been many generations of dispossession and disadvantage, which has damaged severely the capacity of Aboriginal families to address endemic health problems in their communities. But can I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is vital for an informed and a fair debate on this subject that we present a balanced view uh, of, of the health issues facing Indigenous Australians and an approach uh, which emphasises only uh, the distance that we as a nation have yet to go and does not note uh, and record the progress that we have made on these subjects. Uh, runs the risk uh, of persuading many people that the problem is indeed insoluble, because the endless trotting out of these statistics uh, about uh, uh, poor results in Aboriginal health uh, will tend to lead people to the conclusion that we simply can't win. We can sustain better outcomes, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, and indeed the truth is that we have done just that in a number of key areas in recent years. Senator Seawitt said that um, uh, we are making no progress, and I think that that, with great respect, is untrue. The uh, available information uh, about uh, health outcomes for Indigenous people, while still uh, far from acceptable, does point to some real progress in a number of key areas. Um, uh, the all-cause uh, Indigenous mortality rate, for example, in the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia, where so, such a large proportion of our Indigenous community lives, has decreased, decreased by 16 per cent since 1991 and 2003. I mentioned the uh, Indigenous infant mortality rate, again an unacceptably high rate of infant mortality, but that same rate has declined by 44 per cent um, over that period 1991 to 2003. And with great respect to, um, to suggest that because uh, that rate of um, um, uh, infant mortality, or I think it was in fact the, the, the life expectancy of, in, of Indigenous Australians was lower than it was for people in Bangladesh, with great respect does not establish the proposition that we are therefore not making any progress against um, that benchmark. Uh, in fact, we are improving the position um, of many Indigenous people, and in many respects we're able to point to ways in which all Aboriginal people have had better outcomes in a variety of areas. Death caused by circulatory disease declined at a faster rate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than for other Australians, and the gap between outcomes for them and for the rest of us have narrowed. New figures from the Menzies School of Health Research shows a marked improvement in the life expectancy of Indigenous people born in the Northern Territory. The report released uh, in April compares figures from the 1960s with data collected in 2004. And that study shows uh, some very interesting things with respect to uh, the life expectancy in the Northern Territory of men and women. Uh, life expectancy of women in that period, of, of men in that period, I should say, has increased by eight years, from 52 years of age to 60 years of age. Now, I don't, accept, I don't, I don't de uh, deny for one instant that 60 years of age compared with other Australians is still completely unacceptable, but it is real progress. It is real progress, and we should note that in a balanced debate about these issues. The increase in life expectancy of women, uh, Indigenous women in the Northern Territory, has increased even more dramatically. 
uh, from um, 54 years to 68 years. Now, that is important to note in a debate like this. Mr Acting Deputy President, um, part of the reason for that has been a very substantial additional investment, uh, particularly in the last few years, by the Australian government. In fact, um, there has been a real increase on in spending uh, on Indigenous health of 210 per cent uh, since the 1996-97 financial year. At that time, we were spending uh, federally $110 million uh, on Indigenous health. Today, we're spending $440 million each year on Indigenous health. But I might say that even that benchmark um, is being uh, greatly overshadowed by very significant new announcements with respect to, um, to health spending in this area. New funding uh, was announced in the most recent budget of $112.5 million over four years for three new measures to increase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to primary health care, to improve child and maternal health outcomes and to improve the quality of Indigenous health services through accreditation mechanisms and support. In the last four budgets, um, other processes such as uh, uh, the budget itself and COAG and the Intergovernmental Summit on Violence and Child Abuse in Indigenous Communities has committed over $470 million to improve Indigenous Australians' health. Those are real benchmarks of progress. And although I accept that inputs are not the same as outcomes, it's very important that when we talk about these things, we look at the ways in which um, these issues have changed over the last few years. It is not true to say, Senator Seward, that we are going backwards. It is not true to say that we are making no progress. Order. Thank you, Senator Humphreys. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The debate this afternoon is a positive one, and I think it's one that we can share. When Oxfam and the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, which is a daunting title, um, released a discussion paper which Senator Seaward has sought to have tabled this afternoon in April 2007, earlier this year, um, the front page I think is one that we can look together and see a benchmark from which we can move forward. Apart from the stunningly beautiful photograph, and Oxfam are renowned for their ability to get the message across in photographs, which I think tells people's stories sometimes much better than no matter how effectively we can debate in this place. But apart from the stunningly beautiful photograph from Mornington Island in Queensland, there is a statement from Professor Mick Dodson, which I will quote, and I'm sure people will continue to do this, but it's one that I live with because I think it's one that we can hold on to as we continue to debate. And I quote, the statistics of infant and perinatal mortality are our babies and children who die in our arms. The statistics of shortened life expectancy are our mothers and fathers, uncles, aunties and elders who live diminished lives and die before their gifts of knowledge and experience are passed on. We die silently under these statistics. Now that quote is an important one for us to hear, but it's not negative. It's actually a statement that gives us the challenge which we are expected to take forward. The Close the Gap campaign, which has been so effective across our country in engaging people in the community in effectively considering what are the issues that are facing Aboriginal and Islander people in our community. That campaign looks at our history because, as Senator Humphreys has said, you cannot just make a simplistic statement about what should happen. What we should do is understand the complexities of what has happened. And it is an important year to do that because we have the opportunity now of looking at the, the consideration of the impact of 40 years since the referendum actually gave Indigenous people the right to vote in this country. Um, secondly, we can also look at the movement forward of taking a snapshot of what has gone before, facing together the negatives that we have heard, but not being overwhelmed by those negatives. If we do that, we won't move forward. The statistics are there, and as, as Professor Dodson said, the statistics that roll clearly off people's tongues about um, the life expectancy of people, the unacceptable uh, infant mortality and also just the, the way of life of so many people in our community, those statistics roll off the tongue and uh, we can have inordinate debates, as we've done with the Productivity Commission, which is a huge volume of statistics, most of which are negative. But what we can do is learn from them. We have the ability 
to learn from those stats. And one of the really effective things about the Close the Gap campaign is what has been done has there has been research of processes that have worked. And we can learn from those. It's not just extra funding. There must be greater funding. And Senator Humphreys has pointed out the growth in funding over the last couple of years. But it's not enough by itself. When you have Mick Dodson's words in your mind, when we hear what those stats mean to Indigenous people, they are their families. They are the people that mean most to them. You just can't quote statistics. What you have to do is concentrate on what can be done to address the problems. The problems are known. We've had these debates in this place before. The issues that Senator Seaworth has outlined, we know there have been so many reports that have been tabled in this place that have been tabled as far as the United Nations, talking about issues of disadvantage for Indigenous populations, not just in Australia. And that's come out in the recent debates about the International Declaration of Indigenous Peoples. The issues that are being uh, confronting Indigenous peoples are not peculiar to our country. But what we have to address is that the issues for Indigenous people in our country have been bad. They, we have an opportunity, this generation, to put in place steps forward that, as the Close the Gap campaign is asking us to do, within a generation, a time frame of 25 years, and most of us would be, I think, positively thinking, Mr Deputy President, that we'd be around for those 25 years, so that at the end of that time we'll be able to take another snapshot and be able to objectively assess whether the things that have been put in place in 2007 effectively, objectively and cooperatively, whether those issues that have been put in place, what advances have been made. So that at the end of that 25 years, which is the process around the Oxfam Close the Gap claim, we will be able to see whether the issues of mortality rates, whether the issues of longevity, whether the issues of education, whether the issues of housing, all those that we know about, what advances have been made. And it is our hope and it is our challenge that we will be able to say in 25 years' time, these plans have worked. Maybe we will not have solved all the problems, and in fact there has never been any act which has solved all the problems. But in fact, in 25 years' time, the people who were sitting in this place at that time should be able to say that in 2007, the arrangements that were agreed cooperatively, as the Oxfam report says, amongst all levels of government, engaging all the people who are citizens of this country, those measures have made a genuine difference, because that's what the challenge is, to make a difference. Rather than concentrating on the past and what hasn't worked, acknowledging the past, not pretending that it didn't happen because way too often people become too defensive and they try and come up with excuses about what happened, about how much money was spent, about where it could have been misspent, concentrating on those things instead of doing what Oxfam has asked us to do, to look at workforce, to look at improved access to education, to look at culturally appropriate primary health care, to acknowledge what is happening now with the knowledge that we have, because the Product Productivity Commission report of two years ago, I think, left us in no doubt about what the state of our nation is now. There is no grey in this area. We have the statistics that have, been, that have been gathered and will need to be continued to be gathered. But when we're looking at those stats, at those numbers, when we're groping to come up with ways to ensure that the um, life expectancy is improved, when we're looking at ensuring that maternal and, and child health statistics are improved, I think it does us um, good service to continue to have a look, as Professor Dodson said, to see the people who are those statistics. Somehow it makes it a stronger argument when you're looking at those issues as being people and being family members. One of the encouraging things about the whole discussion around Close the Gap has been the way that there has been community engagement. And things like the photographic exhibition, which Senator Humphreys referred to in his contribution, I think um, has a really valuable role to play in ensuring that we see what does work. And no one who's been able to have a look at that photographic expectation and see those glorious positive photographs of people who are part of our community now and be able to see what is going to be 
in 25 years, if we go back down and have photographs of those same families to ensure that they are still here and to be able to map the wonderful little boy who's on the front of Closing the Gap to see where he is in 25 years' time, because that is the challenge. There is an understanding that the work that we're doing, the focused funding, the funding that is not linked to punishment, because my concern about what's happening at the moment in the Northern Territory is that any value that is being achieved by the influx of medical Medical help by the influx of people involved in the process is linked to a sense of punishment. And that is not the expectation of close the gap. It is not people coming in from outside working on the community. We're well beyond that. And the expectation of close the gap is working with community to achieve outcomes. When that can be achieved, then the, uh, the people who gather together and say that we are um, part of a, a wider Australia, that all the expectations that any one of us can have should be available to everyone, and in particular in this campaign for Aboriginal and Islander people, no matter where they live. Because one of the things that I think that is most um, damning over the last couple of months is there seems to have been a focus almost exclusively on the Northern Territory. Close the Gap is not a campaign for people who live in the Northern Territory. Close the Gap is a campaign for Aboriginal and Islander people across the whole country, no matter where they live. And that's a challenge for us. And for Mr Acting Deputy President, I think in terms of positives, I think if we can hold on to the work that's being achieved at the moment by the Mums and Babies program in Townsville, that is exactly the kind of program that does work. It has been celebrated in Close the Gap. I think if we can work together in that way, in 25 years' time, we'll be able to show success and not continued concern about the challenges that we've missed. Thank you, Senator, Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to join this debate uh, and welcome um, Senator Seward's motion and the um, Oxfam Closing the Gap report. But I just want to talk about two things. Um, on Wednesday last week, uh, several parliamentarians went to a dinner which was put on by Vision Australia, I think was the name. And one of the presenters at that dinner was a Dr C uh, Katrina Roper from the Department of Health and Community Services in the Northern Territory. And she's part of the National Trachoma Surveillance Unit in the NT. And she talked about the, the impact on Aboriginal communities of trachoma. Now, I remind um, honourable senators here today that trachoma doesn't exist in any other developed country around the world. Um, but it does in very large numbers in our Aboriginal communities. And the most shocking aspect of, uh, of this is that it can be treated, and it can be treated relatively easily. There's an antibiotic which, if administered in, uh, in, in good time, that is when children get it, and they do all the time, uh, when children get trachoma, um, uh, the bacteria, uh, an anti um, um, uh, uh, what did I call it? <laughs> antibiotic, thank you. An antibiotic uh, can solve the problem. And for just $22 million, we could eliminate through, the, through every Aboriginal community the incidence of trachoma. Now, I, I remind um, the Senate that trachoma uh, makes people blind in the end, that the, uh, the eyelid becomes so deformed it turns inward, and uh, the action of the eye eventually destroys the eyeball so that this is a hugely debilitating condition. Um, and it's hard to believe that in this day and age, when we know that there, there is a way of, um, of curing this problem, uh, as I say, it can't be cured if you don't get it, in, get it early, uh, but we know that there's a way forward on this issue, but we're not even taking that minimal step of providing antibiotics to those um, at risk. Uh, it, can be, it can be administered as a preventive measure, and it has the added benefit of uh, clearing up a whole lot of other infections as well within Aboriginal communities. Um, the, other, the other that I often cite, a condition which is, also, which is almost as debilitating, is scabies. And again, it's a condition which occurs in no other developed country around the world, but it affects every Aboriginal community. Uh, I go into schools when we travel around as a, as a committee usually and ask what the incidence of uh, scabies is in schools, and very often the answer is 80 per cent. Now, uh, what, what, the, what it means to have scabies is a mite that gets under the skin and is so itchy that you want to tear your flesh off, 
Uh, what, what happens over time with scabies is that it affects all the major organs in the body, and it is a major factor in why it is that uh, Aboriginal people don't live as long as non-Indigenous people. And it too can be fixed. Uh, there is a simple ointment that can be applied to people who have scabies. Uh, in one wonderful school that we went to uh, some time ago at Elko Island, I asked this question of the principal and he said, we, ha we only have about 5 per cent scabies. Uh, and the kids were very bright and shiny and black hair and black skin, looked fantastic. Uh, and he said, they hold it at bay by closing the school down every term for one day. And with the clinic, they go into people's homes, they, uh, they administer the ointment, they clean up um, dogs, they, uh, they assist communities generally to, uh, to keep scabies uh, away. And this is utterly crucial. If we want children to learn in schools, then they've got to be free of scabies. And it's appalling that 80 per cent of them are not in so many communities. Uh, now, we all know that, uh, that if there was better housing, if there was uh, better sanitation, if kids washed their faces and their eyes so that they were less likely to get trachoma, uh, if there were better jobs, if there was a better environment in many of these places, better nutrition, uh, all of those, uh, and better health services generally, then our Aboriginal community would not have such an appalling health record and uh, shorter life expectancy. But um, those two examples that I've, gi I've given could be done without fixing all those things. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't be fixed, but they are possible to do, and it is disgraceful that this government, after 10 years, has not done so. And I might say the government before it, because governments have neglected Aboriginal health. This is not something that's happened since 1996. It's been, uh, it's been an appalling record that governments in this country have overseen. Uh, they pay lip service to doing better in Aboriginal communities, but even the simple solutions to some of these debilitating problems are not adopted. Order. Thank you, Senator Arison. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I don't think anybody in this uh, Senate would deny that there is more to do to improve Indigenous health and to reduce the difference in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. But closing the gap won't be achieved by primary health intervention alone. There are a raft of other policies which impact on the health of our first Australians. But let me just remind people about uh, the appalling record that we inherited from the Labor government in 1996, when we had 53 per cent of all of our children only vaccinated. Now, that was an appalling situation, down around third world countries' levels of vaccination. And it wasn't uh, just white Australians, but Indigenous Australians, and I'd bet, if I were a betting woman, that the Indigenous Australians record would, would, be, would have been higher, in terms, lower, sorry, in terms of, of coverage of, in, of vaccination. I didn't have time to find that figure. But through an innovative social policy, not a health policy, through an innovative social policy, Michael Waldridge um, brought around an increase in, in vaccination to over, a rate of over 90 per cent. And there's been very little measles infection in Australia, and children were dying of me from measles before that. Uh, and uh, that measles infection has decreased in both the indigenous and the general population. And the successful control of, of measles and other vaccine-preventable diseases such as diphtheria, polio, rubella, and tetanus underlined the successful importance of universal vaccination programs for indigenous health. And in addition, we had a program. For, before we were able to vaccinate all children against pneumococcal disease, we had indigenous young people, thank you, indigenous young people um, being vaccinated against pneumococcal disease because they were most at risk. Measure after measure indicates an improvement in indigenous health since the change of federal government in 1996. In the four years 2000 to 2004, which is the most recent figures we've got, full-time estimated doctor, doctors employed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait health care services rose by 50 per cent. Senator Moore was talking about about uh, workforce. Full-time estimated nurses, there was a 53 per cent increase in that four-year period. And the number of Indigenous health care workers increased by 19 per cent, and I would predict that uh, we'll see similar, similar increases uh, in, the next four, in that four years, 2004 to 2008. Well, another measure that uh, Mr Waldridge brought in, uh, Dr Waldridge brought in, was a rural clinical schools program, the University Schools of Rural Health. It takes a long time for those to have an effect. And that will be one of his lasting legacies, one of the lasting legacies of, uh, of the Howard government will be that now young people, young Indigenous people are being trained in Broome or Wagga or Traralgon 
and they uh, spend more time in their own communities, more time practicing their skills in, in remote communities, that would never have happened without that innovation of those rural clinical schools programs and the University Schools of Rural Health. Between 1999 and 2005, the proportion of ATSI primary health care services providing specific programs increased. And I'll give you some figures. Antenatal maternal programs went from 58 per cent to 70 per cent of services. Women's health programs from 73 per cent to 87 per cent of services. Men's health programs 55 per cent to 74 per cent of services. And eye screening 57 to 70 per cent of services. And uh, specifically targeted maternal and child health programs have produced declines in preterm uh, pre births from 16.7 per cent to 8.7 per cent, which is now comparable with the general population, and a decrease in infant mortality. Now, Senator Moore mentioned the Townsville uh, Mums and Bubs program. I went up to visit that when I was health minister, and uh, they were running it on a shoestring out of a garage, uh, part of the, as they jokingly call it, the Taj Mahal, the Townsville and Aboriginal Islander Health Service. And uh, they said to me, "Can you fund this minister?" Well, really, it's a responsibility of the Queensland government. It was an infant welfare program, but you know what happens now? It's funded through the Commonwealth because. We managed to uh, in, in, in increase the funding to the Townsville, uh, the, uh, Townsville Indigenous Health Service. So that program go. You go in there and you see these babies who are thriving, absolutely thriving. The mums feel confident about their parenting, and the children are thriving. A perfect example, but really something that the state should have done something about. Now, in, uh, the Aboriginal people have had increased access to the PBS and to the MBS, and there have been specific. Uh, health checks have been introduced for uh, children and for adults, and the recent Northern Territory emergency response will have a significant impact on the health of Indigenous people, in, and in particular in children. Now, it will also have an impact on health in the fact that we will have more police presence. One of the things that nurses say, and I think Senator Adams will probably speak about this, is that they're subjected to terrible violence when they go out. There might be a, a, a nurse in, a, in an indigen remote Indigenous community, and they're subjected to violence. That discourages and dissuades nurses from being there, and then would have a negative impact on health. So to have the states coming up to the plate, and Western Australia, as Senator Moore said, that we've only focused on Northern Territory because that's where we've got the power to intervene. The Northern Territory should be looking at more police to reduce that threat to nurses. As I said, primary health intervention is not the only way to impact on Indigenous health. Uh, there are other policies that, which have a positive impact on health. Uh, if you look at uh, the No Pool, No School program in Indigenous communities, school attendance goes up, ear infections and scabies, which uh, Senator Allison didn't have time to mention, scabies has an enormous impact on the health of adults. Uh, as children grow up and they become adults, they have kidney disease as a result of it. Pool has an effect on that. What happened in Wadair? We had a pool. We had a no school, no pool program. The kids turn up to school. There aren't enough seats for them, not enough teachers for them. If that had happened in South Auburn, or happened in Dandenong, or happened in, in uh, Lilyfield, or somewhere else in Sydney, or somewhere in Melbourne, there would have been an outcry. But no, the Northern Territory government gets away with it because they haven't got enough places, not enough teachers to actually uh, look after those children when they turn up. Another example of a non uh, an indirect uh, effect of a policy which isn't a, as, isn't a primary care policy. Senator, you'll have your chance in a moment. Cape York Financial Information Management Program has seen school attendance go up, an educational outcome, has seen domestic violence go down, a social and health outcome, and better nutrition, a health outcome. And the recently announced community um, stores pr uh, uh, policy by Minister Bruff which relates to the operation of community stores in the Northern Territory, although, again, not a direct health intervention, will no doubt have an impact on health. And, uh, what we're doing is setting up a licensing system for community stores in the Northern Territory. Stores that are licensed will be able to participate in the income management arrangements. Licenses will be issued to community stores that are able to participate in the requirements of the income management scheme, have a reasonable quality, quantity and range of groceries and consumer items, including healthy food and drink, available and promoted at the store, and can demonstrate sound financial structures, retail practices and governance. Now, I've been to remote communities, both in my two roles as uh, Minister for Health and Minister for Family and Community Services, and it's quite interesting to see the significant differences. Some stores are managed well, and some of them managed by Indigenous people, who really have got a motive to manage them well, managed in, in the sense that they actually run cooking classes, 
They prepare meals for people to come and take away. They actually prepare school meals for the children and they're prepaid. And what you see in those communities is a significant change in their health. Other measures that need to be taken into account, and you see considerable differences across Order. communities. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Crossan. Yes, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise uh, this afternoon to actually speak on this uh, matter of public importance uh, as well. Uh, those in this place will remember, prior to the APEC summit in Sydney, the Anderson Wild Report, of course, uh, titled Little Children Are Sacred, commissioned by the Northern Territory Government, was widely reported on the uh, national media. We all know now, of course, that uh, that report was uh, as, a, as an instigation of the uh, Northern Territory uh, Government into the situation with children in Indigenous uh, communities. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that since APEC, Indigenous issues have uh, fallen off the national media's radar. However, Indigenous issues are, as always, of critical importance to not only myself but uh, the Labor Party. Uh, not a year goes by in this job where we don't see some sort of report into uh, the gap between uh, Indigenous health outcomes and life expectancy and those of non-Indigenous people. We get it from the Australian Medical Association when they hand down their report card. We get it from uh, national Aboriginal community health controlled organisations and in the Northern Territory we have some of the most outstanding Aboriginal community controlled organisations that you will actually come across in this country. And now, of course, we have the report from uh, Oxfam. The situation of our Indigenous peoples continues to be, to be extremely dire. Uh, NACHO, which is the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation and Oxfam Australia, uh, have launched a report uh, called Close the Gap. It's a policy briefing paper uh, and, of course, it states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders continue to die nearly 20 years younger than non-Indigenous Australians. Uh, and I would have to say, from a personal point of view, in the last couple of months, I've attended a number of uh, funerals for Indigenous people uh, who have died between the ages of 37 and 53 from diseases which would normally strike down non-Indigenous people who are at least 20 years older than, than those Indigenous people. So the, the facts are there and the, uh, the real-life experiences are there for us to, uh, to witness and participate in. While Indigenous health issues have been problematic for many nations across the globe other than Australia, we seem to have the greatest difficulty in combating these problems, with the same Close the Gap paper I mentioned before stating that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infant mortality is three times the rate of non-Indigenous Australians and more than 50 per cent higher than for Indigenous children in the USA and New Zealand. So this chamber is no stranger to such horrifying statistics. I and many other senators have raised many similar statistics in other speeches in this chamber time after time and year after year. In fact, I think it was my colleague Minister Scullion from the Northern Territory who said in this chamber more than five years ago when reflecting on poor Indigenous life expectancy figures, uh, he pointed out, and this is a quote from his speech, that average life expectancy for Indigenous men is less than uh, mine, that is Minister Scullion's current age. So what has Minister Scullion and this government done with an extra five years of their life? Perhaps that's a question that only that minister can answer. But all I have seen is a fundamental failure to show leadership on addressing Aboriginal life expectancy and a complete inability to work collaboratively with the Northern Territory Government to achieve any of the necessary outcomes. Australian Labor Party, on the other hand, we have recently released uh, in the lead up to this election a policy paper called New Directions, an equal start in life for Indigenous uh, children, where we have outlined, as the alternative government, our policy commitment to helping Indigenous children as a way to make the greatest difference over the long term for Indigenous communities. The policy paper quite clearly articulates our position on this issue. We believe that life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians remains one of the starkest indicators of inequality in the Australian society. The Howard government has now had 11 long, very long years 
to try and minimise this gap. The Labor has a plan, though, to focus on the critical years from birth to eight years of age, particularly in terms of support to child and maternal services, early development and parenting support, as well as literacy and numeracy support in the early years. Our plan represents a total investment of $261.4 million over four years, comprising of $186.4 million in Commonwealth expenditure, supported by $75 million from the states and territories. Speaking of the states and territories, we've seen, particularly over the last few months, that this Howard government is more interested in blaming the Northern Territory government and riding roughshod over it instead of working collaboratively. Federal Labor recognises the important role that the Martin Labor government in the Northern Territory is playing in addressing Indigenous disadvantage in the Northern Territory. Uh, and I think it's about time that somebody in this House actually recognised the significant resource commitments that the Northern Territory government's allocated for ad addressing Indigenous disadvantage and to publicly recognise the work that public servants, nurses, health workers and those people uh, employed by the Northern Territory Department of Health have actually undertaken over their uh, working life in uh, turning around uh, these statistics. I have to say, as I get around Indigenous communities in the previous uh, couple of weeks uh, in relation to the Northern Territory's uh, intervention on behalf of this government, Northern Territory public servants are actually saying to me they feel that their work has been worthless over the last couple of years and decades with uh, this intervention, and there has been no recognition of the substantial work that those public servants have played uh, in trying to uh, reduce this gap, particularly in, uh, in health services. Uh, the Northern Territory government has committed $286 uh, million over five years to implement a closing the gap strategy. This funding package means that there will be 223 real positions created to help close the gap. This is a generational plan of action and it should be applauded. And it is to the great disgrace of the opposition in the Northern Territory that they refer to take cheap political shots at the Northern Territory government rather than working with them collaboratively on this. Uh, instead, this government has uh, demonstrated that it prefers to sit on its hands instead of taking real action in closing the gap. We have a federal government that really prefers to play politics instead of showing real leadership working collaboratively with the states and territory governments and putting the money on the table that will actually go towards assisting closing this gap we are debating today. The Australian Labor Party uh, has, as I have discussed, demonstrated its commitment to closing the gap. We agree with Nacho and Oxfam that poor Indigenous health is affected by social and economic factors. Diseases triggered by poverty, overcrowded housing, poor sanitation, lack of access to education, poor access to medical care for acute diagnosis and treatment and poor nutrition. These factors are all preventable living conditions and, if addressed, can have real health implications for Indigenous people. Uh, and I can't let this opportunity go by in my remaining few minutes to actually mention the word trachoma. I know that Senator Lynn Allison uh, mentioned it because, of course, we were both uh, last week at uh, a dinner for the uh, Parliamentary Friends of, uh, of Vision, uh, where uh, Vision 2020, in conjunction with a number of other uh, health experts in the uh, eye area, uh, actually spoke at a dinner last week. <coughs> I think perhaps it might have been the first time that Senator Allison had actually been alerted to the dire situation we have in this country in relation to trachoma. I've been pursuing it now for many, many years, and I know that people in OATSI, and in particular uh, one senior public servant, will know that uh, this has been a passion of mine for probably the best part of six or seven years now. But trachoma is a disease of poverty. It was eliminated from white Australia 100 years ago, and it's a disease that we know how to handle. It exists in Aboriginal communities. The fact that it does exist is a national shame. We are the only developed country in the world that has trachoma, and without some concerted effort, we may end up being the last country in the world. Countries such as Morocco and Iran have already eliminated blinding tr trachoma, and this year, in one of the most backward of all African countries, Nigeria, six and a half million people will receive treatment for this disease. 
Some Aboriginal communities have rates of trachoma that are amongst the highest recorded anywhere else in this world. The Howard government has just paid lip service to interventions on trachoma and has not made any significant commitment or change. $900,000 to develop a policy and to train health workers and to set up a national database may well be a good start, but they need to fund the medicine Order. that goes into the eyes of Thank these you. people. Thank you, Senator Crossland. Thank you for your contribution. Senator Adams. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy. Uh, President, well, I rise uh, this afternoon to um, speak on something that's very close to my heart. Being probably one of the only nurses in the parliament, um, I was very fortunate to attend a conference at Broken Hill, which was um, the uh, Council of Remote Area Nurses of Australia. They came from all over Australia. There were 125 of them, plus a number of allied health people, and all the things that we've heard from those opposite these nurses are actually tackling, and guess what? The Howard government actually supports the organisation. These were the people that, when the um, Northern Territory invention, um, intervention um, uh, program was to be brought together, health professionals were a very, very important part of that. This was the organisation that the government went to. And they were very, very careful in the way that they asked the, asked the um, government teams to approach um, the issue. There was to be no big stick approach, as we've heard from the other side, that this was the intention. It certainly was not. These people have done the most wonderful job with briefing the um, health teams that are going through the Territory. And um, as I was saying, they, um, it's their 25th year, um, so it was their Silver Jubilee um, meeting. And on top of their agenda was finding solutions to the health issues impacting on remote communities and the health workforce crisis gripping Australia. It was the most wonderful conference, and um, some I could go on um, probably all afternoon talking about the different um, presentations that were made. But it's important to note that nurses and midwives are safe providers of primary health care, already living and working in most communities, no matter how small or isolated. The remote area nurses provide a model of care that needs to be acknowledged, and I'm sure it is acknowledged by the Howard government. Kreiner believes that this model can be part of the solution for the health care crisis in Australia. And I will go on about um, some of the key areas that were identified, but I think it's very important to um, know that the Australian government co-sponsored this conference and uh, recognises the important role Krana has in supporting the remote health workforce across Australia. They put $25,000 towards the funding of the conference. And they also um, fund the Krana Secretariat to enable Krana to manage their programs, as well as engaging with stakeholders at all levels to develop policies, protocols and initiatives that improve and support remote nurse nursing practice. There's $881,000 over three years for this. They provide the Bush Crisis Line, which is a 24-hour free call telephone service staffed by qualified psychologists that provides crisis debriefing and counselling for job-related trauma to isolated remote health practitioners and their families. And I note that one of their recommendations is that by July 2008, no nurse should be left to practice in isolation single nursing posts must be abolished. And I certainly agree with that with some of the stories that they have come up with. Um, a health research education officer who coordinates and teaches in the remote health practice program at the Centre of Remote Health provides mentoring and clinical supervision and assessment of the uh, remote area nursing students and provides academic leadership and resources to Krana. And uh, there was a very good um, presentation by Vicky Gordon and Sabina Knight, and these were the two people that were asked to coordinate the um, health, child health uh, check teams and um, brief them on what to expect and how to go about their role as they move through the um, 73 communities in the um, Northern Territory. And something that was very, very important and I would like to um, see improve or extended as the first line emergency care, the FLEC program, which aims to increase the access of people living in remote areas to high quality emergency care through a program of upskilling of remote practitioners. If these practitioners are not upskilled, they will not stay there. So it's very, very important that this program 
which includes the remote emergency care and the maternity emergency care program, is delivered by volunteer trainers. And these trainers come from a number of our intensive care areas right through. They're all, um, most of them are state employed um, professionals, but they are there as volunteers to focus on the multidisciplinary advanced emergency and trauma management skills. This program at the moment is given 590,000 over three years, but it really does need to be doubled. The facilitators are brilliant, and it's got to the stage now that defence and mining are asking that this, these particular teams can be adapt their programs to go and help them as well. So this is recognition of what the Howard government has done in uh, providing this sort of um, money and support over the three years, but it really, as I said, does need to be increased. And they also have an Indigenous program which aims to upskill health professionals that service the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services and emergency care. This includes the production of culturally appropriate teaching resources and stimulation material. So uh, with the Prime Minister's announcement of enrolled um, nurses now being able to be trained in um, hospital settings, I do see that this for Aboriginal health workers would be a great way for them to become enrolled nurses and have the support and backing of working actually in a hospital environment rather than for them trying to sit in a lecture theatre. This is not the way they learn. They learn by experience and by hands-on. So I think that the Prime Minister's announcement there for enrolled nurses to go back to the hospital-based training is um, very, very good, and I, I really do support that program. So um, just to move on, I think that it's important that um, the uh, comment made uh, by Christopher Cliff, the president of, Cl of Krana, after this great weekend says, let's mobilise and utilise nurses, the most trusted and abundant of our health professionals. Remote area nurses already provide a high level of service in some of the sickest and most advantaged, disadvantaged people in Australia. With the shortage of doctors, their role is even more important. The nursing and midwifery profession isn't running from the daunting challenges. In fact, they are eager to address it head on. I plead with the federal, state and territory governments Order. to make this call from nurses and midwives Order. and enable them to tackle the increasing needs of remote and Order. rural, rural communities across Australia. I apologise, Australia. Senator Adams. The time uh, allocated for this uh, debate has expired. But thank you for your contribution. The question is that the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Madam Clerk. Ah, we now move on to committee reports. Um, what about Minister? Senator Weber. Mr Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum not present. Ring the bells.
Uh, quorum present. I call on the, chair, uh, the, uh, the uh, chair of the Committee of Privileges, Senator Faulkner, to present the 132nd report. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I do present the 132nd report of the Committee of Privileges entitled Persons Referred to in the Senate, Mr Charlad Mohammed and Mr Nurkholis on behalf of staff of the Indonesian Forum for Environment, WALHI, and a move that the report be printed. The question is that the, report, the motion be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek leave uh, to uh, move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? The leave is granted. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the report be adopted. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, this report is the 51st in a series of reports recommending that a right of reply be afforded to persons who claim to have been adversely affected by being referred to in the Senate, either by name or in such a way as to be readily identified. The committee has dealt with several applications from organisations or persons on behalf of organisations, but this is only the second occasion on which the committee has considered an application from persons outside Australia. As usual, the committee has approached the matter from the point of view of facilitating access to the procedure by affected persons. On 20 August 2007, the President received a submission from Mr Charlid Mohammed, Executive Director, and Mr Nurkholis, National Board Member, on behalf of the Indonesian Forum for Environment, WALI, relating to comments made by Senator Ian MacDonald in the Senate on 9 August 2007 during general business. The President referred the submission to the committee under Privilege Resolution 5. The committee considered the submission on 13 September 2005 and recommends that the proposed response, as agreed between the committee and representatives of WALI, be incorporated in Hansard. Mr Acting Deputy President, the committee reminds the Senate that in matters of this nature, it does not judge the truth or otherwise of statements made by senators or the persons referred to. Rather, it ensures that these persons' submissions and ultimately the responses it recommends accord with the criteria set out in Privilege Resolution 5. Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend the motion to the Senate. Thank you. Uh Further speakers, if not, the question is that the report be adopted. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Against, declare it carried. One nil. Any, any other committee reports? Senator yes. Fioranti Wells. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I present the report of the committee uh, entitled Review of Certain Aspects of the Administration of the Australian Electoral Commission. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? If no objection, leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, I would like, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I uh, have pleasure in presenting the Committee's second report for 2007, Review of Certain Aspects of the Administration of the Australian Electoral Commission. With a federal election approaching, it has been a timely exercise for the committee to review certain aspects of the administration of the AEC. The terms of reference for the inquiry required the committee to direct much of its focus on the staffing arrangements across the AEC's divisional office network. Currently, there are 150 AEC divisional offices in 135 locations across Australia. The AEC is somewhat unique as an organisation because its business cycle is influenced by the relatively unpredictable timing of key electoral events and federal elections which determine workload peaks and impact significantly on staffing requirements. 
The impacts of the election cycle are a key consideration for the AEC in determining the most appropriate staffing model for divisional officers. The committee received evidence which raised a number of concerns regarding workforce issues in some AEC divisional officers. These concerns related to employment structure, staffing levels, career opportunities for staff, retention issues and the effectiveness of co-located divisional officers. Some of these concerns uh, are a result of the AEC implementing a new divisional office staffing profile. To coincide with this new staffing profile, the AEC also introduced a process of workload sharing in an effort to combat the diversity of workload across each of its divisional offices, where some offices are tasked with processing up to three times the amount of enrolment transactions as others. Specific concerns came from the co-located divisional office in Chatswood, New South Wales, uh, which services four electoral divisions. The committee conducted a site visit of the Chatswood office as part of its inquiry and appreciated the opportunity to speak directly with AEC employees about some of the issues identified in submissions. Without an extensive body of evidence to draw on, however, it is difficult for the committee to determine whether the concerns raised during the inquiry are symptomatic of widespread issues within the AEC. While the committee is not in a position to draw comprehensive conclusions, it considers the concerns which were raised to be significant enough to warrant further investigation. Therefore, the committee has recommended that the Auditor-General examine the issue of workforce planning in the AEC in further detail. The committee was also asked to consider whether the national tally room should be permitted, should be maintained beyond the next federal election. The committee supports the continuation of the tally room and is of the view that the abolition of the tally room would have a negative impact on the perception of the transparency of elections. Furthermore, the committee notes the value and logic of having a central tally room in the nation's capital, which extends beyond any dollar or logistical considerations. The committee has therefore <coughs> recommended that the government ensures the national tally room is retained for future federal elections. Mr Acting Deputy President, I take this opportunity to thank my fellow committee members for their contribution to this inquiry. I also wish to thank those organisations and individuals who gave their time to prepare submissions and appear as witnesses before the committee. On behalf of my com co uh, committee colleagues, I commend the report to the Senate. I thank you, Senator. Further speakers? Yes, thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President, I Senator too wish to... Oh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I do uh, wish to add some comment uh, following on from Senator Fiorvanti Wells and just to say that um, the, the inquiry took in um, a number of submissions, as Senator Fiorvanti Wells mentioned. We did do a site visit to Chatswood, but I'd like to add some, a different perspective on it. When we got to Chatswood, we had the ability to talk to employees, and what I noticed at Chatswood that there was a lot of employees, or there was a number of employees, who had been casual for many, many, many years. Now, we understand that uh, the load of the Electoral uh, Commission is all uh, go at certain stages, and then there's uh, not a hell of a heck of a lot of work to do for the employees after. But I did have some concern that no one had a happy story with the employees at Chatswood. A lot of the employees did say that they'd come from smaller divisional offices before the co-location, and they found that uh, for some reason for the co-locations there was going to be these super offices to look after members and senators and, and inquiries and enrolling people on the, uh, on the electoral roll. But I do make, the, or, uh, make note that if there was that much concern, the, you know, when we had the uh, presentation by the employers, they told us what great employers they were and how happy everyone was. When we actually got to speak to the employers, it was a completely different story. Now, the employers, Mr Acting Deputy President, come up and they say, well, look, you know, we do our best to give thousands and thousands of people some work. I understand the workload of the uh, Australian Electoral Commission would be, would be enormous, but you can't expect workers to hang on, hang on by their fingernails and get a couple of hours a week and, and expect to be waiting on the end of a telephone line for a call from the Australian, uh, the Australian Electoral Commission. 
But on that, I would say that uh, I commend the, uh, the report to the Senate. I think there's a heck of a lot more work to do, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, because it will be interesting. Because I make note that uh, last 2004, the last election, there were some 420 odd thousand uh, um, voters who enrolled at the last minute. Well, that's, uh, as we know, the draconian laws that were passed through this Senate not long ago that's overturned that now. For some reason, I don't know why, but the government uh, wanted to make it not as easy as possible for, him, for uh, uh, voters to get on the electoral roll, but to make it harder for them. And it is a travesty, unfortunately, that under this government that it is easier to donate to political parties Without, uh, without too much transparency and accountability, Mr Acting Deputy President, and sadly, at the same time, making it harder to get on the electoral roll for new voters. But on that, I do say we have a lot more work to do. I'll be looking forward to a lot more uh, uh, work on this committee after the election. And on that, Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you. Further speakers? If not, I'll put it. All those in favour of adopting this report, please say aye. aye. Against declared carried. I understand there is a delegation report. Thank you very much. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Is leave granted? There no objection. Leave is granted. I present Senator the report. Patterson. Thank you. I present the report of the Australian parliamentary delegation to Canada and Germany, which took place from the 14th to the 28th of April 2007. I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Is uh, leave granted? There be no objection. Leave is granted. Senator. I move that the Senate take note of the document. And I wish to comment on the, uh, on the delegation to Canada and Germany, led by the Speaker of the House. In order to save the time of the Senate, I'd refer my Senate colleagues to the Speaker's tabling statement for the report uh, he outlines in more detail, and I'll give uh, of the, the things we did. And if anybody wants to see what we did in more detail, they can go to the report. But I want to say, start by thanking the Canadian and German parliaments, led by their presiding officers, for the warmth of their welcome, for the interesting programs that they have arranged and for their, um, the hospitality they gave us. Both in Canada and Germany, the, the hospitality was outstanding. And also our, our thanks are due to the High Commissioner uh, for Canada, in Canada, Bill Fisher, and to our ambassador in Germany, Ian Ke uh, Kemish, and their staff at, at the uh, embassies uh, for the work that they put in to make sure that the visit was a productive one. The um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Parliamentary Library and Parliamentary Relations Officers also made a significant contribution to our understanding before we went uh, to arranging uh, our uh, uh, accommodation, everything else, not accommodation, but our, our plans. So they made a significant uh, contribution as well to this uh, successful delegation. The Prime Minister of Canada, when he was here last week, uh, did explain that one difference between Canada and Australia, despite actually emphasising the uh, similarities, was that uh, Canada has an appointed Senate, and they're appointed until they're 75 years of age. And uh, I think he expressed very clearly that he hopes to reform that, and that uh, he would hope to have a, a Senate that is more representative of the Canadian population. But we found that there were similar issues facing Australia and Canada, issues that are, uh, result from a federation that they have provinces to deal with, similarly in, in, in Germany. Uh, and I guess we all expressed the challenges that face any federated uh, country that has to deal with provinces or states. And, uh, and we talked at, at length about that with, with our um, colleagues, when we, uh, our Canadian and uh, German colleagues when we met with them. The uh, president outlines an issue that affects rural areas with low unemployment rate, which is the case in Canada. And we heard about, and I'll just quote from the president, president speaker of the house here, we heard about the successful seasonal agricultural workers program, which sees around 20,000 workers come to Canada from Mexico and Caribbean countries to undertake seasonal agricultural work. The details of the program are outlined in the delegation's report. And the key point is that the program works because there are incentives for all participants, workers, employers and the participating countries to make it work. And given similar labour issues facing Australian agricultural industries, the applicability of a similar scheme to Australian circumstances would be worth exploring. So there were a, a range of things that we saw. Uh, we were also ably assisted by Mr Christopher Patterson, the senior advisor to the Speaker, 
and Mr Andre Lomp, the Delegation Secretary. And, um, on behalf of um, honourable senators that attended and also uh, those House of Reps people, to thank them for the work they put in and putting up with us when sometimes we were a bit overtired. And I would emphasise that I think when we have these uh, parliamentary delegations that we need to consider seriously that people do need to actually have some time when they've been travelling all night to actually recuperate. And I, I've gone on about this at length, but I think on both the delegations I've been involved in, I think sometimes uh, we actually push the envelope a little, uh, sometimes forced, forcibly because we, we have to fit into a program offered by the country. But I'd also like to raise another issue while I'm on this. I would like and hope that in the next parliament that uh, consideration could be given to committees travelling together at least once in a parliamentary session. It is very difficult to meet the needs of everybody on a parliamentary delegation. Somebody wants to go and look at uh, transport, somebody else wants to look at governance, somebody else wants to look at social policy, and sometimes it's hard to meet the needs of everyone. And, and to have at least a committee having the opportunity to travel together to actually look at um, significant issues uh, that f affect their particular interests, I think, would be valuable. And that's not to take away from what we learn from these wonderful experiences where we're exposed and have opportunities that, that you would normally not get. Uh, and, and, and it's a wonderful learning experience. But I wonder if consideration shouldn't be given to some interest area delegations where you could really uh, go into depth. That would be the only uh, way in which I think we could improve these. But again, if I can just uh, say, and before my colleague on the other side gets up and and, uh, and maybe refers to my love of uh, German white asparagus um, and has referred to me as a spargel sister ever since we came back. Um, I would say that we, uh, I enjoyed the delights of Canadian food and German food, but particularly because we were there in asparagus season. So if anybody wants to go to Germany, you must go when you have those very large white asparagus. And I came back looking like an asparagus, I think, because we ate so many. So, uh, we, one of the great opportunities on these trips is that you can break down some of the barriers <coughs> that exist between parties and learn more about individuals on the other side. And it's a shame that the public can't see the cooperation that goes on in these committees, whether it be regs and ords, or whether it be scrutiny of bills, or whether it be a committee, or whether it be a delegation. There are friendships made, and I think they're an important part of learning about each other, just as well as as much as learning about other countries. I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President. Oh, yes, I too would like to make a few comments about the delegation report, um, a delegation that I was very fortunate to be able to attend uh, in April this year to Canada and Germany. It was a valuable opportunity to see uh, issues of common interest between those two countries and Australia and to get a better understanding of the social, political and economic uh, developments currently taking place in Europe and North America. Um, like, like Australia, uh, Canada is in the midst of a resources boom and facing a skills crisis. And, um, Canada has some uh, interesting initiatives to try and, and deal with that. Um, in 2005 alone, some 100,000 skilled and unskilled workers um, supplemented Canada's workforce. And uh, we met some of those at uh, Whistler in British Columbia, where the delegation learned how important uh, temporary holiday maker visas are to the successful operation of the ski and tourism industry in particular uh, in that country. The delegation met a number of young Australian workers there in restaurants and uh, on the ski fields and in hotels. And it was very pleasing to hear the Canadian Prime Minister in his speech to the Parliament last week um, say that he uh, would uh, seek to get the agreement of his parliament to increase the number of young Australians that may go and work in Canada under that scheme uh, every year. And uh, I think it must be a wonderful opportunity for young Australians to, to go and uh, have the excitement and adventure of working in a foreign country. Um, and as a participant in uh, last year's somewhat controversial uh, Employment, Workplace Relations and Education Senate Committee inquiry into the proposal to have a scheme um, of uh, bringing in labour from the Pacific Islands to assist in the horticultural harvest in Australia, 
Um, it was particularly interesting for me to learn about Canada's experience of a, of a, of a program like that, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program that Senator Patterson's already uh, referred to. In 2005, 20,000 employees um, from countries around Canada were employed under that program. And the Canadians, I have to say, were surprised that the proposal to uh, um, establish such a program in Australia was so controversial last year. But it was pointed out by the Canadians that, um, that, that such schemes do have the potential for exploitation of workers, um, and it was only vigilance on the part of the Canadian government and peer pressure within the agricultural industry that ensured exploitation was kept at bay. Um, Canada requires um, standardised contracts that ensure uh, employers using, using that scheme provide uh, appropriate working conditions, uh, accommodation, um, stipulated wages and subsidised uh, transportation costs. Um, and, uh, when we were speaking with the Immigration Minister about the success of that scheme over a number of years, she said, uh, as Senator Patterson has said and as is reflected in the report, that it only works because the incentives are there <coughs> for everybody who participates uh, to make it work. Another um, interesting aspect of the portion of the time we spent in uh, Canada was um, to meet with um, representatives of Indigenous communities and members of the parliament who were dealing with um, Indigenous issues. Uh, in, in Canada. Obviously, Indigenous Canadians face some of the same difficulties that as Indigenous Australians face, um, but uh, those issues are being dealt with um, uh, differently in Canada. There's a process of uh, treaty negotiations between the federal and provincial governments with Indigenous people, and there's currently some 40 treaty actions uh, being considered to define the rights and responsibilities of the First Nations and the uh, state and federal governments in Canada. And the Canadian government has also established a $100 million trust to provide practical support for reconciliation, uh, which I have to say is a, a stark contrast to our government, uh, which unfortunately has uh, so far refused to even say sorry to our Indigenous peoples. Um, but the aim of the Canadian Fund is to provide First Nations with the tools and training and skills so that they can, can participate fully in um, uh, land and resource management and land use planning processes and develop social, economic and cultural programs appropriate for their communities. Uh, one other um, uh, interesting uh, part of our uh, tour in Canada was to visit a winery uh, near Niagara on the lake, which was um, being managed uh, by an expatriate Australian winemaker. And I have to say, while the product was good, uh, it will probably never be quite as good as South Australian wine. Uh, in, in Germany, uh, the delegation focused in particular on climate change, energy security and environmentally responsible and sustain, uh, sustainable industry. And there was a lot to learn from the Germans in this regard. Um, uh, Germany, like Canada, but unlike Australia, is a signatory to the uh, United Nations Agreement on Kyoto, and that does inform the uh, Germans' uh, progress towards achieving um, environmentally sustainable uh, manufacture, um, which is what we looked at in particular. And the uh, delegation was fortunate enough to attend a parliamentary session when uh, Germany's environment minister, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, presented a major policy statement on the environment. In and in his statement, uh, he outlined the government's plan for climate change, for addressing climate change until 2020. Uh, I noted that Germany had cut its carbon dioxide emissions by 18 per cent from their 1990 baseline, but the nation there is still 3 per cent away from achieving its climate protection uh, target for the period 2008-2012. And the minister said in his statement that Germany, uh, to fulfil its Kyoto, Kyoto commitments, uh, needed to cut greenhouse gases by 37 million tonnes, uh, no, no uh, small target. Um, the minister also indicated that uh, climate protection strategy offers Germany a wealth of economic opportunities. And ex he explained in his statement that improving the energy efficiency of power plants, machinery, uh, heating systems and automobiles would create jobs for Germany's engineers and skilled workers in the long term. And it was an important speech to hear and it was heartening to hear a major nation in the uh, EU not only frankly discuss its uh, issues with achieving uh, uh, energy uh, 
energy and environmental targets, but uh, also to look positively at how uh, they could do that while not uh, negatively impacting on economic growth in that country. The delegation went to both Stuttgart and Frankfurt and were uh, given the opportunity to visit uh, uh, important German industries. Um, we visited uh, Daimler Chrysler, the, the largest plant of Daimler Chrysler at Sindelfingen and uh, saw a range of measures that that uh, company has taken to reduce the environmental impact of uh, the manufacturing plant itself there and of the vehicles that it produces. This, is, of course, was particularly interesting for me as a senator from South Australia, which is uh, very reliant on the automotive manufacturing industry. Um, the, the delegation was told by the Daimler Chrysler representatives that we met with that it's important for um, not just government to uh, impose uh, restrictions on the way manufacturers covered out, ca carried out, but also for uh, companies to challenge themselves, uh, not only to ensure that environmental standards set by the government are, are met, but that uh, industry is actually looking further than those standards and into the future. Um, the company's uh, somewhat incredible in commitment to reducing its environmental footprint, I think, impressed all of the delegation. Uh, we were also very fortunate to, to visit an agricultural community near Frankfurt, a community that, with the assistance of subsidies, subsidies from uh, local, federal and EU uh, sources, have been able to construct an agricultural facilities that benefit uh, the whole community through cooperative arrangements. Uh, in particular, I was very impressed to see the steps taken to use biodiesel to fuel the machinery and vehicles used in that uh, cooperative uh, agricultural uh, venture. And, uh, there was something to be learnt there about um, how uh, our agricultural industry in Australia can work better together to address uh, issues to do with climate change and energy. Um, while in uh, Germany we also visited a smaller business, a Hassia um, mineral water factory, and they uh, had the opportunity to hear from uh, a very old established family company about how they were dealing with workplace relations issues since the uh, fall of the wall because uh, Hassia, the company, was, had employees in both the former West Germany and East Germany and where conditions were somewhat different. Um, and they uh, also spoke to us about their opportunities to move into the Asian market. I also enjoyed very much uh, attending. Well, enjoyed. I uh, appreciated the opportunity to attend an Anzac Day service in Berlin with the rest of the delegation, and it was uh, wonderful to see many Australian uh, tourists there who uh, didn't want to miss an opportunity to uh, attend a memorial service on that very important day. I too would like to thank all of the people who uh, supported us on that uh, delegation, in, in particular Mr Andres Lom from the PRO and Mr Chris Patterson from the Speaker's Office, uh, His Excellency the um, uh, Ambassador uh, to, uh, uh, Australia, to <coughs> Australia and Canada, Order, Senator, your time has expired. Uh, are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Oh, I'll put the question that the uh, report be noted. I'll put that. All those in favour? Against declare carried. Right. Are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to senators. Statements of compliance with the continuing orders relating to departmental and agency files and contracts are tabled. Um, are there any messages? A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Superannuation Legislation Amendment Bill 2007 for concurrence. Minister. Um, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I'll put that. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Against, declare it carried. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill might be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned. I'll put that. All of those of that opinion, please say aye. Against, declare it carried.
Messages have been received from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Northern Territory National Emergency Response Amendment Alcohol Bill 2007 and the Australian Postal Corporation Amendment Quarantine Inspe Inspection and Other Measures Bill 2007 without amendment. Clark. Business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Milne for the reference of a matter to a committee. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. Yes, I rise today uh, to um, move this Senate motion, which relates to the Australia-Russia Nuclear Cooperation Agreement signed on 7 September 2007, and it's a reference that that go to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee of the Senate for inquiry. I am moving this because I am somewhat uh, concerned that last week I moved for this matter to be referred under the, uh, or as with the JSCOP process to the um, Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, and so I was surprised when the Senate voted that down. So I am uh, now moving that it go to the Senate Committee because I think this needs uh, considerable examination and consideration, and I would appreciate some explanation from the government because, according to the explanatory notes that uh, are on the government website, it says um, that the agreement will come into force when each country has completed its domestic ratification process is likely to be in the second half of 2008 at the earliest. In Australia, the process involves parliamentary and public scrutiny, including consideration of the agreement by the Parliamentary Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. So I would appreciate some clarification from the government that, in fact, this particular agreement for the sale of Australian uranium to Russia is going to be assessed under the JSCOP process, as the explanatory notes um, seem to suggest. I can only assume, if that is the case, that it will be uh, examined under that process, that the reason that the uh, government opposed my particular reference was because it cites, in particular, uh, a need for consideration to be given not only to the strategic and security issues pertaining to the Australia-Russia uranium agreement, but also in relation to human rights the rule of law, um, the ability to verify Russia's compliance, uh, the issue of the retreat from democracy, freedom of expression, rights of civil society uh, and the rights of individuals to challenge authorities, uh, the use of force by Russian authorities against peaceful anti-government demonstration, the reports of the use of torture in prisons and, as I indicated, the restriction of democratic freedoms in the run-up to the Duma elections in December 2007 and the presidential elections in March 2008. Now, this is a, uh, a particularly uh, significant day to be rising in the Senate to talk about an Australian agreement because I have only just learned that overnight in Europe, Australia signed on to George Bush's Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. It's it's received, uh, it has received um, no publicity here in Australia, and if it wasn't for the Times of India, Australians would still be ignorant of the fact that last night Australia did sign to be part of the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, which is George Bush's initiative, which uh, the Prime Minister has been an enthusiast. Order, order Minister. Order Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I am appalled that Australia has signed up to the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. I have been a critic and an opponent of that ever since the Prime Minister went to the United States last year to start talking about it, because we all know it is about selling more uranium into the global nuclear fuel cycle and taking back the waste. And as we also know, Mr Acting Deputy President, the reason Canada has not signed up to the GNEP is because Canada doesn't want to become an international waste dump. And the Prime Minister uh, has now set Australia up in the GNEP, and uh, we've learned that from the Times of India. It seems like we have to go to the nuclear states 
to find out what our own country is involved in around the world. But I return to the matter of the reference on Russia, because I think this is critically important. Less than a week after President Putin left Australia to go home to Russia, we learn that Russia tested the world's most, most powerful vacuum bomb last week. Test results of the new airborne weapon have shown its efficiency in inverted commas and power is commensurate with a nuclear weapon. Alexander Rushkin, deputy head of Russia's armed force chief of staff, told Russia's first, cha uh, first channel television. You'll now see it in action. The bomb which has no match in the world is being tested at a military site. Goes on to say that uh, a vacuum bomb or fuel air explosive causes widespread devastation. A typical bomb of that type is dropped or fired. The first explosive charge bursts open the container at a predetermined height and disperses the fuel in a cloud that mixes with oxygen. A second charge ignites the cloud, which can engulf objects or buildings. And he goes on to say, I want to stress that the action of this weapon does not contaminate the environment in contrast to a nuclear one. So less than a week after Australia signs on to an agreement with the President of Russia on a nuclear arrangement, the Russia President goes home to welcome the explosion of the world's most powerful vacuum bomb. Hardly the activities of a state which is supposedly only interested in peace and um, disarmament. Now we have, now we have, uh, and now we have also reports from Russia about the human rights abuses. In particular, I'd like to talk about Larissa Arap, and I will raise her name in this parliament time and time again, because she is a young dissident who finds herself now in a psychiatric facility in Russia, in an asylum which is reminiscent of the old KGB days. And uh, she is a uh, critic of President Putin, and uh, as a result, she was put in a psychiatric institution and there has been a change in the law in Russia there to uh, make it uh, um, uh, remove the rights of sectioned patients to seek an independent assessment. And there are dozens of incidents now suggesting that Russia's psychiatric system is rapidly becoming as unsavoury as it used to be in Soviet times. She is a young woman who has been an outspoken critic of the Putin regime, particularly in relation to the crackdown on dissidents, and that's where she finds herself. She, at this stage, I believe, is still alive, unlike the demonstrators outside the Angarsk enrichment facility, where one demonstrator was murdered, bashed to death recently outside that facility, and a number of others seriously injured. And President Putin suggested that it was just the actions of local hooligans and not state-endorsed violence. Well, the state-endorsed violence is occurring all over Russia as we speak, and in fact there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that the Moscow apartment bombings were the work of the, S of the FSB and, that they, uh, and also that the FSB is supporting fundamentalist Islamic schools in Chechnya to foment the violence there to justify the crackdown. That is what is being said. That is being what is said currently about— Order, Senator well, I, uh, it's quite interesting, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the uh, senator who is interjecting is so ill-read when it comes to what is actually going on in Russia at the moment, and that is why it would be extremely useful to have the inquiry as I'm suggesting it, because then we could actually test the allegations. A number of academics in Sydney last week and a number of people from Russia who, are, who also who work in Russia there is now a considerable body of opinion to suggest that that is in fact the way that the Putin regime operates. And I think the naivety that is being demonstrated by the, uh, by the government is reminiscent of, in fact, uh, the uh, former Prime Minister of Australia, Pig Iron Bob, who the Prime Minister wishes to emulate, who in 1938-39 uh, made sure when the waterside workers tried to ban the export of pig iron to Japan, he overrode that. And of course, the pig iron went to Japan with appalling consequences for Australia and, in fact, the, re the rest of the world. And I would suggest that equally as we've had pig iron, Bob, our current prime minister, could be known as Yellow Cake John. 
Yellow Cake John emulating Pig Iron Bob only in the dying days of his prime ministership, and I do hope that uh, we'll hear from the Labor Party in a moment, because if it is true that there is until the middle of 2008 for a proper assessment of this uh, Russian nuclear agreement that the Labor Party will conduct under this uh, process a proper assessment of this deal with the Russians such that the, um, the human rights ramifications are taken into account and not just the uh, interests of BHP Billet and, and Rio Tinto, because we know that uh, they have been talking to the Russians for some time about this uh, particular text. In looking at the agreement, it seems that it could easily facilitate the involvement of both those companies in mining uranium in Russia as well as here, and also in seeking uh, private sector investment in the uranium enrichment facility in Angarsk. And uh, it could well be interesting because Russia, under the current leadership, has demonstrated no respect for the rule of law, whether it comes to human rights, civil rights or, in fact, corporate law, as Shell has discovered when it built that large pipeline only to have it nationalised after the event. And the same, of course, has occurred with uh, Khodorkovsky, who has been jailed and his assets uh, nationalised with uh, UCOS. He, of course, remains in um, prison in Russia with uh, what are trumped up charges such that the Swiss Federal Court recently has said that they will not provide information to the Russians because it's clearly a politically motivated trial to keep him in jail uh, until after the Duma elections and the presidential elections next year. So we've got an appalling uh, pattern emerging in Russia. There's a new crime that President Putin has brought in, a crime of extremism, and it is under that crime that a number of journalists have been found guilty. And we know that at least 14 journalists have been murdered in Russia since Putin came to power. And to this day, there are uh, suggestions that up to 21 of them have been murdered. And of course, Putin has also brought in a law to say that it is legal to kill an enemy of the state outside Russia which means the murder of Litvinenko becomes a uh, state-sanctioned act of violence under the Putin regime. Now, that is a matter of fact. Only last week I met with uh, Grigory Pasko just before he left to go back to Russia. He was terrified. He was the journalist who reported the dumping of nuclear waste from Russia into the Pacific, and he is now declared an enemy of the state. That is, the kind, that is the kind of behaviour that is going on under President Putin, and I think it's a matter. It's extremely sobering to consider what is happening there. Then look at the political process, where President Putin has moved in to, rem to remove the democratic election of governors. They're now all appointed by the state. We also have a change to the electoral laws that prevent. Uh, other political parties being able to contest the elections there because suddenly they don't meet the new requirements. All of these things are actually occurring in Russia at the moment, and it's been recognised by the European Union, which, which on the 18th of May 2007, uh, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, passed a long resolution in which. Uh, it expressed its deep concern about the use of force by the Russian authorities against peaceful <coughs> anti-government demonstrators in Moscow and St. Petersburg. It stresses that freedom of speech and the right of assembly are fundamental human rights. In fact, the British ambassador to uh, Russia has been treated appallingly because he stood up for free speech and human rights when he addressed a conference in Russia. The Australian ambassador has not shown the same level of courage in terms of speaking out on these issues, and I would urge the government to do so. The Europeans do include in their treaties obligations about civil rights and human rights. Have a look at the Russian, have a look at the European treaties that they have entered into. They incorporate into those those issues. And uh, in fact, Don Rothwell from the ANU, in a critique of the government's proposed arrangement, says that there should be conditionality clauses at the very least, making the treaty conditional upon human rights. And uh, apparently, uh, Senator Payne is outraged at the notion that you would have conditionality clauses in such a treaty that cover issues such as human rights. 
that cover issues such as democracy, that cover issues such as the rule of law. And, uh, I would urge Senator Payne and other government members to read Don Rothwell's uh, ANU, his uh, advice in relation to negotiating positions for Australia with regard to that Australia. Australian-Russian agreement, because there is obviously room for conditionality and it is not in there. The conditionality clauses on human rights are not in this agreement, nor is a commitment to the rule of law, nor is a commitment to uphold democracy and uh, the democracy movement. And the Europeans go on to express deep concern about the continuing reports from Russian and international human rights organisations about the use of torture and the commission of inhumane and degrading acts in prisons, police stations and secret detention centres in Chechnya, and strongly condemns such practices and calls on the Russian authorities to ensure that the rights guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights, to which Russia is a signatory, are fully respected in the Chechnyan Republic, for example. Also, expresses its concern about social and political polarisation and restriction of democratic freedoms in the run-up to the Duma elections. goes on to talk about the uh, calling on Russia and the European Union as members of the, or as Russia as the UN Security Council to assume responsibility for the Iranian nuclear issue. Expresses concern and declarations made by President Putin in reaction to the United States' plans to deploy components of its anti-ballistic missile system in Poland and the Czech Republic and calls on all parties involved to engage in dialogue, etc., etc. So the European Union is very aware of what is going on in Russia. The European Union is also very afraid because President, when President Putin turned off the gas to Europe, he knew very well what he was doing and it gave all of Europe a sense of the power of Russia as a major energy supplier to Europe and made the rest of Europe scramble on this issue of energy security, which is why they are for going, going full on in renewables and uh, trying to develop alternatives so that their dependence on Russia is minimised given the way things are going. At the same time, you had the Russians joining in their military exercises under the Shanghai cooperation. You had Russian bombers for the first time resuming their long-range um, their long-range flights, and those, of course, the bombers I'm referring to are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And so it is into that scenario that Australia rushes with its uh, Australia-Russia nuclear cooperation agreement. I think it is foolhardy in the extreme for Australia to be putting profits from uranium sales ahead of global security, and that is precisely what's going on here. And there is nothing in this agreement which talks about human rights, which talks about the rule of law, which talks about freedom of speech, which talks about guaranteeing any, any of those things, and there is no reason why all of those things ought not to have been in conditionality clauses. And I'll be very interested to hear what the, uh, what the opposition has to say, because, as I indicated, it uh, is likely to be in government and dealing with this uh, joint house assessment of the process, and I would hope that the, uh, the uh, opposition, Mr Acting Deputy President, will take the issues of human rights more seriously. And uh, I do note with uh, interest, of course, that, uh, that it was the waterside workers who were trying back in 1938-39 to do the right thing in terms of the exports of pig iron to Japan. Under this government, of course, not only have we had the secondary boycotts, but now we've got the ACCC legislation coming in here to try and prevent even any kind of uh, civil protest. And so we've got a situation where things have moved desperately backwards in the last uh, 70 years in relation to the capacity of civil society in Australia to take action when governments become so bereft of any kind of ethical stand. There is no ethical framework within which this agreement with Russia has been assessed. There has been no discussion of it except in the context of maximising profits from the export of Australian uranium. That is the only context. BHP, BHP and Rio Tinto have been in there all the way. Where have been? Where have you had the import through you, Mr Acting Deputy President? Where has there been the import? 
input from the academics and the human rights and civil society groups in relation to this Russia-Australian agreement. They have been nowhere. They have been excluded from the process. And the values that are behind this agreement are just putting profits ahead of principle, and it will be to our detriment. And Prime Minister Howard will have the legacy he wants. He will be reminded that he has emulated Pig Eye and Bob by becoming Yellow Cake John. <laughs> Further speakers? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And uh, let me say at the, uh, at the outset that it. Uh, it's clear to me that there is nothing that the Australian Greens won't do to suffocate Australian business, no matter where it's active, and this is just another example of that with Senator Milne's response or remarks this afternoon. What the Australian government, what the Australian government uh, has to say uh, in, in relation to this uh, particular uh, matter and this particular motion to refer the agreement to the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade is uh, is what uh, the minister has, in fact, uh, most explicitly outlined on the record uh, up till now. Anyway, we would not be entering into this arrangement, into this agreement, if we were not confident that Russia will comply with the commitments given in the Australia-Russia nuclear cooperation agreement. The position from which Australia starts, as far as our reserves of uranium are concerned, at the very least, is that we have 38% of the world's reserves of uranium, which is indeed more than uh, any other country. In the 2006-07 financial year, we exported about $630 million worth of that uranium, which is expected to rise to $814 million in this financial year. Under the arrangement uh, in this particular uh, uh, discussion, Mr Acting Deputy President, Australia will export about 2,000 tonnes of uranium annually, and that will provide about a third of Russia's imported uranium. It's fair to say that up until this point, Russia has had its own considerable energy resources and hasn't needed to uh, import uranium. But it does have uh, considerable plans to increase substantially its nuclear fuel capacity—30 new reactors uh, in the next 30 years—means it is, in fact, uh, searching for new opportunities. This particular agreement, uh, the, um, the uh, 2007 Australia-Russia Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, will supersede the 1990 treaty which allowed for Australian uranium to be processed by the then USSR on behalf of third countries which had safeguard arrangements with Australia, but the uranium could not be used domestically by the Soviets. No Australian uranium has been sent to Russia for processing in the 17 years since that agreement was signed. In fact, it was not until, it was until recently Australia had not designated what facilities were for military purposes and what were for fuel production and so it was not eligible for the mandatory safeguard inspections upon which Australia insists. Last year, Russia agreed to separate its military and civil programs, paving the way for this particular arrangement with uh, Australia. Just in terms of Australia's uh, economic engagement uh, with Russia, I think it is worth noting for the record that, that Russia is Australia's second fastest growing export partner, only just behind India and ahead of China, with 95 per cent growth in 2005-2006 alone. In 2006, Australia exported $656 million worth of goods to Russia, which doubled the uh, amounts of the previous year. Let me make it absolutely clear. In line with standard Australian treaty practice, the Australia-Russia Nuclear Cooperation Agreement and a national interest analysis will be tabled in Parliament for consideration by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. The government has been clear on this process from the moment that negotiations on the agreement were announced and, in fact, in the minister's press release of April of this year, he announced that, and I quote, in accordance with Australian treaty making, making practice, the agreement will be tabled in parliament for review by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties when negotiations have been finalised and, advance, and in advance of binding treaty action being taken. In terms of the, uh, the timing of when the agreement and the national interest analysis will be tabled for consideration by the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, that is in, indeed dependent on the parliamentary sitting schedule. It's worth noting that if the agreement were also to be referred to the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, it would then be in the situation of being considered by both that committee and the J. Scott Committee in parallel. 
I understand, and I would have thought it would normally be the case, that there will be ample opportunity for members of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties Committee to uh, seek responses to the questions which Senator Milne and, and other senators raise if they wish to do so, certainly Senate representatives as members of that committee being a joint committee. As uh, indicated earlier in my remarks, the government is confident that Russia will abide by the terms of the agreement as they are negotiated, namely that Australian uranium would only be used in facilities covered by Russia's safeguards agreement with the IAEA. It is, as uh, has been stated elsewhere and uh, also by the minister, simply not in Russia's national interests to misuse Australian uranium. Inevitably, they will become increasingly reliant on external supplies of uranium to fuel their growing nuclear power industry, and if they misuse it, then they uh, effectively um, cut off uh, that option for themselves. They have no need to uh, particularly import uranium for nuclear weapon, weapons. And, uh, like, uh, as a, a party to the NPT in the last um, what, 15, 13, 15 years, uh, they've made a number of statements in relation to their use of, a, of uranium. They announced in 1994 that they had uh, ceased production of fissile material for weapons. They have made substantial cuts in their nuclear weapon uh, build-up since uh, the Cold War with further reduction commitments which were agreed with the United States in the 2002 Moscow Treaty. Uh, 2002, uh, yeah, Moscow Treaty. All of Australia's bilateral nuclear safeguards agreements, which includes the existing 1990 Australia-Russia agreement, as well as the new agreement, require that Australia's consent must be obtained before Australian nuclear material can be transferred to a third country. And uh, I note that uh, that was uh, not particularly adverted to by, uh, by Senator Milne. And again, Russia, like all parties to the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, has committed to supply nuclear material to non-nuclear weapon states only for peaceful purposes. If uh, one is to look at Russia's record in the uh, Security Council, it's worth noting that Russia has supported international action against Iran's sensitive nuclear activities, including both Security Council Resolutions 1737 and 1747, which have imposed sanctions on certain activities, including Iran's enrichment-related and reprocessing activities. Regarding this particular motion, and uh, it seems to me that, uh, that, uh, that the motion is confusing a number of issues, but regarding this particular motion and the uh, comments that, uh, that it, or the uh, items that it raises in relation to uh, the implications of the agreement for the sale of nuclear fuel to India, they are, com they are separate, separate agreements, separate matters, and uh, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand where Senator Milne is uh, endeavouring to make the comparison. Russia, in signing the agreement, has, as I said, committed to abide by all of the agreement's uh, provisions. And uh, just to uh, clarify uh, for the record um, uh, in relation to uh, comments Senator Milne made during her remarks this afternoon, uh, I was indeed appalled by an observation that Senator Milne made, but not the ones relating to conditionality at all, and it would be, um, uh, it would be ridiculous to pretend that that was the case. What I was appalled by were the, uh, cavalier, was the cavalier manner in which Senator Milne chose to cast aspersions on our democratic rep uh, diplomatic, I'm sorry, representatives in this case, in this specific case, in uh, in Russia, and what they may or may not be doing, because it occurs to me, Mr. Acting Deputy President, Senator Milne is most unlikely to know, in fact, what they are or are not doing, and is even more unlikely to have made best endeavours to determine the answer to that question. So, reflecting on their role, reflecting on their job, without even bothering to do that, is, in my view, most ill-advised uh, in this chamber. I would also uh, say, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in relation to the other matters, the other very important matters of human rights which Senator Milne raised in her remarks and which I do not demur from for a moment in terms of their importance and in terms of issues which are currently under debate in relation to Russia, there are places, there are ways, there are opportunities in this chamber and in the committees of the parliament to deal with those matters. As I understand it, it was available to the minor parties to in fact join the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, and that opportunity was not taken up. That's a choice that they have made, not one uh, which I'm obliged to defend or otherwise, but other opportunities arise, and uh, I would commend those to the senators who, ha who have raised these concerns and encourage them to participate at that level. Further speakers, Senator Campbell. Mr. Acting Deputy President, 
I want to indicate briefly that Labour supports this reference to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. The reference gives the Parliament the opportunity to examine the details of the bilateral agreement signed by President Putin and Mr. Hard during APEC. Given that Russia is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Labour starts from a position of being open to sales of uranium to an NPT signatory. But Labour would certainly like to see Russia ratify the International Atomic Energy Agency's additional protocol, which it signed seven years ago. The additional protocol strengthens the inspections and safeguards regime. The committee's scrutiny of the agreement will be an important part of the process of detailed consideration. In particular, the reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee will provide the opportunity to examine the adequacy of safeguards being built into the agreement, domestic security issues relating to Russia and the importance of the IAEA additional protocol to the agreement. This is much the same process that was conducted with regard to the sale of uranium to China. Labour therefore supports this reference. Thank you. Further speakers? If there are no further speakers, oh, Senator Allison. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the Democrats also support this, uh, the terms of reference uh, put forward today uh, to examine Australia's deal with Russia. Um, the parliamentary oversight, which, is, uh, which Senator Payne suggests will be uh, provided through the Treaties Commission, we don't think is adequate. Uh, that committee doesn't typically uh, give a thorough examination to uh, the sorts of issues that have been already raised by Senator Milne and which I will raise as well. And uh, it's doubtful that that could be in any way a thorough uh, going over of this, uh, of this agreement. So why not refer it to a committee for uh, a proper examination? And I would also ask why it is that we have to have this deal with Russia right now. Um, this is a major departure from the previously cautious approach that Australia has taken to who gets to have its uranium. Um, so at the end of, a, of an electoral cycle, uh, why it is that suddenly this, this, uh, this agreement needs to be renegotiated and signed, I think is something of a mystery. And it's also it's also questionable whether, whether with an election looming, uh, even the treaty process which is being promised will have any effect at all. Now, the first point I want to make is that we're being sold something of a pup here because it's, uh, it's not clear to me how the government justifies that Russia needs our uranium. Uh, in fact, Russia has its own uranium uh, and uh, even if it were to install 30 reactors over the next 30 years, uh, there would be no need for us to rush into an agreement with Russia to rush into an agreement with Russia uh, to um, to hand over our uranium to them. They don't need it at this point in time. In fact, Russia has 700 tonnes of highly enriched uranium, which was extracted from the nuclear weapons that it dismantled um, in the 90s, and that highly enriched uranium is required to be mixed with, uh, with uranium in order to make a substance which uh, is then exported to other countries, notably the United States. So the real issue here seems to, to me to be uh, not so much that Russia needs our uranium, but that Russia needs our uranium so that it can pass, uh, pass a product uh, off to the United States. And in fact, the United States, at least half of the United States supply of uh, reactor fuel has been sourced from Russia over, the, over recent years. But there is, as I said, still 700 tonnes of highly enriched uranium sitting there. And not only that, but there are 10,000 weapons. Um, I might add that it, it's been said already that, uh, that Russia needs to be congratulated for reducing its, its armaments, uh, its nuclear weapons arsenal. Well, it did. It got rid of uh, the mostly obsolete weapons, uh, and uh, that presumably uh, didn't pose a problem. But it still holds 10,000 nuclear warheads, which is enough to, um, to probably blow up the planet as we know it. So the fact that Australia has not uh, taken this opportunity to leverage 
uh, out of Russia an agreement to a time frame within which it will dismantle the remainder of its weapons uh, is anyone's guess. And since the United States is to, stands to benefit from this deal, it would seem to me, then why not put some leverage on the United States as well? Um, these two major powers, together with the other weapon states, nuclear weapon states around the world, are ignoring the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which requires them to dis disarm. The deal was that countries that weren't nuclear weapon states would not take nuclear weapons up, provided the nuclear weapon states would begin a process of um, dismantling their weapons. And that's come to a standstill. Uh, there's been no progress in the United States, and as I said, while Russia is, um, has almost halved its nuclear weapons, there are still 10,000 remaining. Uh, and the other thing we should be pressing Russia to do is ratify the additional protocol of the IAEA. Now, why not do that? Here is a perfect opportunity to, uh, to make sure that the weapons inspection regime is, uh, is um, extended so that, so that the IAEA can properly supervise uh, uh, Russia's separation, so-called, of uh, peaceful and, um, and warlike activities and uses of uranium. Uh, so, again, this government has failed to do the right thing by, uh, uh, in terms of uh, security of this material. On human rights, similarly, the government has chosen to ignore the fact that the human rights regime, in fact the, uh, the compliance of the government itself to its own laws, has been appalling in recent years. Um, the radioactive polonium poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko uh, uh, is, uh, hit the world's papers and, and uh, the United Kingdom uh, is having grave difficulty in, in uh, prosecuting the, who it expects to be the KB, KGB agents responsible for his death, his awful death, I might say. And not only that, but um, uh, Senator Mill and I heard at a forum uh, just a couple of weeks ago that 14 journalists have been killed uh, by, uh, in, in the, who were dissidents, who were um, critics of the, of the Putin regime, have uh, somehow mysteriously lost their lives in violent circumstances. Garry Kasparov, um, former world champion chess player, says that uh, Russia urges Australia not to sell uranium to Russia, saying it has zero obedience to the rule of law. Um, we heard lots of evidence about the extent of the corruption in, in, uh, in Russia, which gives us no confidence whatsoever that there is, um, there is a chance that, that our uranium will be held secure. So it seems to me that, uh, that Russia wants to be a major supplier around the world of, um, of enriched uranium for use in nuclear reactors, and it's entitled to it's entitled to, to uh, wish to be in that situation, but the question is whether Australia should be uh, allowing this to happen. I note that uh, Senator Payne said that Russia will have to ask our permission to transfer radioactive material out of the country, but she doesn't say which countries are in and which countries are out. And since we're prepared to give uranium, sell uranium to China and to Russia and to India, one wonders what, what countries would actually be ruled out of this. Uh, is it okay to send it to North Korea, to, um, to Iran? I mean, um, can, when can we see a list of countries to whom Australia would approve the transfer of material which included our uranium. Um, it's not forthcoming now, and I somehow doubt that it would be in any, um, any short inquiry which was uh, um, taken on by the Treaties Commission, um, Committee. Rather. Uh, so, of course, our government claims that the uh, agreement will guarantee our yellow cake is uh, used purely for peaceful purposes, but it's hard to seriously believe that Australian officials are going to have access to Russia's facilities. It's just, um, it just defies all common sense. Um, and Russia is either unwilling or unable to stop nuclear material from getting into the hands of terrorists. We know that from 2001 to 2006 there were 183 reported trafficking incidents involving nuclear materials in the former Soviet Union. So why, um, <clears throat> why isn't the government insisting that 
uh, that the level of security over radioactive material is greatly enhanced so that we don't get any further um, examples of uh, a very lax security approach. Um, there is one way, of course, of guaranteeing that our uranium is only used to generate power, um, and that is to, as I said earlier, to insist on disarmament and non-proliferation. On both counts, Russia fails miserably. Like all other weapon states, Russia is actively engaged in nuclear rearmament. Uh, euphemism used by Russia is modernisation, um, as, as is used in other places, but what this means is, uh, is nastier, more powerful uh, nuclear weapons in, in, and uh, very few of the old arsenal being um, dismantled. Um, the Russia's nuclear weapons program still generates a lot of uh, international instability. Uh, President Putin recent, recently announced that his long-range bombers would resume for the first time since the 80s, their routine flight around the globe. And uh, plans are afoot, I understand, to double combat aircraft production by 2025 with more nuclear missiles. The fact that there is a build-up of nuclear weaponry around the world and Russia's dismantling of just a few thousand obsolete nukes in favour of these newer ones offers no comfort to the rest of the world. And Russia, like all other nuclear weapons states, flouts the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty every day. Um, most discussion about a nexus between nuclear trafficking and organised crime and terrorism is focused on the former Soviet Union, particularly Central Asia and the um, uh, Caucasus. According to the US-based Arms Control Association, these regions house a large number of insufficiently secured nuclear facilities in close proximity to the trafficking routes for drugs and small arms. Most trafficking is in low-grade nuclear material from medical and industrial facilities abandoned by the military. However, 10 of the known trafficking incidences uh, between 2001 and 6 involved highly enriched uranium. On three occasions, the uranium had an enrichment level greater than 80 per cent, making it suitable for uh, making a nu nuclear bomb. In 2002, Chechnyan uh, rebels stole nuclear material from a Russian nuclear power plant, and in 2003, two individuals attempted to acquire 15 kilograms of uranium, allegedly for using in a radioactive bomb to be detonated in St. Petersburg. Admittedly, proliferation significant cases where kilogram level quantities of weapons grade material are trafficked have dropped off since the 1990s, but the uh, absence of evidence in more recent cases is not evidence of absence. Investigations of trafficking in incidents usually focus solely on the seller of the uranium with no attempt to uncover wider networks. Communication between governments in the region is poor and many borders are unprotected because of internal disputes. Most customs officials aren't trained to realise the significance of trafficking in nuclear materials. Now, all of uh, this evidence is well known to uh, the Australian government, so it can't claim ignorance here. Uh, the deal with Russia, which seems to be in its final stages, carries very grave risks to responsible government uh, that no responsible government should find acceptable. And uh, again, I find it amazing that Mr Howard is mystified at uh, how poor his polling is right now. And uh, perhaps he needs to reflect on the fact that his willingness to uh, sell Australian uranium to almost any country that asks for it might have something to do with that. So, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, this does need uh, much more significant oversight than uh, is being uh, allowed, and I urge the government to, in the interests of uh, transparency and of um, uh, global security, for this to be referred to a committee for a significant inquiry, not one that uh, starts and stops in five minutes, but one that can uh, take a thorough look and hear the evidence from those who are expert in this field. Um, uh, Senator Payne said that the Treaties Commission will depend on the sitting schedule. Well, yes, that's the problem, and that's why we need to delay this agreement and wait until uh, there has been a proper inquiry that, that um, any senator who wishes to be uh, part of can take, um, take an interest and um, inform themselves of the issues. So the Democrats strongly support this, um, this uh, reference to committee. 
uh, of this treaty and uh, hope that the government will reconsider. Senator Milne. Uh, I thank members for their contribution and I express my disappointment that the government is not going to support a reference uh, to the Foreign Affairs Committee to investigate this. And, uh, I still didn't get confirmation from the government that this process is not going to be uh, assessed by, until the middle of next year through an appropriate process. All we had is it depends on the sitting schedule. And the worst thing that could happen, of course, is if the government uh, decides to rush this through in the dying days of this uh, administration. Senator Payne stood up here and uh, was sounded outraged about the idea that the government wasn't taking into account human rights. Well, it's not. All she said was she is confident that the Russians will uphold the commitments they've made in this agreement. Well, I haven't made any commitments in this agreement, Mr Acting Deputy President, not one in relation to democracy or human rights, not one. So to uphold an agreement they haven't made, well, you know, it's just a ridiculous notion. It's about attempting to pretend that the government is doing anything other than entering into a pure and simple trade agreement to maximise profits and not taking the opportunity to tie this to an additionality, the additional protocol, but also additional uh, clauses which would be consistent with Australia's promotion of human rights on a global and regional level and send a clear signal to the Russian Federation that Australia expects its trade partners to adhere to certain standards. And closely linked would be the value of human rights and democracy and the rule of law, without which Australia cannot have any assurance that Russia will in good faith adhere to the principles of the agreement and which is central to the integrity of the safeguards and verification standards which Australia gives such weight to. Why wouldn't we include promotion and protection and respect of human rights and democratic values in such an agreement. Well, I would put it to you, Mr Acting Deputy President, the reason we wouldn't is we have no confidence the Russians would uphold it, and it would mean that if they didn't, we would have to therefore suspend the agreement because a breach of relevant conditions has taken place. And they wouldn't want to do that because they wouldn't want to disrupt the profits flowing into those companies. Now, I think this is a really important issue. Australia ought to take into account the sort of behaviour in the countries we do business with. Otherwise, how is the international community ever going to promote democracy and human rights unless we make our trade conditional upon it? Otherwise, you're just saying we will turn a blind eye to what is going on in your country, we'll just trade and then we'll just let you get away with whatever you like in terms of human rights and democracy standards. Senator Payne also stood up and said that um, there was some confusion in the motion because I'd talked about India and this is a deal with Russia, which just demonstrates why you need a Senate inquiry. So let me explain to Senator Payne and to Senator Brandis, who are not in the chamber, Mr Acting Deputy President why this has relevance to the India deal. And let me explain it this way. The India-Russia agreement and Australia's declaration that it too would sell uranium to India is, uh, is all very well until you get to the point where if India has a nuclear test, then the US agreement will be suspended. And so too would any agreement by Australia to sell uranium to India. But India wants a guaranteed supply. So what will it do? It will sign up to the Russian agreement as well, and that means in the event that its supply is cut off from Australia and the US directly, it can get that enriched uranium it needs from Russia. And furthermore, in the US-India agreement, there is, a, there is an arrangement whereby, if it is suspended, India has to return to the US a certain volume of nuclear fuel. Russia could provide that to India to give back to the US and continue exactly as it plans. And how will it get the uranium in Russia in order to give it back to India, to give back to the US? It will get it because Australia will be piling the uranium into Russia and have it enriched. Now, we've heard from the government, oh, it won't be Australian uranium that goes to any other facility. Well, everybody knows you cannot trace uranium. Once it goes into a facility, it becomes part of the mass in that facility. And that is why the way they measure uranium is simply by volumes. You have to prove you've displaced this much volume or sent this volume somewhere else. That is the link that Senator Payne 
did not understand. And in fact, the Indians understand it very well, as do the Russians. In this particular document that uh, I can cite here, Mr Acting Deputy President, it says the main assurance that the initiative should provide is that a country complying with its non-proliferation commitments must be sure that whatever the turn of events, whatever changes take place in the international situation, it will receive the services guaranteed to it. That's the Russians telling the Indians that part of the deal is that whatever changes happen, they'll guarantee the supply. And the Indian, the Indian interpretation is this. In the event of an Indian test, the US law banning nuclear exports would become operative, and so would the domestic legislations of other potential suppliers such as France, Australia, Canada or the UK, as it happened after the 1998 Pochran tests. However, if India becomes a party to the Russian project, the IUEC could become the source for fuel to be returned to the US for the statute of the IUEC only says that its services would be available to any partnering country complying with its non-proliferation uh, commitments. Further, there is no Russian law that prevents nuclear exports in the event of a nuclear test, as is evident from the Russian project, etc. etc. So what we have here clearly is a mechanism by which the Russians will be the backstop for the Indians in the event that the Indians do go ahead with their nuclear tests and they have said it is part of their undertaking that they will. That the US, the US agreement and Australia giving uranium to them will not be subject to them not going ahead with nuclear tests. So all Australia is doing is not only providing promising to provide uranium to India, but now, with this Russian agreement, is sending more uranium to Russia, where it will be enriched and sent on to third parties, as it is currently. And President Putin has come out and said not only have the Russians provided the technology for the Iranian reactor, but at the very weekend they were negotiating here in Australia, they announced the timetable for the transfer of enriched fuel from Russia to Iran, to that reactor. And as we stand here today, details are just emerging about the Israeli flyover of Syria just recently, a hugely significant international incident that was played down because it was so serious. And why did the Israelis overfly Syria? Because of a shipment from North Korea heading to Syria. This was a major international incident just in the last uh, couple of weeks. So that is the kind of world that Australia is saying we are happy to sell our uranium into and we are not even prepared to put a caveat on the deals we do saying this agreement is conditional upon upholding laws pertaining to human rights, democracy and the rule of law. If Australia doesn't stand for human rights, democracy and the rule of law, what do we stand for? apart from maximising profits to companies that donate heavily to political parties? What else do we stand for? Where is our standing globally? We've abandoned multilateralism. We've abandoned international conventions, it seems. We've given up on the Geneva Convention because we supported Guantanamo Bay. We've given up on the Refugee Convention. We've trashed the World Heritage Convention when it suits us. Whichever way you look, we see multilateralism Overturned, and last week we saw Australia voting against a United Nations uh, resolution in relation to Indigenous rights. Week in, week out, Australia stands for less and less in the global community. This agreement with Russia must be scrutinised appropriately by the parliament. And I do not have any confidence, having heard from the government, that that is going to be the case. And I hope Senator Payne and Senator Brandis, Mr Acting Deputy President, may be listening to what I'm saying. And it may actually interest them that they didn't even understand when they voted against this last week and that they're busy supporting the Prime Minister's arrangements. They didn't even understand the link with the India deal. They didn't understand that they're actually facilitating India moving on full on with its nuclear program. And they busily stand here and say they're confident Russia will uphold the agreement because there is no provision in it for the rule of law, for human rights or for democracy. And I feel ashamed that Australia is not taking the opportunity to be a global leader as we watch so many countries retreat from democracy. Why aren't we making those conditions? And as I said, I would hope 
that the Labor Party in government will see its way clear to have a really good look at, at both uh, uh, this uh, Australia uranium and Russia deal and repudiate it, and the same thing with the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership that Australia signed up to last night that we had to find out about through the Times of India because Prime Minister Howard is apparently ashamed to be telling Australians that last night he signed up to President Bush's deal while in Europe. And you have to read what goes on in nuclear countries in order to find out what he's up to. The Canadians didn't sign because they're worried about having to become a global nuclear waste dump. What has Australia signed up to last night in Europe? And so I would like to hear that the uh, Labor Party in government would repudiate both of these deals, but that at the very least that we get a commitment that Australia reasserts itself on the global stage as an upholder of human rights, an upholder of the rule of law, an upholder of decency in global and in international negotiations. Otherwise, we are no better than a lot of the other states we condemn at various times. We're not taking the opportunities that we are uh, afforded. And how must it feel for the Russian dissidents to watch the Australian government shaking hands with President Putin, knowing that journalists have been murdered, knowing that, that human rights campaigners are in psychiatric asylums as I speak? How must they feel when the news goes back into the state-owned TV and the state-owned newspapers that President Putin is legitimised and hailed as a great trading partner in Australia when they are asking to help them to repudiate deals and to expose what President Putin is doing in Russia by suppressing freedom of speech, suppressing the political democracy movement? That is what is going on in that country, and if the government doesn't know it, it's because they choose not to know it. Because any cursory examination of what's going on in Russia today will tell you that President Putin is taking that country back to the KGB days, the FSB rules, and uh, I hope now we can see Senator McGoran go back and start reading about those Russian apartment bombings and what's going on in Chechnya and find that President Putin's hands are not clean in relation to fomenting uh, uprisings and in order to go in and suppress and jail and go back to punitive psychiatry. And I think when we uh, review the period of his uh, presidency in Russia, we're going to see just how rapidly he took that country backwards and how Australia turned a blind eye to our shame. And uh, so, Mr Deputy President, I uh, move for this inquiry. The question is the motion moved by Senator Milne in relation to a reference to a Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee uh, inquiry be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the no's have it. No. Do they? Ring the bells, division required.
Okay. All right. Okay, lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Milne be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Weber teller for the ayes and Senator Joyce teller for the noes. Order. As a result of the division, there being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The Senate stands adjourned until 7. Sorry, sorry. The Senate sta is suspended. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until 7:30 p.m. Clark. Business of the Senate, order of the day number one, report of the Economics Committee to be presented. Senator Ronaldson. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. Um, I present an input report of the Economics Committee concerning two bill uh, inquiries and seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Granted. Leave is granted. Senator Ronaldson. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate adopt the uh, recommendation of the report. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I do just want to uh, say one. A uh, quick matter on behalf of the, uh, uh, of the committee, and I see Senator Murray in the, the chamber tonight. Um, uh, our 
colleague, uh, Senator Fielding, was reported over the weekend uh, and today as um, having concern about uh, the lack of public hearings in relation to his uh, uh, bill, which is the uh, uh, subject of the, uh, uh, the first matter of, uh, of this motion. And I just wanted to clarify it for the uh, benefit of the, uh, of the Senate, uh, and I have the uh, leave of my committee to uh, uh, disclose and publish uh, the minutes of our meeting on the 12th of September, uh, if required, and I uh, am requiring that, of course, tonight. I just wanted to uh, indicate quite clearly to the, uh, uh, to the chamber that it was always the intention of uh, the Economics Committee that uh, there would be public hearings in relation to, uh, to this matter. Uh, and indeed, we, uh, we facilitated uh, uh, that with various motions to allow that to happen. The committee had a choice, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, as to whether uh, we would uh, uh, table this report today based on submissions or whether we would uh, uh, table an interim report uh, and have the matter adjourned to a later uh, a reporting date to a later date uh, to facilitate Senator Fielding in relation to, uh, to that. Uh, it was the uh, unanimous view of the, uh, of the remainder of the committee uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, that uh, the committee members would not be available. And I will quote from the, uh, <coughs> quote from the minutes. Uh, all members of the committee advised that they would not be available for public hearings of this matter during the sitting period uh, or before the election. And uh, Senator ba uh, Bernardi suggested holding hearings after the election. And uh, on the motion of Senator Bernardi and Secretary Senator Stevens, the committee agreed that public hearings not be held in this bill until after the election period. Now, the matter was, uh, was deferred in the terms of the, uh, of the motion before the Senate at the moment uh, to accommodate uh, those public hearings, and I have uh, every expectation as the uh, chair of the committee that those public hearings will take place. Senator Murray. I rise, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, to support the remarks uh, of the chair. Uh, with respect to availability for hearings during this week uh, and indeed last week, uh, I'll indicate that my own legislative schedule is very heavy. Um, to the, on today's notice paper, for instance, I have one, two, three, four, five, six bills. Um, and that's the way it is for me every day of the week, so I can't uh, attend a hearing. And we all know it's an election period. Of course, if it was a government bill that was urgent and had to be passed this week, a um, uh, committee report uh, might have had to be brought down. Uh, but this is not a bill which will carry urgency. It is not a bill which will be considered this, this uh, sitting. So it is preferable, if the bill is to be properly examined, that it be examined when there is time uh, and the personnel available to examine it. Um, so uh, it, it, frankly, has happened in the past that uh, committee inquiries have happened without hearings. In my own memory, I think in the recent last 12 months, probably two or three economics bills alone have been dealt with on that basis. Um, but in this case, of course, uh, a hearing was desired and will be accommodated. It just won't be accommodated this week or in the forthcoming weeks. Uh, so I just want to support uh, the chair with, with those remarks. The question is then that the motion uh, moved by Senator Ronaldson be agreed to. Those in that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mac Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the intervening business be postponed till after the consideration of Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Democratic Plebiscites, Bill 2007. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those in that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of day number two, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Democratic Plebiscites Bill 2017 Committee. Right, so is it the uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Uh, there's no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the uh, bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Well, that, no, we didn't no. put that question. Sorry. Yet. 
Oh, right. Sorry. Murray. Senator Murray, my apologies. You can say wakey wakey to me too. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, I, I uh, have a circulated amendment, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and I'll uh, note that I will also be moving Senator Bartlett's uh, circulated amendment. Uh, so. Uh, just for the notice of the chair. I, I refer to uh, Amendment 5368, <clears throat> and I have uh, asked uh, that the Senate consider um, that the conduct of plebiscites in communities in which a nuclear facility is to be established, um, a non-binding plebiscite, I might say, uh, be considered. A and the uh, Chamber would be proper in asking me, well, why would you need to do that when the bill itself is not specific as to um, plebiscites that may be conducted? Uh, any plebiscite can be conducted. But of course, the explanatory memorandum is specific, uh, and we know that the explanatory memorandum has uh, weight in these matters. The explanatory memorandum refers to local government amalgamations uh, and the purpose of this bill is in fact to allow for, for uh, plebiscites on local council amalgamations. So if that hadn't been the case of the explanatory memorandum, if it simply had been left open-ended, uh, I would have, um, uh, have expected that uh, nuclear facilities or any other plebiscite that a local council or uh, anyone else wanted to conduct uh, could occur. Uh, these matters um, are particularly sensitive, uh, and I'm not prejudging the matter. There may well be shires and councils that would like a nuclear facility. I seem to recall in, in my own state of Western Australia that there is a shire who are happy to have uh, nuclear waste uh, stored for their state uh, in their shire. So, you know, the people aren't automatically against these things. Um, but there are people who are very sensitive about uh, nuclear waste dumps or uh, about uh, nuclear researchers uh, being cited near them. Uh, and I think it's appropriate that in view of the sensitivity of this issue, uh, of the very strong feelings uh, many members of the community have about this issue, uh, that we make it explicit that uh, plebiscites and communities in which a nuclear facility is to be established will be conducted. I so move, uh, and I'll move items one and two by leave Would together. You, Senator Murray, you'd be seeking leave to uh, move those two items together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting uh, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, I should say. Um, Labor will be supporting these amendments, um, primarily because it's consistent to support an amendment that gives effect to the view we expressed in our second reading amendment that Labor does believe that communities ought to have the right to have a say with respect to <coughs> nuclear facilities, be they nuclear reactors or indeed the location for nuclear waste. And uh, In particular, in relation to the 25 nuclear power plants uh, that the Howard government wants to impose on the Australian community. Um, we believe that the location of nuclear facilities has a long-lasting and, and possibly irreversible impact on communities and these special circumstances that are uh, quite extraordinary um, do raise, que uh, raise questions of public policy that are certainly uh, out of the ordinary and warrant this attention. Labor believes that if the Howard government were um, fair income about empowering local communities, and we've heard a lot of comment about that in the context of this bill, um, they would empower local communities to have a plebiscite on this matter. And, uh, and we think this um, stands as quite a strong test uh, for the government as to their credibility about their sincerity on this issue. Uh, it certainly came up along with many other uh, ideas about what plebiscites could be used for in the course of the Senate inquiry. Uh, but this issue was a particular standout because, after all, it's the Howard government that's placed this issue firmly on the agenda for local communities. And we know, uh, for the record, we know that many government backbenchers are opposed to the location of nuclear facilities in their own electorates. And I would expect that many of them would indeed support the prospect of allowing those communities to have a plebiscite. And we have good reason to be concerned because there's a great deal of history of coalition governments considering sites. Uh, for nuclear reactors, dating right back to 1969 when the then Liberal government considered a number of sites 
including Jarvis Bay, which is part of my electorate, part of the ACT electorate, on the coast close to Nowra, uh, the Murrumbidgee River between Williamsdale and Thawa, and Paddy's River in the ACT, Bass Point in the electorate of Eden Monero, and the Hawkesbury Riverside at Spencer, which is in the electorate of Robertson. Then in 1981, the Coalition's Government National Energy Advisory Committee considered sites in Perth, Adelaide, Tasmania and Darwin to be suitable for nuclear reactors. In July 1997, a Cabinet submission signed off, on the, signed off by the then Minister for Science and Technology, Peter McGoran, now the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, the Government considered sites in uh, Goulburn Holsworthy, the Mount Lofty Ranges in the electorate of Mayo in Adelaide, the River and Lakes region of South Australia. Olympic Dam in the electorate of Grey in South Australia, Woomera, uh, the electorate of O'Connor in Western Australia and the electorate of Pearce in Western Australia, the electorate of Brand in Western Australia and Canning uh, and indeed over in Broken Hill, Mount Isa and Darwin. And on ABC Radio on June the 5th in 2006, um, Ian Smith, the head of ANSTO, Mr Ian Smith, considered four to five nuclear power plants on the east coast of Australia with the feasibility study by the Uranium Enrichment Group for the Fraser government considered Western Australia, Queensland and South Australia to all have suitable sites. And there, there's a whole range of dates. Um, I'm sorry, May 2006, the Australia Institute identified Western Port Bay in Victoria, Port Stephens in Paterson in New South Wales, the central coast of New South Wales, areas south of Wollongong around the electorate of Gilmore, the Sunshine Coast in the electorate of Fairfax in Queensland, Port Phillip Bay in Corangamite in Victoria, and Portland in the electorate of Wannan in Victoria. In October 16, 2006, Clarence Hardy, the Vice President of the Pacific Nuclear Council, identified the Gold Coast, Brisbane, Gladstone, Townsville, Newcastle, Cessnock and Perth. So we know the coalition has formed when it comes to um, basically four decades of advocating nuclear reactors, four decades of being determined to have them imposed on local communities. So I call on the coalition to be consistent with respect to at least allowing this, and I concur with Senator Murray's interpretation, while the bill itself is not specific about its application to amalgamations. That is certainly the appropriate interpretation, therefore justifying this particular amendment um, to be inserted. Uh, into um, into this bill, so I, um, as I said, will be supporting Labor. Will be supporting this amendment, and we commend it to the Senate. Senator Colby. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the government won't be supporting the amendments, um, but the legislation is to uh, allow the plebiscites to take place, and also to stop state governments, uh, in this case the Queensland State Labor government, from legislating against plebiscites. Uh, uh, there's been some focus by the opposition in respect of uh, nuclear plebiscites uh, and I think almost successfully ne managed to name nearly uh, every electorate in the country, um, obviously as part of a scare campaign, but the Prime Minister has quite clearly said there will be plebiscites uh, in respect of nuclear facilities and I think that's uh, quite reasonable that that occurs. So the, the Prime Minister has quite clearly put that on the, t on the table. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the AEC n actually now has the um, ability, legislative ability to conduct plebiscites on any issue uh, on a FIFA uh, service basis. So there's nothing to stop these uh, plebiscite of that nature going ahead and the government won't be supporting the uh, amendment. The question is then that uh Amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 5368, moved by Senator Murray, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. Noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that Democrats amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 5368 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Kirk teller for the ayes, Senator Nash teller for the noes. There being 31 ayes, 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The Senate's considering the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Democratic Plebiscites Bill 2007. Senator Murray, I understand you are moving the next lot of amendments since Thank you, Madam seeking Deputy leave to move I, one I was two uh, just getting some advice from the esteemed Senator Boswell, who said local government need this uh, bill and we must get on with it. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, I'm going to uh, ask by leave to move items one and two that Senator Burt Bartlett uh, circulated on sheet 5375. Is, uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, th these amendments uh, from Senator Bartlett uh, arise from, um, uh, from the extensive debates that have been had with respect to the emergency intervention in the Northern Territory with respect to Indigenous matters. And, um, Oh, my apologies, Madam Chair. I need to ask by leave to move all three amendments together. I notice that 1AFC um, refers to the item three. You just, Senator Murray, all three amendments. I've only got. Yes. I'll, I'll, I've only got uh, two. On, are we on sheet five, three, seven, five, revised two? Ah, that's probably my problem. Can somebody bring me that? I'm sorry, it isn't my amendment, so I don't have one ready to hand. 
Uh, no, I, I, don't, I understand that you're not moving Senator Allison's amendment, are you? But right. Senator Bartlett's amendment. Right. Uh, I've been assisted by Senator Brown. My apologies, these, these weren't mine. Now I know where I am. So I'm moving items one and two by leave together. We're all okay on that. Yes. Now, what I'm uh, arguing for here with respect to Senator Bartlett, uh, that if you accept that it was an emergency and emergency intervention had to occur, nevertheless, there is strong uh, community feeling. Uh, about this matter. Senator Bartlett has advised me he sat next to a very senior um, uh, member of the coalition who advised him that he'd visited seven uh, indigenous communities and all seven were strongly in favour of uh, the government's uh, intervention. And that being the case, of course, uh, a, a plebiscite such as being suggested here uh, would not automatically have a negative result. It may well have a positive result, so I do not um, necessarily presume uh, that, that a plebiscite uh, would have a neg negative result. Unlike uh, local government plebiscites in Queensland, where I do expect uh, many of them uh, to express a contrary view to what the state government has proposed. This, um, uh, this matter uh, uh, arises really because if it is the view of the coalition uh, that uh, communities and shires and councils in, in uh, Queensland uh, are entitled to have their say with respect to a matter uh, which affects uh, their local government. Um, I think, uh, and we think, uh, the Democrats, that the same uh, principle should apply with respect to Aboriginal communities and townships in the Northern Territory. Um, it would simply be uh, uh, be unacceptable for uh, the principle to apply in one and not the other. Now, once again, uh, the government may argue, well, yes, a plebiscite could be held. There is nothing in the legislation which prohibits it. Uh, again, I say that this has been put forward by us deliberately because, unfortunately, the explanatory memorandum only uh, refers to the plebiscites in the context of local government amalgamations. Uh, and uh, we wish to make it clear that in a matter of high contention, uh, of great drama and of uh, uh, the granting of very considerable powers, uh, we do believe uh, that the Aboriginal communities and townships in Northern Territory should be aware, through legislation, uh, that they can run a non-binding plebiscite uh, with respect to the National Emergency Response Act 2007. So I so move those items one and two on 5375, revised two. Senator Lundy. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Labor won't be supporting this or the remaining amendments. Um, we believe that Senator Murray's initial amendments relating to nuclear facilities effectively encapsulated the view put forward by Labor in our second reading amendment, but these other amendments don't. Uh, our policies and approach to a form of cooperative federalism, we believe, will lead to great benefits of working together with local communities and effectively empowering them along with the general right of the AEC to conduct uh, plebiscites. Um, but for the purposes of the remaining debate, we won't be supporting these amendments. Senator Goldwick. Thanks, Chair. The government doesn't uh, support the amendments, and I um, again note Senator Murray's uh, insight into the thinking of, go of the government. Um, the uh, government doesn't believe it's appropriate for the Electoral Commission to have its core functions extended to require it to conduct specific plebiscites on specific matters that are not re related to the core business of, uh, of the AEC, so it doesn't support the amendment. The yeah, question is then that the uh, amendments one and two on uh, sheet 5375, revised two, moved by uh, Senator Murray be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the next amendment I have, and hopefully I've got uh, the final copy. Um, is uh, moved by Senator Allison, and I ask uh, that sheet 5385. I ask by leave that items one to three be moved together. So granted. Leave is granted. Senator Murray. 
I move those uh, amendments, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and in motivating them, I, I will give uh, an indication uh, that a legislative note uh, explains major infrastructure projects which uh, are um, the subject matter of these amendments. It says uh, examples of major infrastructure projects include a dam, a desalination plant, a pulp mill, a nuclear facility and harbour dredging. That is not an exha exhaustive list, obviously. Uh, and the intention is to indicate to the community at large um, that issues which the community, uh, any community, considers to be uh, of great importance to them uh, should be uh, capable of being subject to a uh, non-binding plebiscite so that the community as a whole can express their opinion uh, about such matters. I know, for instance, uh, a desalination plant in different cities uh, has different reactions. In Perth, our desalination plant is really strongly supported. Um, it, uh, and I might add that I'm one of the supporters. Uh, it acts in a reserve capacity uh, and it is powered uh, through wind power. And once that wind power argument uh, was made, the community was happy because the thing they were most concerned with uh, was not uh, the conversion of seawater into uh, potable water, but uh, the excessive energy use involved. Um, whereas I'm well aware that in other parts of the country, um, desalination plants uh, which don't have that uh, background are highly controversial. Similarly with pulp mills, uh, I, I am a, uh, personally I'm a supporter of pulp mills uh, being established in Australia, um, but I'm a supporter of those pulp mills uh, which have the lowest energy use, uh, the least environmental impact, uh, and are accepted in the community they, they're in. I've been uh, intrigued by the arguments in, in Tasmania. Uh, I found the argument against uh, the pulp mill that's proposed to the Tamil Valley um, uh, persuasive uh, on my reading of it. Uh, I've found the arguments for uh, a different sort of pulp mill in Braddon uh, much more persuasive. Um, uh, now, I don't claim to be an expert, but the point is that I think in a desalination plant in Sydney or a pulp mill in Braddon or Bass uh, or, or uh, harbour dredging in, in, uh, in Melbourne are all the kind of topics and subjects which should be open to, to plebiscites. Uh, once again, uh, we raise this not because we think the bill excludes them. Uh, on the face of that bill, any plebiscite is possible. We raise it because the explanatory memorandum seemed to be uh, exclusive, uh, and that's why we're, we're putting these up uh, on the precautionary principle, you might say, but also uh, to make the point uh, that we would like to encourage communities to have a more direct say uh, in matters of great moment, such as infrastructure projects. I so move. The question is then that uh, Senator Colby. Thank you, Chair. Um, government notes the uh, intention of the Democrats with respect of the, uh, the amendments, um, but again won't be supporting the, uh, the, the amendments. Um, I think we've made it clear in respect of our, the previous amendments in what our position is. But do note with respect of the pulp mill, for example, there already has been one elected plebiscite that's being held, and I'm aware of another one that's planned. Uh, so there quite clearly exists the capacity for these types of plebiscites to occur at the moment, uh, and in that circumstance the government doesn't support the uh, amendment. Senator Problem here because, um, Madam Chair, Senator Colbeck is saying that uh, he supports municipal councils in Queensland being given assistance by the Electoral Commission, but he opposes municipal councils in Tasmania getting that assistance which is quite extraordinary for a Tasmanian senator. Of course, um, the amendment deserves support. Uh, if the government, as it, as it does in this legislation, says that people ought to have a say in amalgamations of councils in Queensland, um, which is about governance and people's opinion to decide on governance, then surely they ought to be decided 
able to decide whether they ought to have a dam which is going to eliminate their property totally from uh, existence or a desalination plant which is going to radically change uh, their environment or a pulp mill which in the case of the Tamar Valley is going to, um, according to the Australian Medical Association, increase the death rate of people, the 100,000 people living in that valley. Uh, according to the vineyards and owners and many small businesses are going to impact negatively on their businesses. According to the um, people fishing Bass Strait will uh, threaten their livelihoods. And uh, according to uh, many other people is going to be a negative for Tasmania, including the Business Roundtable report showing a $3 billion hit on other businesses. Shouldn't people have a say about that? Well, Senator Colbeck and the government say no. We say yes, under the same circumstances. And of course then there's the government's proposal, the Prime Minister's proposal indeed, for 25 nuclear power stations coming down the line. Would people not have a say on that? Um, Senator Colbeck and the government might say no, citizens shouldn't be uh, supported in deciding that. Um, on governance, yes, but on the safety of their neighbourhood, no. And harbour dredging, which uh, clearly uh, the case in point at the moment is Port Phillip Bay, where there is um, a remarkable marine environment at stake. Uh, but not just that, the potential for toxic metals being uh, lifted off the floor of the harbour and put into the bay environment, uh, I have to part company with the government in feeling that's not a matter people should have a say in, which is as important as uh, their municipal boundaries. It is important to the people of Queensland that they have a say, but it's important to people uh, in these other cases that they also have a, a say. And there's, it's a uh, patent hypocrisy, uh, and it draws the political um, impulse that uh, is behind this legislation right to the fore that the government says, yes, uh, on the matter of governance, people should be assisted to have a referendum, but when it comes to their livelihood, their neighbourhood, their businesses, their well-being, their health, their ability to stay alive, uh, and so on, they shouldn't have a say. What nonsense. And of course, we'll support this amendment. Senator McDonald. Let me check uh, what this bill about is not whether you can have a vote on, uh, on amalgamations or nuclear reactors uh, or anything. It's all about the Queensland government actually deciding that if you wanted to have a say on local government futures, you'd be thrown in jail. That's what it's about. And the Commonwealth legislation that we're debating, and the previous contribution uh, bears no relationship to the bill whatsoever, uh, simply says Queensland was going to legislate to make it a criminal offence to have a say on local government boundaries. You could have a say on nuclear reactors, you could have a say on power stations, you could have a say on anything in Queensland. But if you had a say on local government futures, you'd be thrown in jail. That's what the bill is about. And it's important as we deal with these uh, amendments that we keep in mind, we keep the reality in mind on what this bill is about. And for the uh, sake of uh, repeating myself, and we're not on broadcast, but it is very important to understand a government of Australia said if you want to have a plebiscite, if you, the council, who we're going to abolish or amalgamate, if you, the council, want to have a say, if you have the temerity to even suggest that the people involved should have a say, then you'll be fined, and if you don't pay the fine, you'll be thrown into jail. Everywhere else in Australia, if you want to vote on nuclear reactors, and indeed, on that point, uh, Senator Brown, the Prime Minister has clearly stated that there will be a binding plebiscite on that particular issue when it happens in 30 or 40 years' time, and it won't happen before then. But this bill, this bill is about a government taking away a right 
This bill overrode a state government who said you cannot have that right on pain of being thrown into jail. That's what this bill is about, not about the matters the previous speaker spoke of. Senator Brown. Well, in Tasmania, um, and if I'm not wrong, supported by the Liberals, there is a law which says you cannot have a plebiscite on fluoridation of water. And uh, the governments let that one go by. By law, if you hold a plebiscite on fluoridation of water in Tasmania, you go to jail. Is the, uh, I asked Senator Macdonald, will he support an amendment, if I put it up now, removing that stricture from the law books or overriding that stricture from the law books in Tasmania? Because logic says he will have to. Question is then, question is that the uh, amendments moved by uh, Senator Murray, uh, amendments one to three on sheet 5385 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Is division required? Ring the bells. We're trying to. Mm. Any so which, which <laughs> <laughs>
Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that Democrats' amendments 1 to 3 on sheet 5385 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes uh, and Senator Parry teller for the noes. Order. There being six ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Senator Hawk. Uh, Senator Brown, we're dealing Thanks. with your amendments now. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, uh, on behalf of the Australian Greens, I move amendments 1, 2 and 3 on sheet 5386. So is, uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Brown? The, um, these amendments provide for a plebiscite to be taken at the next election on uh, the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. We um, know that the Howard government has determined not to ratify this global treaty, which is the first step towards global, further global moves to protect the planet from the imminent catastrophe of climate change. Uh, we're also aware from opinion polls in this country, which have been funded by Greenpeace and other organisations, that 80 per cent of Australians want the Kyoto Protocol ratified by this nation and that the government has less than 20 per cent support in its refusal to take this country in with the rest of the community of nations in um, ratifying Kyoto Protocol, although in 1997, when Senator Hill was Minister for the Environment, Australia agreed to sign the, pro the protocol in Kyoto. The protocol came into being in 2002. I was in Kyoto for that, the ceremony marking that, and uh, it's simply been a travesty of uh, the um, democratic system we have that the government shut its, its uh, ear to the vast majority of Australians in wanting this protocol ratified by our country. So here we have the ability to test that public opinion at the <coughs> forthcoming federal election. It would involve the government being able to write a submission in support of not signing Kyoto Protocol <coughs> and the opposition <coughs> being writing a submission uh, in support of the Kyoto Protocol. And we've put that into the amendment because um, opposition leader 
Kevin Rudd has made it clear that the opposition is in favour of ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, as are the Greens and the Democrats. So it would be, it can rapidly be done. It would be a, a first use of, perhaps a first use, if a Queensland local government entity didn't uh, get there first, of the, um, the powers that are paraded in this legislation and it would show the bona fides of the government in wanting uh, uh, this indeed to be a Democrat plebiscite bill on a matter which affects every Australian, their children and their grandchildren. The question is then that uh, Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. Um, the government doesn't support uh, the amendment. Um, the people of Australia will obviously, as Senator Brown's indicated, get the opportunity to cast their uh, vote in respect of this at the election, given that there is a difference of policy. So um, the government doesn't see the need, to, as we've said before, to inject um, specific uses or specific uh, tasks to the AEC that uh, aren't as core business. The question is then that uh, Senator Lunding. Thank you, um, Madam Chairman. Um, look, it is, of course, the policy of Labor's to um, uh, ratify the Kyoto Protocol, and this um, amendment doesn't change that in any way. But I'd like to take this, um, and we won't be supporting this amendment, but I'd like to just uh, take this opportunity to reflect on the issue of constitutional recognition, which was also the subject of a second reading amendment and uh, intimately linked in with the issue of the rights of communities to have, say, have a say th through plebiscites for amalgamations. Um, uh, before I do that, just um, take uh, Senator Macdonald's um, exhortations to the, the Senate this evening about the Beattie government and just remind Senator Macdonald, as I know he already knows, that of course the Beattie government have overturned those uh, provisions which sought to penalise councillors engaging in plebiscites. That's clear. Uh, as I mentioned in my second reading speech, it also um, means that the uh, original motivation for this legislation is relatively moot. Nonetheless, Labor feels strongly about this issue. That's why we're supporting these bills. Uh, but there is uh, one issue I wanted to place on the record because uh, in the moving of a second reading amendment last week, uh, Labor very clearly um, expressed the view uh, that um, we ought to um, collectively, um, not just the Labor Party, but all parties ought to support the push for constitutional recognition of local government. And um, senators opposite were given the opportunity to vote on that in our second reading amendment. They chose to oppose that um, second reading amendment, once again formally uh, stating the coalition's view that they don't support constitutional recognition of local government. And yet we heard um, last Friday Mr Vale um, reportedly told a local government conference in Queensland that he supported constitutional recognition. So I think that he ought to explain to the House and perhaps convey to his representatives in the Senate um, his explanation for voting against that issue again. They did last year as well on the 17th of October but just last week in this place voted against constitutional recognition and then go out into the electorate and say they support it. Um, and I know the National Party's um, quite famous for um, um, you know, saying one thing in the electorate and doing another in Parliament, but this is a, a very obvious and classic case of being a line in the electorate on the issue of constitutional recognition of local government and a complete sheep uh, to the Liberal Party, who obviously opposes this um, policy, uh, in the Parliament. So I think um, I think we're all, we're all owed, and particularly local councillors around the country and Queensland are owed an explanation as to why the National Party say one thing uh, in Parliament and another thing out in the electorate. And um, this seems to be a, a perfect opportunity to provide that explanation. I suspect that Mr. Vale probably wasn't aware that we hadn't concluded this debate when he made those public statements, as I know it was the full expectation. 
of um, local government, indeed, that this bill would have um, managed to traverse the um, challenges of the, the scrutiny of the Senate um, last Thursday. But nonetheless, that didn't happen. So now I invite um, National Party representatives, or perhaps Senator Macdonald, seeing he's uh, most vocal this evening, to um, um, describe for the Senate exactly what the National Party's position is on constitutional recognition for local government. Senator Macdonald. Yeah, I'm not a member of the National Party, so I can't speak uh, uh, for them. But uh, let me just uh, put this on the record, and normally I'd do it uh, much more fully than I will tonight, because time's against us and uh, we have been asked to be very brief, uh, because there's a big program to go. Um, I've always supported uh, constitutional recognition of uh, local government, as I think most in my party uh, have, and I know my colleagues in the National Party are the same. However, if we all know how referendums work in Australia. Um, if you have any state government opposing it, it will not go through. Now, as I said in my second reading speech, if you want constitutional recognition of local government, that can be achieved very easily, very easily today. All you've got to do is get every state government to sign up to it. Now, if you get every state government to sign up to it, uh, and, and you can get a bill that works, uh, that's the challenge to the local government uh, association, but I'm sure they would uh, uh, come to that. But I always said to them, get me a bill that works and get every state government to support it and we'll have constitutional recognition. As I said in my second reading speech, uh, addressing, uh, with respect, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, uh, those of the party to whom the previous speaker belongs and who happen to control every state government in Australia at the present time, if you believe in constitutional recognition, get me a document that says every state, every state Labor government will support it and we can go ahead. But I'll guarantee you, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman, and the, I'll guarantee the previous speaker uh, in the same time, the state governments will not support it. And the state governments, regrettably, comprised, are comprised of Labor Party majorities in every state in Australia. And so that's where the, that's where the block lies. Uh, just put that on the record. And, um, and uh, I will sit down. I've taken two minutes now, and uh, I know our whips are not keen on this. Uh, but can I just refer to Senator Brown's uh, uh, amendment? The motion we're dealing with, the, the, the substantive. Uh, no, but I, I, I understand. I, I, uh, I um, respect my colleagues. I respect my colleagues' uh, convenience, and we don't want to be here on Friday or on Saturday or on Sunday. Uh, so we do want to get this over and done with. But it just needs to be said, the substantive part of the bill before the Senate is this. A law of a state or territory has no effect to the extent to which the law in any way prohibits a person or body or penalises or discriminates against a person or body for entering into or proposing to enter into an arrangement under subsection 1 or taking part or assisting with or proposing to take part or assist with uh, the conduct, conduct of an activity such as a plebiscite to which the arrangement under subsection 1 relates. Now, uh, Senator Brown, if any council in Australia wants to have a plebiscite on Kyoto or anything else, they can do it. But if you're a council in Queensland and want to have a plebiscite on your own future, you would have been thrown in jail. And it is this federal legislation that overrides the Queensland legislation uh, to that effect. So, if you want to have a, if, if a council wants to have a vote on a plebis uh, on Kyoto, go ahead and do it. Free to do it. If you want to have a vote on the future of that council, you'll be thrown in jail. That's the difference. Senator Brown. Donald, whose um, party opposed the recognition of local government back in the 80s, and putting that uh, and stymied the referendum outcome there. Um, well, uh, the fact is it was 
are your party through you, Chair, that stymied local government getting recognition in that referendum. Full stop. On the matter of the Kyoto Protocol, which is uh, the subject of this amendment, whereby the Greens would offer the Australian people a yes or no on uh, whether our nation should join the rest of the community of nations, save President Bush, in ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, um, the, legis the um, amendment, of course, is not about local governments doing that because that would have no effect. It's about uh, the uh, federal government doing that because it, it would have a very high moral effect. It's not going to dictate what a government can do, but a plebiscite is indicative of how the people of Australia feel. Now, I can understand that Senator Macdonald and Senator Colbeck and the government doesn't want that uh, requirement put on their shoulders to give the Australian people a say on ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, would they face a um, tirade and potential cutting of uh, funding from the mining industry if they were to do that? So there's no way they're going to do that. But um, I would have thought the Labor Party would have supported this and I'd be very pleased to hear from Senator Lundy why the Labor opposition opposes this. Yes, I was here, Senator Lundy, but you didn't... Uh, well, Senator Lundy... Yes. Yeah, um, I invite her to... Now the amend... Well, here we've got the government and the opposition. Uh, uh, Senator Macdonald coming to the aid of Senator Lundy, which is... Um, <laughs> which is apparently required. But, um, I, well, I don't want uh, to put you in the spot, Senator Lundy. The fact is it's uh, extraordinary that the opposition opposes the Australian people having uh, a say at the forthcoming election on this critical matter because it affects all Australians and it affects all future Australians. And nothing can be more important than for us to give Australians a say on this matter where this country has been stymied in joining the international community by um, this Prime Minister and this government for now a decade. And uh, I would have... I'm amazed that Labor doesn't support uh, this amendment. But... I'm sorry? Um, the... Uh, Senator Lundy's not quite speaking loud enough for me to hear what she says. But uh, that doesn't matter. The Greens do support it. We think uh, that that's a, it's a vital matter which Australians could have a say on. And um, we're very proud to put this amendment before the chamber. Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, as I was saying earlier, uh, Labor has a policy of ratifying the Kyoto Protocol. And if we are elected at the next election, we'll be able to put that policy in place. And that is um, the way we'll be approaching this. We've had that on the record now for, for a very long time. But I, I am feeling provoked by Senator Macdonald, who stood up in this place and said that he's always supported constitutional recognition. Indeed, the Liberal Party, I thought I heard him say, has always supported constitutional recognition. And that, in fact, that's not the case. And I ask Senators opposite, what does the Prime Minister say about constitutional recognition of local government? Because in 1988, the Prime Minister said that it would unbalance the Constitution. Minister Lloyd was incapable of offering the Coalition's support to constitutional recognition when he had ample opportunity to do so at the Local Government of Queensland Conference just a few weeks ago in Queensland. So whilst the National Party and now Liberal senators run around professing support for this, it is not a policy of the coalition government. And the Labor Party calls on the coalition government to make it a policy. It's not good enough to mouth off those words and then expect the electorate to have any respect for you, for the party, if you then don't make it a formal policy, because we all know that the only way 
to get constitutional recognition to be a reality in Australia is not this pathetic blame game on the states that Senator Macdonald offers that somehow the Labor states don't support this policy. They do. And I can tell you something else, Senator Macdonald, that the Liberal Party don't support this policy. And for you to stand up and say that tonight shows, one, that you're operating on your own, and two, you are incapable of delivering support by the Liberal Party to constitutional recognition. And the, the issue about uh, state support for constitutional recognition is that it is a policy of the Labor Party to support constitutional recognition, and that extends to the Labor Party, uh, whether it be in states or federal. So let's have a look at what Senator Macdonald said tonight. He stood up and said the Liberals supported constitutional recognition of local government. Where is the public statement from the minister responsible for the portfolio from the, and from the Prime Minister saying that you will support a constitutional recognition referendum once we have those issues of the question uh, to be put resolved. Now, Labor has a plan for this. We have a policy. We have a time frame. If we'd offered our support to the local government sphere for them to work towards this outcome, and please use this opportunity to tell us what the coalition government's policy is on this matter, because you had, you had you had the opportunity in 1974 and the coalition opposed it. You had the opportunity to support it in 1988 and the coalition government opposed it. The question is, if we are in a position to put a referendum in the future, which will only happen if Labor is fortunate enough to be successful at the next election, will the coalition support that referendum? If the answer is yes, then let's see the Prime Minister stand up and say that. Otherwise, you are just misleading the people of local government and the sector that cares so dearly about this issue. Uh, Sen Senator Macdonald, I put to you that, in fact, it's not your party's policy at all, that you've come in here this evening and decided to mouth off about your view and purport that the Liberal Party's policy is to support constitutional recognition when, in fact, it's not your party's policy at all, any more than, than it's the National Party's formal policy. And unless you can point to state, formal statements from your leaders that contradict what I'm saying, then I think that is the situation that uh, is, in fact, the reality. And um, you ought to stand up now and clarify what's going on. Senator, no. Senator can, can I just uh, thank Senator Lundy for confirming to me that every state Labor government will support constitutional recognition. I intend to take her at her word. I shall write to every Premier uh, as of tomorrow and seek their assurance of what uh, Senator Lundy uh, uh, has said, and uh, then uh, the whole debate can really move on. Thank you, Senator Lundy. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Brown. Senator Brown. So just um, again, uh, I want to ask the minister if he understands that this referendum is not about uh, local government, but uh, this amendment is about having a referendum at the forthcoming federal elections. A plebiscite. Thank you, Senator Murray, on the um, on support or otherwise of the Kyoto Protocol. And secondly, whether Senator Colbeck uh, understands that uh, this legislation will indeed override the 1968 legislation in Tasmania prohibiting local governments from having uh, referenda plebiscites on fluoridation. Um, Secretary, Senator yes, I do understand the intent of the uh, amendment, Senator Brown, and uh, that doesn't change the government's position. And with respect of uh, the 1968 legislation in Tasmania, my understanding is that um, if the uh, ballot or the plebiscite is, uh, is conducted by the Australian Electoral Commission, then this yes, this legislation will override the 1968 legislation in respect to fluoridation. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. 
Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. The noes have it. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Oh. Yeah. The bill, bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The committee has considered the uh, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Democratic Plebiscites Bill 2007 and agreed to it without amendment. Parliamentary Secretary Senator Colbeck. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Colbeck, Parliamentary I, Secretary. I move the bill be read a third time. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those that Senator Brown. Well, I've, I've just. Uh the President has been talking with Senator Murray about this, but I think um, maybe for reasons which uh, weren't entirely consistent with the outcome I'm about to describe, uh, this could be the uh, greatest uh, contribution to democracy that the government's made in its time in office. Uh, the, the democratic um, process has been very much wanting over the last 11 years. But here we have a piece of legislation which uh, is going to facilitate local government being able to uh, determine the will of the people on issues um, where state governments in the past have been able to prescribe them. And the fluoridation uh, prohibition in Tasmania was an example of that. And uh, it uh, will now exercise the mind of many Australians working through local government to um, assert or to apply for some degree of determination where that hasn't been available in the past. So um, uh, the Greens will be supporting this legislation, not, for, uh, not because we um, don't see uh, the political motivation in the run to the election that uh, had the Prime Minister suddenly uh, embark on this course, but because in the longer run, for other reasons, it could be indeed a positive innovation for democracy in Australia. And uh, the Greens have not supported the enforced amalgamation of uh, municipalities, shires in uh, local governments in, in Queensland. Um, we have more respect for the um, people of Noosa, for example, and uh, Port Douglas, for a, another example, than that. Uh, that they ought to be able to um, make some determination in the matter. Uh, the government has seen that um, it is indeed popular, and why shouldn't it, should it not be for people to be able to make a determination on that matter? And uh, we're supporting this government legislation, and we hope it'll lead to people at local government level being able to um, determine their future in other ways, uh, yet unseen as this legislation passes this House, but which may be quite important to people safeguarding their own interests in their own uh, localities in the future. Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I wrote some extensive supplementary remarks to the um, Senate report into, into, the, uh, uh, into the bill, and I concur that it is a remarkable bill and a great democratic innovation. And I'll again uh, compliment the government on bringing it forward. Uh, but the purpose of me standing is not uh, to revisit uh, my support and my party support for this bill, uh, but to again request through you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that the Minister have regard to the fact that these will be non-binding plebiscites, uh, and even if they're the popular will is strongly expressed in Queensland against local council amalgamations, uh, the review and appeal process is still proscribed. And I think that is a great problem for us in terms of natural justice and, and uh, due process. Uh, and I would urge uh, the government to look again at that issue and, and see whether uh, they could find some way in which to ensure that reviews and appeals uh, can be carried out uh, where uh, people such as local uh, local government uh, wish to uh, uh, challenge 
uh, a ruling because there is no provision for them to do that uh, in Queensland uh, with local council, local council amalgamations. Thank you. Senator Ian MacDonald. Deputy President, uh, there was never any uh, suggestion in this bill uh, that the Commonwealth could interfere with the uh, local government process in Queensland. What this bill is about is the Commonwealth Government overriding a decision of a state government to ban free speech in that state. And the free speech wasn't in any other way. I mean, uh, councils can have a poll on anything in Queensland, anything at all, except, except what their future as a local government uh, might be. And that was, the, uh, that was the underlying core outrage of this particular decision. Now, it has been changed. Well, legislation has been introduced that the last I looked, it hadn't been voted on, although the state parliament has been sitting for two weeks. But perhaps it happened today, and I haven't caught up with it. Um, but uh, certainly they didn't rush to it. But that was the whole point. A government of Australia decided that if, you had, if a council had the temerity to have a plebiscite on its own future, you would be fined, and if you didn't pay the fine, you'd be thrown into jail. And that's what this legislation overrides. I'm very proud of uh, Mr Howard and our government uh, that we did take this particular issue on, and hopefully in doing that forced uh, Mr Beatty and Ms, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Bly to change their mind. I think they changed their mind because they knew, after threatening to take it to the High Court, they knew that it didn't matter what happened, we would do it. So they said, oh, we're done for a uh, penny, we're done for a pound, we might as well roll over. Having introduced the, the bill and rammed it through State Parliament one week, they changed their mind uh, the next week. Why? because the federal government said we'd override. That's what this bill's all about. I'm delighted uh, that for once we've had words of praise from the, uh, uh, from the Greens, uh, and uh, I do acknowledge that in this particular bill it has the support of the Labor Party, the Democrats, uh, the Greens, and of course is a bill of the Liberal and National Party. So it's a delight to see this going ahead, and I think it is a major step forward in freedom of speech in our country. Question is? that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The bill for act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Government business order of the day, trade practices legislation amendment bill number one, 2007, in committee. Order. The committee is considering the Trade Practices Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2007 and Amendments Numbers 2 to 5 on Sheet 5324 revised, moved by Senator Murray. Question is, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, where was I, Senator Murray? When? Um, thank you very much indeed, Senator Murray. And now. The reason why the government won't be supporting the proposed um, Democrat amendment to um, create section 46 for capital B, which is part of item three of the Democrat amendments, is because we consider that in view of the government's um, amendment made today in relation to predatory pricing, uh, it is also superfluous. Recruitment is not legally required under the government's predatory pricing amendments. This is clearly set out in the explanatory memorandum. Turning then, Senator Murray, to um, Democrat Amendment Number Four, which is uh, which would prescribe um, a uh, which would define um, uh, more tightly the meaning of uh, all the circumstances in which a court might be held to take advantage. I'm sorry, a corporation might be held to take advantage of market power. Uh, once again, Senator Murray, um, in the government's view and my view, uh, this is unnecessary um, because, as the High Court um, decided as long ago as 1989 in the Queensland Wire against BHP case, 
uh, the uh, concept of taking advantage of market power is purely a causal or functional relationship. Um, the, um, all it means, and this is well settled by the cases, to take advantage of market power merely means to use market power. So there must merely be a relationship of causality between the conduct and the effect. And therefore, in our view, uh, to uh, gloss that or to further complicate it uh, is both unnecessary and, with, with respect, um, unhelpful. Now, turning then to um, Democrat Amendment Number Five, um, uh, which proposes the um, amendment of the Act by the insertion of a Section 46AB for anti-competitive price discrimination, and then by Section 46AC anti-competitive geographic price discrimination. Um, the government generally doesn't favour, um, and I think the opposition is a co of a common mind here, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Sherry, the opposition doesn't favour the reintroduction of price discrimination um, as a separate standalone cause of action under the Trade Practices Act. You'll remember, Senator Murray, that some years ago there was a prohibition on price discrimination in section 49 of the old Act, and that was repealed years ago, I think, in the, in the time of the previous Labor government. And the reason for that is, well, there are several reasons for that, but um, the main reasons are, first of all, that price discrimination is of itself no vice unless it is attended by other conduct which would be independently unlawful as misuse of market power under the existing section 46, and more particularly now that the, um, there are these additional predatory pricing protections uh, in the Act as a result of the government amendment I moved earlier in the day, a fortiori it is not necessary now to have an additional cause of action for price discrimination. And, and I ask the rhetorical question, Senator Murray, what conduct can you imagine of price differentiation would or should be caught by your proposed section 46 capital A capital B that would not already be unlawful either under the existing section 46 or more particularly the augmented section 46 with the predatory pricing amendments that the government has made? Well, the only conduct that would be unlawful was um, cases of differential pricing where there was no relevant malign intent or no other economic circumstance which would make the price differentiation um, anti-competitive. So at best for um, your amendment with respect it is, and I know I've used this word to describe a number of your amendments, forgive me for, for using it again, it is otios, but if it, is, if it has any additional meaning it could only have a chilling effect on price competition, and price competition is one of the very things that Trade Practices Act exists to protect. So for that reason um, we don't support um, amendment uh, number five either. Senator Murray. Thank you uh, Mr Chairman. I um, uh, have of course uh, through you Minister I have uh, taken legal advice to these and they have an opinion and I have one which of course uh, differs in some respects from yours. Uh, but really I've risen to thank you for your detailed uh, and uh, thorough explanation of the reasons for rejecting the amendments. That's uh, very helpful. The question is that amendments two and three taken together be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against no. no. I think the noes have it. The question now is that amendments four and five taken together be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no? no. I think the noes have it. We now move to. Family first. Hmm? Family first has an amendment. Senator Fielding. Two amendments. Chair, um, this, um, these two amendments uh, on uh, sheet uh, five, uh, triple three, uh, items one and two, um, uh, seek leave to move those together. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Fielding. Thank you. Look, um, the, uh, 
These amendments were put forward before the government uh, did their uh, 11th hour uh, amendments, and um, they do uh, address the predatory pricing specifically by having another section uh, called uh, predatory pricing. And uh, the issue here is, is to look at um, uh, defining predatory pricing that uh, occurs when a, uh, a corporation that has a substantial degree of power in the market or a substantial financial power in the market and offers goods and services for sale in that uh, market at prices which have the purpose or effect of substantially lessening competition in that market. And, uh, the difference uh, 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 with uh, the Family First uh, amendments compared to the government's is that the government's look at substantial share of market as uh, really the, uh, one of the key uh, sole tests and doesn't look at the other issue of fun uh, substantial financial uh, power or even a substantial degree of power in a market. So it is uh, slightly different. Uh, there's probably uh, differing opinions on uh, whether which way is best to actually uh, make that happen. And the other uh, um, difference is that the, uh, uh, the purpose or the effect, uh, the effect of substantially uh, lessening competition in that market. So uh, I uh, submit those to the Senate to, or for the government to consider. Question is that the amendments moved by Senator Fielding be agreed to. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry Senator Sherry. Thanks. Uh, Chair. Um, uh, just to indicate Labor's view on these amendments, as, as Senator Fielding's indicated, um, he had drafted them prior to the government's 11th hour um, uh, amendments that, as I've mentioned earlier, we don't believe go far enough. But um, having examined Senator Fielding's amendments, we believe they would create uh, some uncertainty because it would make it difficult to distinguish between genuine competitive and anti-competitive conduct, which would discourage discounting and drive up prices for consumers. Amendment 1 ensures there's no double jeopardy issue with the Senator's amendments. Amendment 2 um, does not provide any criteria as to what constitutes lessening of competition. It's unclear when prices would reduce competition as stated in the amendments. The amendments also introduce an effects test so that conduct can be predatory pricing even if there was no purpose for the conduct to be anti-competitive. This introduces a concept that could limit rather than encourage competition. Uh, further, the amendment lists some factors for the courts to use in determining whether predatory pricing has occurred. However, these factors do not adequately define predatory pricing and hence introduce further uncertainty into the Act. Also, um, at least in part, the amendment has the same effect as Labor's amendment to ensure that recoupment of costs is not required to prove ped predatory pricing. So all in all, um, our conclusion on the amendments is whilst uh, in one area there is a, a crossover um, with a, a Labor amendment to be dealt with, the level of uncertainty and difficulty that is created by the amendments as a whole uh, leads Labor to the conclusion it can't support them. Minister. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the government doesn't support Senator Fielding's amendments. Um, I should, uh, there are several reasons for that, and let me deal with the three most important, but I should indicate that one of the reasons given by uh, Senator Sherry uh, for the Labor Party's opposition to your amendment, Senator Fielding, is quite wrong. Um, Senator Sherry, if I understood him correctly, thought that introducing substantial lessening of competition would add uncertainty. Substantial lessening of competition um, has been a, a key concept of the Trade Practices Act, of Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act, since 1974. And uh, I don't know who's advising you, Senator Sherry, but uh, that's not the issue here at all. But there are three reasons, at uh, well, three most particular reasons why the government doesn't support these amendments, Senator Fielding, and they're these. First of all, um, and you, I dare say, expect me to say this, that the government amendments that were uh, passed by the Senate earlier in the day, uh, in our view, sufficiently, uh, if, this, if that were necessary beyond the existing terms of Section 46, deal with the issue of predatory pricing in any event. Um, secondly, um, your amendment would introduce into the Act for the first time on, into, into the Section 46 um, area of the Act, that is the misuse of market power provisions of the Act, for the first time, 
two quite novel concepts. The first is to regard substantial financial power as an alternative test to substantial market power. And um, that, if I, may say, if I may say so, Senator, feeling really is a heresy when it comes to competition law. You see, the whole point here is to deal with the exercise of power in a market. What, the tra what Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act is about is the use of market, the use or misuse of market power. So that what the, the conduct upon which the pro prohibitions in the Act fix are the various ways and circumstances in which market power may be abused. Now, what you're doing, Senator, is saying, well, as well as the misuse of market power, we should have a second concept, the misuse of financial power. But that concept would only have any operative effect if one couldn't make out misuse of market power. So, Senator Fielding, you ask yourself the question, well, in what circumstances could it be anti-competitive for a company which wasn't misusing market power, nevertheless, to be constrained in its commercial activity because of its financial power? And I suppose the only answer to that question would be if you had a very wealthy company. But if that company's wealth, a company with great financial power, didn't translate into the existence of market power, which could very easily be the case, why would we want to attack the company merely because it was a wealthy company? You know, it's, it's very commonplace. In fact, in any healthily functioning market, you will find several players, several corporations with financial power, if that is to be defined as financial resources or, or wealth, deep pockets, which nevertheless don't have substantial market power because it's a competitive market. But if it's, a, if it's given that it's a competitive market, why would the Trade Practices Act be interested in intervening? That's the very thing that the Trade Practices Act is there to secure. So the premise of your amendment so far as cons uh, it, it, it would invoke this additional concept of financial power as a ground of intervention really is deeply anti-competitive. Um, secondly, uh, I'm sorry, thirdly, um, we don't agree with the introduction of an effects test into a section which would operate cognately with section 46. There is an effects test, as you know, Senator um, Fielding, in section 45, but that's about, um, that's about horizontal arrangements. There has been a debate going on for as long as the Trade Practices Act has been the law of the land as to whether or not what the misuse of market power um, provisions, which are about corporations acting unilaterally, not in concert, um, should deal with is a purpose, which section 46 does, or also an, a, a, an effect. Now, the reason that most respectable opinion settles upon limiting the operation of section 46 or any provision cognately operating with section 46 to purpose is that if you said that the operation should um, settle upon merely an effect absent a purpose, absent a purpose to drive competition out of the market, then what you would be doing is you would be capturing potentially any successful competitive strategy. I mean, if you had a corporation which was not motivated by one of the pre three purposes um, prohibited by section 46.1, it wasn't seeking to eliminate or substantially damage or drive out of the market a competitor, but nevertheless an effect of its corporate conduct was to damage a competitor, then that conduct would be prohibited. Now, as I said earlier in the debate, I mean, the, the, the basic proposition of, the, of Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act is that it exists to protect the competitive process, not to protect individual competitors. If the Trade Practices Act were to seize upon any occasion in a competitive market when an effect of a powerful corporation might be to drive out of the market a, a, a competitive company, albeit that wasn't the purpose of the, um, the, the successful company, then I can leave it to you to imagine what a chilling effect that would have on the operation of the market and ultimately 
by its chilling effect on the operation of free competition would in fact be deeply anti-competitive. So that's another reason why the government doesn't go along with your proposed amendment. The question is, Senator Fielding. Oh, I'll have to just respond to that, I think, to a certain extent, because uh, if the uh, minister was to uh, read that the substantial financial power wasn't on its own, it was in regards to whether it has the purpose, and we'll leave out the effect for the moment, of substantially lessening competition in that market. So it's not just financial power that all of a sudden makes you a target, not at all. And in actual fact that the government's amendment just works on substantial share of market. It doesn't say power in a market. It works on share, percentage of share of a market. So you've got to look at those issues in combination, not in isolation, as it uh, has seemed to be done from there. And then obviously looking at uh, item three, uh, where it looks at the court may have regard to whether the goods and services are offered at a price less than the relevant cost, the price for which competitors of the corporation offering the same goods or services and for the period of time in which these goods and services are offered at the relevant price, and uh, whether the corporation offering the same goods and services in other markets for higher prices, and the extent of the competition in the market, and the reasons for its conduct. So I think that to, to take it uh, slightly out of context, uh, uh, and look, we can debate this ad nauseum, but uh, I suppose I'll just leave it at that. I think there's going to be obviously a disagreement in views on the issue, and I'll put it before the Senate. The question is that the amendment Moved by uh, Senator Fielding be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the noes have it. We now move to opposition amendment two and three. Senator Sherry. Uh, thank you. Um, with leave, I'll move two and three together. Leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Sherry. Uh, thank you. Firstly, on amendment two. Um, it reads, a corporation can have a substantial degree of market power even though there is no proof that the corporation has the ability to or will have the ability to recoup losses from pricing below the relevant cost to the corporation supplying the goods or services. Uh, this means that where the form of prescribed behaviour alleged under section 46.1 is predatory pricing, it is not necessary to demonstrate a capacity to subsequently recoup the losses experienced as a result of that predatory pricing strategy. The courts consider recoup recoupment now. The government's amendments leave it to the courts to decide whether recoup recoupment is an issue or not. Uh, Labor's uh, amendments explicitly state that recoup recoupment is not a factor as it should be unnecessary to prove in relation to predatory pricing. Uh, stating that it is not necessary to prove recoupment lowers the bar to predatory pricing and removes, removes the court's need to look at the future in determining predatory pricing. Labor's amendments make it uh, clear recoupment is not a factor and make it easier to prove predatory pricing for small business. Even though the supplementary uh, explanatory memorandum states that recoupment is not necessary, Labor believes it, it is best to state that this this in the legislation to put the issue beyond doubt. Um, Labor's third amendment lists four factors the court must have regard to in determining whether a company with substantial market power has taken advantage of that power for an anti-competitive purpose. Uh, the need for clarification of take advantage arises from the Rural Press case and the Melways case. In rural press, the court found that a company is not taking advantage of its marketing power if it does something it could do without any market power. This interpretation leaves little conduct, leaves little conduct which could be construed as taking advantage. This amendment would remove uncertainty with regard to the meaning of take advantage by making the link between prescribed conduct and the possession of substantial market power clear. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Sherry be agreed to. Minister. Um, Mr Chairman, the government supports um, neither of these amendments. In relation to the recoupment amendment of ALP, I'm sorry, opposition amendment number two, the reason the government doesn't support this amendment um, is it rigidifies the process of proof. Uh, a court, and this is uncontroversial, may have regard to the issue of recruitment but um, in order to uh, erect statutory um, 
uh, gu um, stringent statutory guidelines as to whether or not a court must have regard to a particular um, criterion or circumstance is, in my view, uh, generally not desirable. And it's certainly not desirable here because you know, these cases, um, it all depends on the particular facts of the operation of the corporation in, in, a, in a market with particular features, and they vary from one to another. So it's, it's I think, very bad. It would be very bad law uh, overly to rigidify the uh, considerations to which the court might have regard. In relation to um, uh, opposition amendment number three, this is really the same point that I tried to make to Senator Murray before. That the, the scheme of section 46 of the Trade Practices Act is really very elegant. I mean, it, there are three elements. Um, you have to have a corporation with substantial power, a substantial degree of power in a market, and there can be a debate about how that is determined and that raises issues of thresholds. Uh, and then it has to be actuated by a malign purpose, one of the three purposes proscribed by section 46.1. And then the link between them is to take advantage of the power for the proscribed purpose. And the courts have been very clear about this. The take advantage means use. All it means is that there be a causal or functional relationship between the use of the market power and the achievement of the malign purpose. And what the High Court said in the rural press case is quite right. And it's quite conceivable that you could have a corporation with substantial power in a market which does an act for the purpose of eliminating or substantially damaging a competitor in a market, but which nevertheless uh, it ought not to be caught by section 46 because the functional causal relationship between the first and the third elements doesn't exist. Let me give you an example, Senator Sherry. Let us say, and this is a hypothetical of course, let us say you had a corporation with a substantial degree of power in a market that decided to eliminate a competitor. And the way in which it decided to eliminate a competitor was to um, surreptitiously engage some hoodlum to burn down its competitor's warehouse. Now, that, there you are. There's a co corporation with a substantial degree of power in a market, and it does something designed to eliminate or substantially damage a competitor, and what it does is, in fact, unlawful. But it's not using its market power to engage in that conduct. It's doing something independently unlawful. So there has to be, for Section 46 to work, a functional or causal relationship between the power, the market power, and the prescribed purpose. And that's supplied by the element taking advantage. But what has to be taken advantage of or used, to use, to use the, the simplest Anglo-Saxon word you can imagine that the courts have settled upon, is to use the market power in order to achieve that purpose. Now, um, the, uh, the uh, additional, the, the four tests that you propose adding to section 46 really add complications uh, to what is a very, very simple set of propositions, which I think, if I may say so, um, would make section 46 work much, much less effectively or thoroughly, and for that reason as well the government opposes that amendment too. Senator Fielding. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Look, I uh, was wondering whether the minister could explain uh, in the uh, government's um, amendments—I know we're not referring to those, but we're talking about recruitment now, it's just come back up again—in the explanatory memorandum, could you just go through why recruitment was mentioned in the explanatory memorandum to the amendments that the government moved? Senator Sherry. One other point I just wanted to seek your clarification of. We might be able to just save a bit of time. But I just make the point, Minister, your own amendment gets rid of the take advantage. Perhaps you could respond to that when you deal with Senator Fielding's. Uh... Um, uh, let, me, let me deal with what you have to say, Senator Fielding. Um, recoupment may be, an, may be an issue because if I corporation engaged in conduct of the kind that section 46 or the cognate provisions that have now been introduced uh, is intended to proscribe um, can be demonstrated to be intending to recoup its loss its short-term losses by long-term monopoly profits after it has eliminated a competitor from a market that may very well be good evidence that will supply 
um, the, 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 the wanting proof of the anti-competitive purpose. Uh, and it might also, in fact, in certain circumstances, satisfy the element of taking or demonstrate that advantage had been taken of market power too, but it, it really goes to the issue of purpose primarily. But that's not always going to be the case. And the point that, that I'm making to you uh, is that you don't, do, you don't do the operation of, of the Section 46 and, and like provisions of Part 4 of the Trade Practices Act any favours by imposing these structural rigidities in what may or may not be taken into account for the purposes of proof. I mean, these, can I tell you, these cases, as you know, I've run them, they, they're very hard to prove. They're very hard to prove. But you don't do yourself any favours by rigidifying the, 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 the requirements of proof. An applicant is always better off, in my view, um, when, he can, uh, when the applicant in a section 46 proceeding can have the full flexibility of the section at their disposal, including the provisions that enable proof by inference that are uh, in section 46.7 of the Act, which we haven't discussed so far this evening. So um, that, that's a, I mean, there are, there are many, many, many refinements of this argument. People have spent you know, week, weekends, weekends at conferences debating this very point, but the, 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 in the sort of layman's language, as it were, that's the point. It rigidifies something that doesn't need to be rigidified. Senator so, Fielding. If I could just continue on with the recruitment one, if I can, if that's okay. The, explain to me why it was in the explanatory memorandum again, the recruitment as, a, as an issue, given that it wasn't mentioned in your bill, or sorry, in the amendment, the uh, PF441. Why is it in the explanatory memorandum? Be a factor. I mean, it, the, the, the recoupment of short-term losses by long-term monopoly profits, which is what recoupment's about, may be a factor, and therefore it's relevant to advert to that in the explanatory memorandum. But what the explanatory memorandum, chapter 2.1, says, in slightly more um, considered language, is what I just said to you a moment ago, that it's not a pre prerequisite to establish a breach of section 46.1. In short, I'm quoting here from the EM, the legal position is that recruitment is not required to prove a breach of section 46. You see, it, 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 may, it may well help to prove a breach of section 46, but neither is it the case that you need to show recruitment to prove that section 46 has been breached, or that it will always be the case that recruitment or that, that, that recruitment is the decisive factor in showing whether or not there is a proscribed Section 46 purpose. It may be relevant. In many cases, it will be relevant. But to elevate this one circumstance or this one um, consideration above all the other considerations that can go to demonstrate that a corporation has acted in a particular way to achieve one of the three prescribed Section 46 purposes um, is not really the, uh, as I said before, is not doing Section 46 any favours by rigidifying um, the circumstances in which a brief breach may be demonstrated to have occurred. Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. On the same point, uh, Minister, I, I have understood um, the supplementary ex uh, explanatory memorandum. Uh, and it has said the legal position, it's the final, final sentence, the legal position is that recoupment is not required to prove a breach of section 46. Uh, it's always dangerous to put yourself in the other man's shoes. Uh, but uh, as I read Senator Fielding's uh, questions and as I read my own position and that of the Labor Party, um, that is not uh, what is worrying uh, because recoupment is not required to prove a breach of section 46. The problem is whether uh, the inability to recoup is, uh, would be an impediment to proving section 46. And, and you might uh, perhaps suggest that the, the wording uh, of both my previous amendment and uh, Senator Sherry's amendment is not clear enough. That, to me, is what we're trying to, to uh, elicit. And, and perhaps in your, in your response, you could explore that problem. 
that if there was an inability to recoup uh, the losses, uh, could a Section 46 um, uh, case still be successfully prosecuted? Conceivably, I mean, one can imagine a set of circumstances in which one demonstrated that there was an inability to recoup the losses, but nevertheless was able independently, uh, by proof of other uh, facts and circumstances, to demonstrate that one of the proscribed purposes in Section 46 was nevertheless present. And, you know, Senator Murray, you're, you're dealing with these things in, in real time too. I mean, the recoupment issue is always going to be a retrospective issue. It's always going to be an issue that's addressed by courts and, and barristers with the luxury of looking at what happened uh, retrospectively. But of course, at the time at which the conduct is engaged in, which is usually either contemporaneous with or, or post the time at which the, the, the relevant purpose was formed, then it may well be that the, 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 the malefactors, the, the, the people who, are, um, who constitute the, the, the corporate mind, um, are not in any sophisticated or systematic way turning their minds to issues of recruit, recruitment at all. So I can well imagine a circumstance in which one could demonstrate um, uh, a, a Section 46 breach, even though, looked at with the benefit of hindsight, as courts inevitably do, it could be demonstrated retrospectively that there was no prospect, in fact, uh, of their purpose being fulfilled at all. The question is that the amendments moved by, or the amendment moved by uh, Senator, Sh Senator Sherry, and the two amendments, two amendments, two and three moved by Senator Sherry, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against no. no. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell. Division required? Yeah. yeah. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that Democrats Amendment 6 on sheet 5324 revised be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. Point Senator Webber, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGoran, teller for the noes. Uh, before I read the result of the division, I will just confirm, because I think there was uh, an error made on my part, it is opposition amendments two and three on sheets five, three, double, four. Um, so, so, so that there is no confusion. I don't think it has changed the outcome uh, at, at all. There being 30 ayes, 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. to uh, Democrat Amendment number six. Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I uh, move uh, item shit. <laughs> Items. <laughs> I, I, I withdraw that remark. <laughs> item uh, six on uh, sheet 5324 revised. I was just testing to hear, see if you were all listening, really. Uh, the, uh, this is one of those amendments which has been terribly difficult to, uh, to design. The S Senate uh, Economics References Committee on the, in March 2004 on the effectiveness of the Trade Practices Act 1974 in protecting small business uh, referred to the issue of creeping acquisitions. 
and those people who participated in uh, competition law discussions um, over probably a decade or more uh, would know that creeping ac acquisitions have been uh, the bane, uh, particularly of the grocery uh, retailing sector. Um, and sorry, Madam Chair, I'm getting easily distracted by by the President of the Senate and the uh, leader of the. Well, I'm government sorry, in the uh, House. Senator Murray. Perhaps if those people don't have business in this chamber relating to this legislation, they might like to step outside. <laughs> It's a bit pathetic, really, but still. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and I'm sure Senator they won't leave. says behind me, I'm, I'm easily distracted. That's probably I'm, true. I'm sure they won't leave mm. by walking between you and myself, Senator Murray. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, everybody understands the problem of creeping acquisitions. It, it's an easy one to express and, and an easy one to understand, and, and that is the cumulative effect of uh, acquisitions over time can result in the accumulation of market power such uh, that it will threaten uh, competition. But how to deal with it has been uh, a major discussion. Now, at uh, page uh, uh, 18, Roman numerals 18, uh, of the report I referred to, uh, they said the following. Uh, Submissions before the inquiry suggested in the retail grocery sector and the retail liquor sector, large chains are acquiring the stores of independent competitors in a program of creeping acquisitions. Witnesses express concern that Section 50 of the Act, designed to prevent acquisitions that would have the effect of substantially lessening competition in the market, is inadequate in dealing with piecemeal acquisitions, because no single purchase is likely by itself to lead to a substantial lessening of competition. The ACCC ex itself expressed concern about this issue, but also noted that it has not yet determined whether creeping acquisitions in general, as opposed to specific cases, do substantially lessen competition and so cause economic detriment. Further, if they do have this effect, the ACCC expressed uncertainty about whether the current Section 50 provisions would be adequate to deal with that issue. The committee considers as a matter of logic that creeping acquisitions must have continued indefinitely at some point result in a very concentrated market. The clear consensus of evidence before the committee supported this view, and no substantial arguments were raised to oppose it. Current merger law does not effectively address this issue. Section 50 of the Act should be strengthened to take account of the cumulative effects of acquisitions which over time may substantially lessen competition. And still quoting, recommendation 12, the committee considers that provisions should be introduced into the Act to ensure that the ACCC has powers to prevent creeping acquisitions which substantially lessen competition in the market. Well, easy to say but hard to do. Uh, the uh, government uh, senators um, said at, at page 89 uh, that government senators do not support this recommendation. In our view, the existing provisions of part four, subject to the amendment we have recommended above, that's above in their report, adequately deal with such competition issues which creeping acquisitions might raise. Now, with respect, I disagree with the government senators uh, and uh, I would uh, remark that there are a number of government senators I know who are extremely concerned about creeping acquisitions, uh, and some of them might be sitting uh, near me in this debate. So the uh, Democrats attempted to uh, ad address this issue, uh, and we uh, have created uh, item six. Now, there may be uh, those people who cannot see this amendment working because it does use the, uh, um, the, the time period of five years uh, as the period in which creeping acquisitions can be taken into account or, or when they may or may not impact on an acquisition made in another state. Uh, however, uh, that may do, but uh, there needs to be some time-based recognition of the creeping acquisition phenomenon. Uh, everybody knows that uh, the definition of market in the Trade Practices Act is an integral part of a case getting up. So if the relevant market is recognised as a national market, this amendment allows sufficient flexibility to a court to review the pattern of acquisitions over five years in any relevant market to get a better fix on their collective or aggregated impact on, on competition. If the pattern of behaviour demonstrably substantially lessens competition, then this amendment allows the ACCC to deal with them, and at the moment the ACCC cannot. 
More importantly, this amendment allows creeping acquisitions in local and regional markets to be considered, and that is where the adverse impact on competition from creeping acquisitions over five years may be much more pronounced. One only needs to think about the changing media landscape, for instance, to see the validity of this argument. Now, Madam Chair, I freely uh, confess uh, to, the, to the Minister through you uh, that this is a difficult one to design. It is a difficult one to attack. But the principles uh, uh, that I wish to see uh, expressed are that creeping acquisitions, in the same way as a substantial acquisition, uh, should be uh, seen as potentially capable of creating the same effects as a substantial acquisition could. And that is the mischief uh, we are seeking to remedy through this amendment. Uh, I so move. Question is then, um, well, I will, Senator Brandis. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I understand entirely, of course, Senator Murray, what you are saying. This is, if I may perhaps describe it, the straw that broke the camel's back problem. Um, there is nothing in the language of the existing Section 50, though, which, um, in the government's view, um, would not uh, be adequate to deal with the problem that you raise. Um, the effect of your amendment is really to, in is, is to introduce into Section 50 some additional words. Um, and any previous acquisitions by the corporation in any relevant market in the five years preceding the current proposed acquisitions collectively. Now, it's the interposition of those words because the, ex the, other, um, part, the other part of your two proposed subsections um, merely replicate the existing language of section 50, subsection 1, and section 50, subsection 2. So the question one has to ask, Senator Murray, is well, is the effect you're seeking to achieve by the insertion of those words um, not already achieved by the existing language of section 50? And I would respectfully submit to you that it is, particularly if you look at the very broad language of section 50, subsection 3, which sets out a non-exhaustive list of nine factors to which the court may have regard in determining whether an acquisition um, uh, has um, the um, uh, effect of substantially lessening competition, and those factors include by um, subparagraph C of subsection 53 uh, the level of concentration in the market, um, by uh, subsection um, G the dynamic characteristics of the market, and by subsection H the likelihood that the acquisition would result in the removal of a vigorous and effective competitor. Um, now, uh, Senator Murray, I, I don't think logically um, it's possible to, to, to say that um, it adds anything to enjoin a court to have regard to previous acquisitions over the previous five years when already under the existing language of the section, one of the factors to which the court may have regard is the le a level of concentration. And if that level of market concentration has been built up cumulatively over the previous five years or even longer than the previous five years, that nevertheless is something to which the court can have regard under um, the existing prov provisions of section 53C. So um, the um, amendment, it seems to, 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 to me, if I may say so, is unnecessary. And there is also the, 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 the not irrelevant, the not unimportant problem that um, the draftsman has used the expression any relevant market without defining what the relevant market is. So for those reasons the government won't support the amendment, uh, not because we disagree with you but because we think the mischief which you identify is already dealt with by the current um, language of the Act. Senator Sherry. Thank you. Um, if I could just indicate in respect to the Democrat Amendment 6. Um, Labor agrees that creeping acquisitions need to be taken into account. and uh, We did move, in fact, in our second reading amendment outlining this. Um, Labor moved a second reading amendment rather than detailed amendments because this is a major change. We believe it's better to consult on the precise wording before drafting amendments. Creeping acquisitions are something that Labor will be implementing in government if we are elected later this year following 
uh, consultation on that detail. For that reason, we are unable to support this amendment tonight. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, both the response of the minister and the, and the shadow minister. The, the problem I have through you with the minister's response is the government is of the view uh, that the act, is, as it is presently constituted, if I understand your answer correctly, uh, does take into account creeping acquisitions. Uh, however, my view from, from the evidence I have received uh, over time, both in, in the Senate and, and prior to my coming into the Senate, is uh, that, that those who are most grieved by creeping acquisitions have found themselves unable to pick the timing or the, um, uh, or the uh, circumstance which would entail them bringing a case before the courts. Because, you know, is it 100 stores minus one or 100 stores plus one at which you, you finally make, uh, make the move? Uh, and I am pleased that uh, Labor uh, are willing, if elected, uh, to address this issue. Uh, I have freely confessed how difficult this is to design, uh, and I am pleased that they intend to consult uh, and take uh, further advice on this matter uh, before settling uh, on a way in which this should be done. The question is therefore that uh, the amendment moved by uh, Senator Murray, uh, amendment number six on sheet 5324 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. No. Noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Murray. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, the running sheet says, uh, suggests that I move item seven to nine on sheet 5324 revised together, but I'm going to ask by leave just to move uh, item seven and eight together and then nine, uh, but I'm happy to speak to all three in the, in the uh, debate. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator you, Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, item 7 uh, refers to unfair contract terms uh, with respect to 51 uh, AAC. Uh, this amendment is based on the unfair contract terms legislation which operates in Victoria. Under that legislation, consumers have a private right of action in the courts. Uh, it appears uh, from what I am told uh, that it has worked uh, fairly effectively in uh, Victoria. Um, and there have been no um, floodgates open for litigation, uh, and uh, the uh, legislation has had the effect um, that was intended when it was constructed. Uh, the amendment utilises both the Victorian and United Kingdom legislation to define unfair, and the courts have had no problems interpreting the concept in a way that doesn't undermine the certainty of contracts. And since uh, courts now routinely deal with the word fair, I cannot see why they would not, uh, why they would have any difficulty with dealing uh, with the word unfair. The United Kingdom legislation has been operating for over 10 years, uh, and the Victorian legislation for a few years. Uh, and as I say, it's reported to me there's no problem in those jurisdictions. Item 8. 3E refers to unconscionable conduct on 51 AC1. The important aspect of this amendment is that it covers any action in relation to a contract, which is a broad notion that would cover conduct as well as the actual contract terms. Uh, and it was dr deliberately drafted in that matter. Uh, as somebody who has uh, dealt with hundreds of contracts in, in my uh, business life, um, conduct uh, is uh, a vital area to, to cover. Uh, when determining matters such as these. Uh, item 9, uh, this is based on, on the recommendation from uh, the Senate Committee that I outlined earlier. Uh, that's the March 2004 Economic References Committee. Uh, and uh, I would hope that uh, my Labour Party colleagues uh, would be able to support this in view of the fact that they supported the original recommendation. Um, and I would hope that uh, some government members might uh, reconsider this matter, uh, and this is to do with the transaction value. Um, the divestiture power in, in 3G in this amendment has been drafted to deal with section 46, uh, because that is what the majority um, Senate report uh, recommended. I think I should leave it at that at present. 
Senator Sherry. If I could just indicate um, uh, to amendments seven and eight, and thank Senator Murray for his cooperation in agreeing to split Hello. seven and eight, so we put it separately from nine. Um, uh, on Amendment 7, similar to Amendment 6, this amendment would make a major and important change to the Trade Practices Act. I've indicated how Labor would deal with that in the context of the second reading, agreement, uh, second reading amendment. Um, in respect to 8, Labor does not agree to this amendment. Labor believes the current well-settled case law outlining the meaning of unconscionable conduct, while strict, is appropriate. Um, and then finally, on Amendment 9, Labor uh, does indicate its support. Uh, we support this because it's the same as Labor's amendment to remove, effectively the same as Labor's amendment to remove the three million threshold from Section 51A C unconscionable conduct, which we'll uh, get to shortly. Senator Brandis. Thanks, Madam Chair. The government doesn't support um, these amendments, Senator Murray. Um, we uh, to remain to be persuaded that Section 51A C in its current form, which operates upon the controlling concept of unconscionable conduct um, uh, with the assistance of subsection 51AC3, which identifies um, 11 different categories of um, circumstances to which the court might have regard in making decisions about unconscionability, uh, doesn't work perfectly well at the moment. And it's not to be forgotten, of course, Senator Murray, that section 51AC of the Trade Practices Act uh, builds upon an existing body of equitable doctrine, which goes back uh, many centuries, um, as to what unconscionable conduct means. Now, what you would do, if I may say so, with respect, and Senator Sherry is quite right. I mean, the, the case law on this is quite settled. Um, it's quite, uh, it's quite searching. Uh, but what you would do is uh, uh, upset the structure of Section 51AC by replacing it with um, a provision such as. 51AC3 in your proposed amendments, which would have it that um, a, a term is regarded as unfair if, contrary to the requirements of good faith, and I pause to say that although good faith has a rhetorical meaning, it also has a technical meaning in the law, and in all the circumstances, which is a, uh, an, uh, an, an, an open-ended category uh, uh, that, which invites an infinity of considerations to be uh, brought into, um, uh, in, it brought into uh, contemplation, it causes a significant imbalance in the party's rights and obligations under the contract. Well, for goodness sake, Senator Murray, if that means that whenever there is a negotiation as a result of which there is a significant change which you might characterise as an imbalance in the party's rights and obligations under a contract, that that contractual term can be set aside by a court then it seems to me, with respect, and you as a business person should understand this, I think, better than most, uh, it attacks one of the core principles of commercial law, and that is the security of transactions. I mean, it, 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 there's no controversy that where there is unconscionable conduct, which, as I have said before, is a, is a well understood notion in the law, then there ought to be circumstances in which a contractual term is set aside. But, the, but if absent unconscionable conduct, there is a carte blanche for courts to set aside contractual terms merely because one side gets the rough end, edge, end of the deal, then that's the end of, um, of security of transactions or contractual certainty, which was such an important commercial desideratum. And then it only gets worse uh, with respect when we go to item eight, which would define unconscionable conduct as anything that is unfair, unreasonable, harsh, repressive or contrary to the concepts of fair dealing, fair trading, fair play, good faith and good conscience. I mean, heavens above, Senator Murray, what a cornucopia of, of, of uh, adjectival extravagance that is. Um, can you tell me what the concept of fair play is in commercial law? I bet you can't. Nobody can, because there's no such thing as the concept of fair play in commercial law, and it troubles me when people substitute settled legal t concepts for political rhetoric. Uh, order. It's uh, being 9.50. The committee reports to the Senate. Uh, and uh, it's being 9.50. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to read on to the record tonight two letters.
The first letter is from the Honourable Jack Lee, AO, QC, retired Chief Judge at Common Law Supreme Court of New South Wales, co-signed by Dr Frank McGrath, retired Chief Judge, Compensation Court of New South Wales, co-signed by Alistair McAdam, Senior Lecturer in Arts Law, Law Faculty of QUT Brisbane and Barrister at Law, co-signed by the Honourable Justice R. P. Mark, QC, former Justice of the Appeal Court of New South Wales, co-signed by Alex Shand, QC, leading QC in Australia, co-signed also by Barry O'Keefe, former Chief Judge, Commercial Division, Supreme Court of New South Wales, former Commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in New South Wales. And I quote, it's addressed to the Honourable Peter Beatty, MLA. Dear Premier, the Heiner affair, a matter of concern. We, the underside legal practitioners formerly on the bench, currently at the bar or in legal practice, seek to reaffirm our sworn duty to uphold the rule of law throughout the Commonwealth of Australia and to indicate our deep concern about its undermining as the unresolved Heiner affair reveals. We believe that it is the democratic right of every Australian to expect that the criminal law shall be applied consistently, predictably and, in, and equally by law enforcement authorities throughout the Commonwealth of Australia in materially similar circumstances. We believe that any action by the executive government which may have breached the law ought not be immune from criminal prosecution where and when the evidence satisfies the relevant provision. To do otherwise, we suggest, would undermine the rule of law and confidence in government. It would extend to place executive government above the law. At issue is the order by the Queensland Cabinet on 5 March 1990 to destroy the Heiner inquiry documents to prevent their use as evidence in an anticipated judicial proceedings made worse because the Queensland Government knew the evidence concerned abuse of children in a state youth detention centre, including the alleged unresolved pack rape of an Indigenous female child by other male inmates. The affair exposes an unacceptable application of criminal law by prima facie double standards by Queensland law enforcement authorities in initiating a successful proceedings against an Australian citizen, namely Douglas Ensby, but not against members of the executive government and certain civil servants for similar destruction of evidence conduct. Compelling evidence suggests that the erroneous interpretation of section 129 of the Criminal Code Queensland used by those authorities to justify the shredding of the Heiner inquiry documents may have knowingly advantaged the executive government and certain civil servants. This serious inconsistency in the administration of Queensland's criminal code, touching on the fundamental principle of respect for the administration of justice by proper preservation of evidence, concerns us because this principle is found in all jurisdictions within the Commonwealth and it sustains the rule of law generally. <coughs> the Queensland Court of Appeals binding September 2004 interpretation of section 129 in R versus NSB ex part AG Queensland 2004 QCA 335 exposed the erroneous interpretation that the anticipated imminent judicial proceedings had to be on foot before section 129 could be triggered. We are acquainted with the affair and specifically note and concur with the late the Right Honourable Sir Harry Gibbs GCMG AC KBA as president of the Samuel Griffith Society who advised that the reported facts represent at least a prima facie offence under section 129 of the Criminal Code Queensland concerning destruction of evidence. In respect of the erroneous interpretation of section 129 adopted by Queensland authorities, we also concur with the earlier 2003 opinion of former Queensland and Supreme Appeal Court Justice the Honourable James Thomas AM that while many laws are indeed arguable, section 129 was never open to that interpretation. Section 129 of the Criminal Code Destruction of Evidence provides that any person who knowing that any book, document or other thing of any kind is or may be required in evidence in a judicial proceeding willfully destroys it or renders it ineligible or under illegible or undecipherable or incapable of identification with intent thereby to prevent it from being used in evidence is guilty of a misdemeanour and is liable to imprisonment with hard labour for three years. It concerns us that such an erroneous view of, 100 section, of section 129 persisted for well over a decade despite the complainant supported by eminent lawyers pointing out the gravity of their error consistently since 1990, when knowing its wording and intent were so unambiguous. With authoritative case law available for citing dating back as far as 1891 to R versus Baronis, 
Evidence adduced also reveals that the Queensland Government and Office of Crown Law knew at the time that the records would be discoverable under the rules of the Supreme Court of Queensland once the expected writ plaint was filed or served. With this knowledge, the Queensland Government ordered the destruction of these public documents before the expected writ plaint was filed or served to prevent their use as evidence. Such scandalising of these disclosure discovery rules by the executive also concerns us so fundamentally important in respect for these rules that the judiciary's independent constitutional functionality depends on it. Under the circumstances, we suggest that any claims of staleness or lack of public interest which may be mounted now by the Queensland authorities not to revisit this matter or to fail. Order. Neither the facts, the law order. nor the public— Order. Senator Joyce is a point of order. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to restrict uh, Senator Joyce from reading what is ready, but if, if this is a public document, uh, why are we going through the process of reading it into the transcript if it's already on the public record? If it's not, what is the purpose? Well, there's no point of order, Senator Campbell. If Senator Joyce wants to read an article that's already on the public record into the Hansard, he's quite entitled to. Senator Joyce. The, the, affair, the affair encompasses all the essential democratic ideals, the right to a fair trial without interference by government, and the right to impartial law enforcement to say nothing of the respecting the rule of law itself rests at its core. Respecting the doctrine of separation of powers and our constitutional monarchy system of a democratic government are involved. We believe that the issues at stake are too compelling to ignore. We suggest that if the Heiner affair remains in its current unresolved state, it would give reasonable cause for ordinary citizens, especially Queenslanders, to believe there is one law for them and another for the executive government and civil servants. We find such prospect unacceptable. We urge the Queensland government to appoint independent special prosecutor, as recommended by the House of Representatives. Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs in its August 2004 report, Volume 2, Recommendation 3, following its investigation into the affair as part of the national inquiry into crime in the community, victims, offenders, fear of crime. Such an independent, transparent process, we believe, will restore public confidence in the administration of justice throughout the, Austra throughout the Commonwealth of Australia, more especially in Queensland. I move now to a further document that, has, that I tabled um, from Ryan and Bosher. Uh, to address to Mr Beattie. We act on behalf of Mr Kevin Lindeberg in relation to a series of events and allegations referred to commonly as the Heiner Affair. A leading Sydney Queen's Council, Mr David Roth QC, assisted by a client, has prepared over the last two years a detailed chronology of matters and events commencing with the alleged pack rape of a 14-year-old Aboriginal female inmate at John Oxley Youth Detention Centre in late May 1988. The setting up by the Cooper government of a departmental inquiry presided over by retired Magistrate Noel Heiner in November 1989, uh, the extraordinary and unexplained destruction of documents said to be cabinet documents during February and March 1990 by the new Goss government, together with ancillary conduct which appears to have been a cover-up of the above events by the Goss government's cabinet, certain ministerial staff and public servants holding senior positions in Queensland public service. It is the case, despite all of the information available, that the alleged rapists of 14-year-old inmates are still at large and have never been charged with this offence. Mr Rolf QC, as a role of Mr Lindenberg's efforts in collecting and collating relevant material over many years, has been able to identify no less than 67 prima facie cases of alleged breaches of the Criminal Code and other statutes by members of the Goss Cabinet, other ministerial staff, senior public servants and other persons, all of whom have been complicit in the destruction of the Heiner documents and the apparent suppression and cover-up of these activities. I note that you are on the record in the parliament stating that if politicians and or public servants are reasonably suspected of being involved in possible breaches of the criminal laws of this state, whether they be of your political persuasion or otherwise, you would do nothing to stand in the way of ensuring that they are brought to account before our courts. Mr. Barot, Mr. Roth believes that there is a prima facie evidence that members of the Goss cabinet, certain of their staff and certain public officials in March 1990 illegally authorised and or were complicit in the causing of the destruction of Heiner documents knowing they were evidence realistically required for judicial proceedings inter alia in litigation involved Mr Coyne and the physical and sexual abuse of children held in care and custody of the State of Queensland at the, youth, at the uh, JOYC. It is Mr Lindeberg's view that view is shared by this office and Mr Roth that neither of the former CJC, the Queensland Police Service or the Crime and Misconduct Commission or any other body for that matter has ever conducted a full and proper investi investigation inquiry investigation into this matter to completion. The purported exoneration of relevant persons by the CJC in January of, of 1993 has clearly been discredited by the material collated by Mr Lindenberg and the review conducted by Mr Roth. We note it is on the public record at an earlier time when considering the same facts that other eminent jurists such as 
Mr Ian D. F. Callanan QC, as he was then in 1995, and former Chief Justice of the High School, the late Sir Harry Gibbs, in 2005, have also discredited the CJC's January 1993 exoneration. On the material available combined with the relevant law, it is our opinion that the conduct of these arms of government in the handling of this matter over the years demands a full and open investigation by independent examiner for justice to be afforded not only to our client but to citizens of the state of Queensland. It is clearly in the broad public interest for such an inquiry to occur due to the conduct having involved so many persons in senior positions in various arms of government over many years in the state. Order. Order, Senator Joyce. Your time has expired. This the rest of the speech. No, leave, leave, leave is not granted. Senator Adams. Order, order, order. Order. Yep. Senator Heffernan is not sitting in his seat. He's interjecting. He's trying to direct the, the chamber. If he wants to make a point, he should go back to his his but, chair but, and make it from there. We are not granting leave until right. we see I, 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 what Senator Joyce wants to table. I've heard what you have to say. Senator Heffernan, you are not Senator Heffernan, you're not in your seat and you're not entitled to interject when you're not in your seat. S Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr President. Tonight I'd like to provide the Senate with an overview of a great oh. initiative by one of my Western Australian colleagues in his electorate. The member the member for Hasluck, Stuart Henry MP, has created a vehicle for inspiring and developing the leadership potential of Year 11 students who are progressing on to their Year 12 studies. With four daughters, two of whom are still in their teens, Mr Henry has a strong interest in the youth of his electorate. Uh, <coughs> the member for Hasluck wanted to provide an opportunity for high school students to better understand the parliamentary process and our system of democracy, the chance to visit our national capital and to discover politics in an environment where they are free to form their own impressions. The Hasluck Leadership Award was launched in 2005, Mr Henry's first year as a federal parliamentarian, and is named in honour of the highly respected and influential Liberals, Sir Paul and Dame Alexandra Hasluck. Dame Alexandra was a noted historian, and Sir Paul succeeded in several careers, including as a journalist, diplomat, academic and a bureaucrat, before being elected as a federal member of parliament in 1949. During his time in successive Menzies governments, he held the portfolios of territories, defence and external affairs. The Haslucks were known to people of all political persuasions as deeply intelligent and compassionate people. Sir Paul was appointed Governor-General in 1969 and served until 1974. His standing in public life and his reputation was a well-informed, thoughtful man of enormous integrity. In the seat of Hasluck, which runs from uh, the su southern um, suburb of Gosnells, right along the foothills behind the airport in Perth to Midland, and then encompasses the um, areas within the Darling Range, has 12 high schools located within it. And each school is asked to nominate one year 11 student who best exhibits leadership and citizen skills, citizenship skills. With these, um, seeing that this um, Hasluck Award has now been running for three years, it is a very highly competitive award and the schools have all embraced it. And uh, for those students who have been lucky enough to win and come back to their schools and advise their colleagues of what they have done, it has um, certainly been very, very well sought after. And for this year, I would like to name and recognise each of these outstanding students who were nominated by their schools for the 2007 Hasluck Leadership Award. They are Sarah Foster from Les Moody Senior High School, Tom Whale from Guildford Grammar School, Philip Beckett from Governor Stirling Senior High School, Marina McLean from Thornley Senior High School, Matthew French from Kalamunda Senior High School, 
Ariel Cooper from La Salle College, Kirsten Camperman from St Bridget's College, Jared Lomas from Lumen Christie College, Jessica Aldrich from Southern River College, and Joshua Orshot from Mazenod College. Once the nominations have been received, each student is judged on their ability to demonstrate their leadership and citizenship skills through both written and spoken presentations before a panel of four judges. This year, the judges were selected from the community and included Mayor Pat Morris from the City of Gosnells, Dr Scott Hollier from the Association of the Blind WA, Helen Dullard, Chief Executive Officer of the Hills Community Support Group, and Andy Farrant, General Manager of Country Arts WA. So, as you can uh, see, this panel were a very highly um, professional and skilled group of people. The ten nominees were required to give presentations on two issues vital for the future of this country, leadership and citizenship. The standard of the presentation was a, an extremely high standard, and as a result, the judges recommended that a, spe a special commendation be included. 2007 marks the third year of the Hazlitt Leadership Awards, and it's the first time a special commend commendation award has been included. At a ceremony held in July at the Agona Centre in Gosnells, Guest of Honour, Education Minister, the Honourable Julie Bishop MP, announced that Matthew French from Kalamunda Senior High School had received the Special Commendation Award, while Ariel Cooper from La Salle College in Midland and Jared Lomas from Lumen Christie College in Gosnells were named as the recipients of the 2007 Hasluck Leadership Award. The students arrived in Canberra on Sunday, the 12th of August, and immediately hit the ground running. And um, as they were here in the um, house for four days, I was um, very privileged to act as a co-host co for these students. And it was really amazing just to um, see the day they first arrived, the way they were really quite, um, quite shy and um, absolutely overawed with um, the parliament. But by the time they'd been here for four days, they were real professionals and posing for their photographs and uh, their speeches that they made, the impromptu speeches they made. It really gave me um, great uh, regard for people of 16 and 17 years of age. They were absolutely amazing ambassadors for Western Australia and for the, um, the uh, electorate of Hazlitt. In four days, the students met the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the immediate past president of the Senate, the Honourable Paul Calvert, and it would have been um, the photo was taken at 6 p.m. the night before um, the president uh, retired from his position. So uh, they had the honour of being the last students to have their photo taken, and unfortunately we couldn't catch up with the new president in time to get a photograph. So that was a bit sad. But they met the Speaker of the House, the Honourable David Hawker, the Sergeant of Arms, uh, Mr. David Elder, the Honourable Julie Bishop. Senator the Honourable Chris Ellison, Senator the Honourable David Johnson, Mr Pat Farmer MP, the Honourable Judy Moylan MP and Senator Alan Eggleston. While witnessing historic events such as the swearing-in of the new President of the Senate, Senator Alan Ferguson, and also uh, my West Australian colleague, Senator Matthias Cormann, and listened to his first speech in the Senate. So um, they were very, it was um, an historic occasion, really, to see the president leave and the president come back, uh, the new president sworn in, and also to um, have a West Australian senator um, do his or present his first speech to the Senate. When meeting the Prime Minister, the students asked his advice to anyone considering entering politics. The Prime Minister suggested getting out into the world and gaining some life experience on which to call on before entering the public sector. This point was brought home when they met with the Honourable Pat Farmer MP and found his past achievements very inspiring. Between these meetings, the students also visited places of national and cultural importance, such as the War Memorial, National Museum and Art Gallery, Duntroon, the Institute of Sport, 
the High Court and Old Parliament House. And as I said, I was delighted to meet with these outstanding young people and very pleased to be involved with their program, having the great pleasure to co-host them in Parliament House. And my special thanks go to Alyssa Hayden for her excellent coordination of the students' program and for being their house mother. The students proved themselves to be fantastic ambassadors for their respective schools and always conducted themselves in a mature and responsible manner. Before the students left, I asked them what they had learned during the program. They commented that the hours worked by politicians was incredible and not what the media will have you believe. After attending question time in the House of Representatives, they were amazed to see how answers from the government were reported by the media. They were impressed that every member, minister or senator they met had a strong career background before entering politics. And above all, seeing the true inside working of politics was a genuine eye-opener. The Hasluck Leadership Award has facilitated greater communication between Mr Henry and the high schools in Hasluck and has become a talking point for the students. The winners come back to their schools with such great tales of their experiences in Canberra and Parliament House that the award has become something that all students want to strive for. Both Mr Henry and I have been invited to attend each of the students' school assemblies where the students will address their peers and teachers, Order. further embellishing on their experiences Order, Senator in Adams, Canberra. Your time has expired. Senator McLucas. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, it gives me a great amount of pleasure to be able to uh, speak in the adjournment debate tonight about uh, uh, the, the challenges that, we've, that are faced in aged care in Australia. It was my uh, fort uh, fortune today uh, to address uh, the Age and Community uh, uh, Aged AXA Age and Community Services Association National Conference in Melbourne, and uh, I thank the Senate for the uh, leave that w that was given me. In that uh, 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 speech that I gave to AC the AXA National Conference today, I said that there are a number of challenges that the aged care sector face uh, that we have to. Uh, embrace so that we will deliver a quality aged care system into the future, into the long-term future, not just past the next election. It is, it is my view, it is Labor's view, that the last 11 and a half years that we have had uh, under this government has been an enormously wasted opportunity. We have known since 1945 that we have an ageing population, well perhaps not quite 1945, but very soon after. And we knew that planning for aged care was required, not now, not last week, not in February of this year, but for at least 10 years we have known that we need a robust and sustainable aged care system so that we can uh, deliver the sort of services that we expect of for our, our current older generations, but can I say uh, for my generation as well. In my view, there are three challenges that we face in aged care. We have the immediate and pressing issue of dealing with the question of workforce in aged care. We know that over the last 10 years, the number of nurses working in residential aged care has gone down. Has gone down by about, as I recall, 6,000 nurses. In the same time, the number of people living in residential aged care has increased by about 20,000. So we have less nurses, both enrolled and registered nurses, working in aged care, caring for uh, more and more older people, not only more and more people in raw terms, but more frail and more vulnerable older people. Older people, more frail people and people with higher levels of dementia. So the first challenge that we must deal with is, uh, in, and in the short term, is dealing with workforce. The second issue that we have to deal with in aged care is dealing with the sustainability question. This is both in residential and in community care. We have to deal uh, with making sure 
uh, that the aged care system that we have will sustain into the future. If we don't, any confidence that we have as a community in the delivery uh, of aged care systems will be seriously challenged. And to do that, we don't do what this current government has done, basically pay lip service uh, over time to, um, uh, to uh, a, a concern that there is a capital raising issue in aged care, uh, call in an inquiry. I think it cost six and a half million dollars for uh, Professor Warren Hogan to conduct his inquiry in uh, 2002. It took longer for the government to respond to his inquiry than uh, the government actually gave him to undertake the inquiry. Uh, then we had a, a, a sort of a patch-up job in the budget that followed uh, the receipt of Professor, H Professor Hogan's uh, uh, report, uh, which uh, tided us over for a little longer. Uh, then we had the so-called securing the future package uh, in February of this year, and it has been put to me by very well-respected leaders in the aged care sector, securing the future hyphen not. It has not been uh, a way of uh, going forward in a, any sustainable capital, uh, any sustainable situation into the future. The third question that I don't think uh, this government has addressed in the, in the opportunity the, that the last 11 and a half years has given them is the opportunity to shape the nature of aged care into the future. We still have the ratio of allocation of aged care beds and community aged care packages much the same as we had back 23 years ago. A lot's happened in 23 years. The longevity of the Australian population has increased quite considerably. So we're living longer. We're actually living healthier lives, and that should be applauded and we should be congratulated for that. But in the same period of time, because we're living longer, the level of dementia that we get as a result of our longevity is much higher. So we're living longer and healthier during our young old years and we're getting dementia at a higher rate in our old, old years. That, those two factors have not been uh, uh, put into the system of making a decision about what is the mix of aged care services we need in Australia. Add to that uh, the fact that uh, we now have, we have had considerable growth in the retirement village uh, sector, something to be applauded, something that I think that the market itself is leading and directing, and something I think that government should be watching very closely to make sure that we can support the appropriate growth in that retirement village sector. The market is, is uh, directing that sector, and that's all well and good. Uh, but let's be sure that all sec sectors of our community can be part of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, the, the style of living that retirement village living gives us, because it does give a, a sense of security. It does give um, a, a very comfortable living arrangement, uh, and it suits older people quite, uh, quite considerably. But let's not forget that if you have had a life that doesn't afford you the opportunity to have the $350,000 to $380,000 to buy into retirement village living, then you may miss out on the opportunity of, some very, of quality uh, uh, older life simply because you can't buy into the system. I'm very aware, I'm sure a lot of us are, that um, a, number, a, a range of services do provide rental option uh, retirement village living. I'd like to see the opportunity where we can do uh, a mix of uh, purchase and rental in the same village. So all of these things have been happening, but in the same time, the government uh, has stuck with a ratio of provision of aged care services, essentially on the basis uh, of a formula that was established not very uh, 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 academically uh, some 23 years ago. It's time 
that we look back, we look very closely at the type and uh, uh, type and form of aged care services that we provide in Australia. Currently, in Australia, we provide 40 low care, 40 high care, and 25 community aged care packages for every 1,000 people over the age of 70. But we can't answer the question, why do we do that? We do it because we have, because that's the way it's been de developed up over time. There is no robust reason why that is the split of aged care services in Australia. So that's why I'm particularly proud that Labor has already announced that we will review that ratio of uh, aged care allocation services and we will make sure uh, that, uh, that we have an aged care system that is sustainable, that is the right mix of community aged care, low care and high care, and also uh, uh, reflects the aspirations of our older people themselves. We need, a, we need an aged care service that is well staffed, and it's not at the moment. We need an aged care service that is well, uh, well designed, and in my view we don't have it at the moment. And we need an aged care service that is financially sustainable, not only past this next election, but a long way into the future. And I'm proud that the policies that Labor has announced to this point in time will deliver those outcomes. Senator Boswell. Normal practice uh, in the adjournment speech is for two speakers from this side of the chamber, two speakers from the other side of the chamber. We've had two speakers from that side of the chamber. We've had one speaker from this side of the chamber. And you've now called the third speaker from that side of the chamber. I think uh, convention would suggest that the next speaker should be from this side of the chamber. Um, Senator Campbell, in fact, uh, there was a speaker from your side listed at to the second speaker. In fact, that speaker wasn't there, so I called the only speaker that stood in her place, which was Senator Adams. The normal practice in the chamber is to go from one side of the chamber to the other, and I'm going to Senator Boswell now. Senator Boswell. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to continue to read the... Uh... Point of order, Senator. I understand what you've just said and what you've ruled, but I didn't know necessarily that what's on a bit of paper is what determines the conventions in this chamber. I thought the convention in this chamber was that there would be two from one no, side, well, two seat. from the other resume side. Resume your seat. I've heard enough, that, Senator Campbell. I've heard enough. Resume your seat, Senator Campbell. Can I say that on most adjournment nights there has been two speakers from the government one from the Labor Party and one from the Democrats, the nights that I've been sitting in the, in the chair. The Senator Boswell. Senator I'm Boswell. To read from a letter from Ryan and Bosna uh, to the Honourable Peter Beatty, dated the 10th of August. Uh, and I continue from Senator Joyce. We are aware also you have earlier declined our client's request of the 15th of October 2004 in the wake of the Queensland Court of Appeals decision in R v N S B to appoint a special prosecutor to fully inquire into this matter. Thus, our client is forced to consider the legal process open to him to obtain justice and the bringing to account those persons who may have reached the law. Of particular recent concern is the fact that you have recently declined to make public the advice provided by Mr Royce Miller QC, former Director of Public Prosecutions, dated 6 January 1997, and your refusal to make public your government's report to Her Excellency the Queensland Governor on your government's handling of our clients' allegations. Further, you have also declined to table in Parliament relevant cabinet attendance registers for February and March 1990 and to provide reasons for such refusal. Given the material has been collect, collated and the view of Mr Rolfe of the existence of prima facie criminal activity, we now seek from you access to the records referred to in the paragraph above. The document to which access is sought because of their apparent relevance to prima facie breaches of law are the following public records held in the Queensland government, held by the Queensland government. 
a, cup, a copy of the Cabinet attendance registers for the 12th of February 1990, 19th of February 1990 and the 5th of March 1990. Two, a copy of the 1997 instructions provided to Mr Royce Miller QC and the advice from Mr Miller to the Queensland Government on the findings and recommendations of the 1996 Morris Stroke Howard report to the Heiner Affair. In brackets, that document, we understand, was referred to in correspondence from the then Leader of the Opposition, Mr Springborg, to yourself informing you of the fact that there was no objection from the former Borbridge government to those documents being released into the public domain. And three, a copy of the 25th, 26th of April 2005 Queensland Government report to Her Excellency Governor Quentin Bryce AC on its handling and findings in respect of the Lindbergh allegations following Her Excellency's request for the same on the 21st of October 2003 and a copy of all documents and correspondence relating thereto. Should you maintain objections to now releasing any of the material, then we would seek from your, you a statement on your grounds for such objection. Given the obvious relevance of the above documents sought by our client in this matter and to the maintaining of public confidence in the state's judicial system, to say nothing of open accountable government in Queensland, we anticipate you would now be prepared to release the material forthwith. Our client has instructed us that should you continue to refuse to make this material publicly available, then he reserves all his rights to bring appropriate action through the court system in order to compel the provision of that documentation. Yours faithfully, Ryan and Boschner lawyers, Michael Boschner, managing partner. The government proposes uh, to table the 3,000 600-page Rolf report tomorrow. Um, the Senate stands uh, adjourned until uh, sorry, till 12:30 tomorrow morning. 12:30 tomorrow. We're finished. We're finished. <laughs> 70 years.